percent again with that lag in 2019 and 2020. And then similarly for people of color from 9% uh, up to 14%. And then looking at managers or WMS employees, uh, similarly, we have an increase from in women uh, from 23% to 35%. And for black, indigenous and people of color from nine to 14%. And uh, recognize that these numbers, I'm not sure how, what our total number of WMS employees is, but it's not a big number. So even small changes, um, new employees or departures would make a significant uh, effect on these numbers. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of our state agency. And then here, this is a compilation of how we compare currently to Washington State employee workforce and also DNR and WDFW. And um, in this case, uh, we, we're, we're pretty, let's see, we're looking uh, pretty good in terms of how we compare it to the state as a whole in the areas uh, or populations of veterans and people with a disability uh, have some work to do, obviously, in uh, the area of the BIPOC community. Again, that, that acronym, maybe I didn't say it yet, but most of us have heard, but Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, that's our BIPOC acronym. And um, in the area of women in the workforce, again, where we have 38.1% as compared to Washington State employees, 51.5%. Um, and then we also have this really, what seems to be kind of a high figure on the LGBTQ um, category. And um, I've talked a little bit with Becky Daniels about this. and. Um, this is a relatively new uh, demographic to be collecting, uh, the SOGI data, they call it, sexual uh, orientation and gender data. Um, we have uh, put some extra emphasis on this recently, created a new form, did a new launch. So we sent that, I think we provided that to all employees. It was voluntary for them to respond, but kind of updated our, our numbers on demographics. And so we may have put that extra emphasis and, and got that response here where other agencies may not have done that yet. Um, and really OFM is just, I mean, they've put together a dashboard. The data is, is the integrity and the integration, I guess, of the data is getting better and better, but it's still somewhat new um, to have these numbers and be able to drill down to some level of detail. And then there's also kind of that, that caveat that one, um, when numbers are really small, we're not going to see the detail and, um, you know, protecting the confidentiality is really important. And once they integrate data, there's also other assumptions that that come in that that we may need to just look at more closely if we're analyzing our own um, agency's data. OK, so now I'm going to jump into pro equity anti racism or pair. So uh, Governor Inslee's Executive Order 2204 outlines specific requirements for state agencies and along with Executive Order 2202, which established the Office of Equity in 2020, the 2204 Executive Order mandates the development of a PEAR plan, pro-equity anti-racism strategic action plan led by a PEAR team to include priority actions to reduce disparities and result in more equitable outcomes. So what the Office of Equity has done is put together a framework that is a unifying vision for all state agencies to follow. Uh, so it basically is a uh, recipe for putting together a pair action plan that follows a five-step process. Um, so there's three key components of pair, which I'll talk about briefly. Each one, yes. Well, I, I can't read the oh. detail on there. Yes. It is third from the bottom? Thank you. Ah, All right. Appreciate it. Thanks. I would like you to be able to read it. So appreciate you bringing that up. All right. So pair team, the pair team. The agencies are directed to create a pair team of both internal and external participants, and this includes staff at the leadership level, as well as other staff, or other disciplines and other levels. And um, to look at external partners as well, 
and include folks from the BIPOC and marginalized populations and look at participation from both um, on the internal and external sides, thinking about those who are most impacted by agency decisions in considering who should participate on these teams. This is just a snapshot currently of what our pair team might look like. We have not created a pair team yet. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. We have provided to Office of Equity uh, a list of the folks that we know for sure um, are here in the organization. It could be part of the pair team, but we are working on inviting that participation from the rest of our staff, as well as doing our external work um, to invite members um, of external organizations to be on our pair team. So in addition to having a pair team, you, agencies can also have a pair advisory team. Um, this could be a larger group, especially for large agencies who have a lot of business lines, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Um, but it, a pair advisory group could be a group that meets less frequently and maybe is focused on a particular aspect of the work. So we've, um, just talked a little bit with uh, DNR and DFW if I mean, there might be a common interest in having a pair group that is focused specifically on issues related to public recreation lands. Um, that's just a conversation at this point. Really, the first priority is to get our own pair team up and running. So uh, the I mentioned uh, three components. I maybe didn't say them all, though. Uh, the pair team, the pair plan, and pair equity impact review is what uh, the Office of Equity calls this step of how to write a pair plan and identify the priorities of that plan. And uh, so the five step process basically is to uh, identify the key business lines, which is basically, you know, the functions of the organization and engage with groups who uh, can have basically to understand their priorities and concerns and uh, really analyze where uh, the gaps are, um, conclude uh, where where the baseline is and what metrics might help us uh, measure that baseline as um, over time as we implement the plan and then implement and then, you know, commit and continuous improvement um, while continuing to get, engage with all of uh, the partners. So basically the impact review is a look at business lines individually to say, okay, where are we, say, on the workforce diversity aspect of, of DEI? What's our baseline data? Here's where our numbers are today. And we would like to see perhaps this in the future. And then what kinds of actions are we going to take to, to basically get, in, you know, improve those, those numbers? And, some of this is already happening. Our, our human resources department has been really active in um, looking for diversity in uh, in the distribution of um, announcements for jobs, in going to job fairs that uh, reach more diverse audiences, in looking at our position descriptions and how they're worded to be um, as equitable and accessible as possible. So it's not like starting from from the very beginning, um, but this pair in impact review will be something that we would do in concert with the pair team. Just sounding, I know, like a really a big effort, but um, it's a really important one. And with the pair team's help, it will be, I think, very focused on a couple of key priorities. What the Office of Equity would like to see are three focuses or foci of uh, the, the pair plan that, that select three of these service lines um, that are identified in this graphic. So for example, I mean, agement, engagement and community partnerships is something that I expect might be one of one of our service lines we identify, tribal government relationships. I mean, you could probably make a case for, for several of these, but, but those are some that are quite, quite high on the list. And I'm just gonna give you a kind of brief example here of what might be uh, in equity impact review, we haven't done this, but um, there has been a new uh, statewide uh, supplier diversity policy. So our contracts, grants, and procurement staff have been have been looking at this for a little while already in terms of where are we making our purchases, um, 
what, how much and um, to what kinds of vendors. And there's not a lot of latitude in some of our procurement avenues, but one of them is the architectural and engineering roster, which is a on-call master contract that the state puts together where firms um, apply and once they're registered, they're on the on-call contract, which means there's a little less uh, solicitation process to go through in order to engage with the vendor. Um, so this is an opportunity area. There's currently 116 firms on this list. And typically uh, for any project that's under $350,000, we can look at that list and look at uh, the descriptions of those firms. We can choose three and ask them to submit a scope and a budget. And we can choose one of those firms to work with us uh, relatively simply without going through a competitive, you know, large scale bidding process. And the firms that are certified as a uh, minority or women owned or small business, they're identified on that roster. So we have looked at how many of these firms we've engaged with. Um, and I don't have those numbers exactly here, but it's not a real high number on the list itself. It's not a high percentage of firms that are certified, but we know there are others who we probably haven't engaged with and we might be able to increase that number. And there's also firms who haven't gone through the certification process because it is somewhat onerous and time consuming to get certified. So that's something the um, Office of Minority Business is working on improving to make it easier for firms to get certified. And doing that will also um, help us identify firms that, that fit in that category and potentially where we can you know, do additional business in this area, which could be a matter of our project managers um, having some direction in this area. And it might be a little bit of extra time to start out really to engage with a new vendor um, and then move on from there. So um, just an example, an equity impact review here would say, what's our current data? how much are we spending and where, and where's the opportunity for us to make a difference. It might be right here in architectural engineering and we may not be able to make a big difference in some of our other procure pro procurement avenues. Okay, so Office of Equity Timeline, uh, they are very ambitious. They, they have recently acquired more staff and so, they provided information to us, I think, in June, but that had due dates on it for like the end of May. So they recognize that they're pushing hard and know that agencies are working forward on this. But the very first bullet there says that you're going to build the pair team and your action plan by uh, September 1st. And so what we have we're working working on is we're, we hope to have a pair team in place and have met by September 1st and potentially have uh, some thoughts about our pair plan, but it's probably gonna be a work in progress at that point, especially as we're just going into the recruitment process for the, the uh, director. So uh, recent efforts then, that's all about pair. I'm gonna just move into recent efforts. Business resource group, I'm not sure how familiar you are with that. Our agency has a business resource group. This is a group of staff members who volunteer to serve as a liaison to the state business resource groups. Another executive order of Governor Inslee's was to create state business resource groups, which is a name that doesn't immediately kind of give you a vision what these groups are. Um, I have affinity groups that have been organized statewide that all state employees are welcome to participate in. Uh, the Diversity Inclusion Network, the Latino Inclusion Network, the Rainbow Alliance Inclusion Network are examples. And our staff volunteers attend their meetings. They act as a liaison, bringing information from our agency to those organizations. Um, our recruitment, for example, for our diversity and our tribal liaison are, are examples of information that we've shared with those groups. And then we bring back information from those groups to our agency uh, to consider in our DEI efforts. We are also meeting with other agencies, including a monthly cohort of natural resource agencies. And we've developed strong relationships already with um, other agencies who are further along in their DEI efforts and 
and we're learning a lot from them and meeting with them informally and also uh, through the state's DEI council. And Melinda, we have about 10 more minutes on this. Okay. Uh, that's and I know we're going to have some questions. So Okay, so government to government training, I'll just push right through this then. Thank you. We've had 115 staff members this year get through government to government training. Mitigating uh, and conscious bias training will be launched later this summer. And uh, the executive leadership team has all participated in that training. We are um, uh, currently going through the DEI director recruitment. We're really pleased to get over 50 applications. And we're putting together uh, uh, two panels tentatively scheduled late July, early August. So that's moving forward. We recently um, had a lot of participation from staff at the DEI summit. We've developed our DEI budget. And one aspect of that budget has a recommendation for an equity assessment, which is something that um, RCO and DNR have both completed. And, and we're thinking ours might be some, somewhat modeled on that. And lastly, the DEI budget, some of this you've already been introduced to, and you're going to talk a lot more about it, I understand, tomorrow. Um, but I want to just say a couple of things here. One is that the DEI budget is the DEI <laughs> concept, the DEI effort, what, what we do with DEI is we're intending to embed this within the organization that it's not just a program. And at the same time, there will be a place, an office where issues, complaints, uh, where questions can be directed and where there are staff who have a focus specifically on DEI. But we're expecting that that also happens you know, to all of our staff members, our workforce, and all of our engagement with external parties. And in this budget is really what I see as a new function, our community engagement function, which I think is really just, it's the missing link. We have like all of the pieces. We have interpretive staff. We have range, We have the staff to engage with and um, provide service for. Uh, but so this community engagement person, I see these folks as really this conduit for facilitating those interactions, whether it's directing and supporting an interpretive co-design project or um, giving some recommendations about um, um, campground design that supports um, accessibility. Uh, so I'm really excited about the community engagement function, but the DI package includes additional positions to support the efforts both internally and externally. So uh, with that, um, I think I will end there. Thank you very much and comments and questions. Do we have any questions? Mr. Latimer. So Melinda, the pair plan then every, is every state agency implementing a similar type of program and then, but the top three service line priorities that's specific to each agency? Right, so it is gets a little, so what they ask is agencies are going to look at their business lines, which again, I see as business, our agency business functions, and then we're going to prioritize under the service lines that the pair, that the Office of Equity basically has provided. So I see that we probably will be, there'll be subsets of priorities under each of those service line priorities. Commissioner Brown. And this is something that we can talk about subsequently. Uh, I asked uh, Dr. Scott months ago what looks like success. You know, do we know where we're going? Do we have target numbers? Do we have goals? So I'm encouraged to see that we're getting a little more specificity in terms of where it is we want to go. Uh, I'm wondering, um, and again for the director, if there may be a more informed and engaged and a more um, robust way for the commission to be directly involved as we move forward when one of your slides has a list of uh, the internal team not sure whether a commissioner would be on an internal team but i'm just looking for ways in which we can ensure that we're carrying out our responsibilities to help establish those goals monitor progress towards those goals, celebrate success when it arrives, and, and just be more involved in a more a thorough and robust way. 
Well, I'm encouraged to hear that. And it's a question of mine is where, where should that plug-in occur? And uh, more to talk about. Um, absolutely. Mr. Milner. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my perception from this presentation, an excellent presentation, thank you very much, by the way, is um, that the goal is to achieve an organization whose demographics match the broader demographics of the state, the nation, thereby creating um, equity and inclusiveness. That's the perception I'm getting is that it's an HR function to find people that can come in and normalize the percentages and to train people that who exist in the organization to um, <clears throat> to do something, and I'm not sure what that something is yet. But, and this is all perception. I don't know enough about this yet. So this is not criticism, it's just perception. Um, so what I don't hear coming through is how we deal with the foundation issue, which is the psychology of human beings. And there are willingness to accept other people who are not exactly like them. That's that's the origins of this and it reoccurs with every new birth with every new generation etc i hope that there is some broader um, plan to incorporate counseling into programs like the employee existence uh, employee assistance program for instance but this becomes more of a one-on-one -on -one issue as opposed to a community issue from my focus so, uh, as I said, I'm I'm learning as I go here. So just perception. And I, a couple just want to respond a little bit. I guess um, there are it's there's more to it in my mind than just the numbers, right? So that's my one measure. We might I would expect we're going to have a you know a metric of workforce diversity, and we're also going to have one about visitor diversity, right? But there's also um, to get at maybe where you're going exactly is really supporting everybody in that. So it's likely to be, multi I mean, most many agencies who are ahead of us have multiple opportunities for that to occur, um, both in individual one on one and also in small group settings. So there might be a uh, a book group, and that may be a very easy way for some people to participate. It could be a list of resources that these are the things that you could do on your own time, or maybe a half hour of your work time but, uh, to learn more, whether it's viewing a video or reading a book or an article. Um, so I, I guess everybody will have an opportunity to have their own journey and um, providing folks with the tools and resources to support that journey, I think, is is what what I see. So, in my mind, it's a bigger picture than just the numbers of where we are in relation to the state. Okay. Any other questions, Commissioner Conley? No question. Just, I guess, my one question would be: um, mm. I'm assume too that if there is the part of the plan and the recommendations would include if you see any structural changes that need to be made throughout the organization, that that will be something you would bring forward. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Dannenberg. This isn't okay. There it is. Um, so I'm happy to see that there is, um, you know, a centralized sort of, you know, state wide program that we're moving forward with um, and that there is a sense of urgency. Um, although, you know, I don't necessarily think this type of structural change can be done that fast. So um, a little bit, you know, in terms of that timing and, you know, seeing quick deadlines and such again, I, I appreciate the sense of urgency, but I, you know, in order to make real change that, you know, I think there needs to be some investment. And so hopefully that's um, also, um, something that the state is taking into consideration, I understand you didn't put those deadlines in place. Um, but I was sort of, I was curious about, you know, you know, do, you know, Dr. Scott had some, you know, started some initiatives, some training, some, some groups. It sounds like now there's a sort of this new pair group and there's, um, other efforts starting and I, and, you know, and, and we will have a new DEI director and I feel like nothing communicates 
to staff that this might not stick than constant churn, right? <laughs> new acronyms, new, right? new, and so um, in terms of sort of the prior efforts and feeling like there's, you know, consistency and continuity, like, you know, is there, do you have the sense that that's being, you know, that that this sort of central state effort is going to begin to create that? Because as I said, I do get concerned about the messaging that like churn gives to, to, to a broader group. That makes sense. Yes, consistency and continuity. Uh, yes, I'm one of those folks, and many of us sitting here are who've watched in the churn and the turn. And so we're looking for consistency and continuity. And I feel like we have a stable foundation now. We also have still a lot of challenges in front of us to having that consistency. Um, so yes, I I'm behind, if you will, this this concept and hope that I can continue to support the efforts of this group. And I think we have, well, in part, we're directed to pull a structure together this way, but we've also done some of our own work. So I think part of that will be integrating these other pieces, the DEI studies that we've done. We're not gonna stop or throw that away. We're gonna integrate that into the pair work, if you will. Uh, so yes, I, I wanna believe that's, that's what we're aiming for and that we're going to be successful in that. And um, I think our executive leadership team is is very much aligned around that. And I'm thinking about communications right now and how uh, we've talked already about, you know, how we communicate to staff on a more regular basis and what that communication looks like. But that helps um, kind of build that foundation and continue um, really to, I don't want to say build the brand, but it's a little bit like that. And it's been a very inconsistent, you know, for a couple of years prior to this. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I have a, a couple of comments. One is, uh, thanks for the presentation. I I, I like the the thinking of it. Uh, you know, getting the right people together, planning, and then reviewing and making sure uh, we're actually doing what we say we we plan to do. Uh, uh, I you know maybe next time. Uh, you can uh, at our next meeting or at some point flesh out the schedule that you see that we should be shooting for, recognizing that the state schedule uh, probably isn't what we're going to meet. So I think my question is, what is our schedule going to be and when are we going to have those piece, pieces in place? And the second thing, and an idea uh, in sort of Commissioner Brown's question, one idea I thought about, Commissioner, is that perhaps we add DEI to one of our committees, and I'm just thinking legislative committee, which, you know, Owen uh, chairs and has periodic times where it's really busy and periodic times where it's not really busy at all. Um, and that might be one mechanism we as a commission, we can talk about that maybe as a commission in, in um, our December meeting or, or sooner. Uh, that would be one potential mechanism. Right. Anyway, thank you. Any other thank questions? You. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Now, branding update, Amanda McCarthy and um, Stephanie McDermott. Okay, so I will do um, some introductions while Mahar helps us get the presentation pulled up. So good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, back in April in Owaco, uh, I was joined by Stephanie McDermott, our brand and marketing manager. And she gave us the uh, preliminary update about where we were at with our branding refresh project. So a lot of work has happened since we last met. And I'm excited today for her to, to share more about where we're at and where we're headed and she'll have some some fun things for us to look at so with that oh one other thing we will hold our questions and comments till the end so please make sure to jot them down as we are slipping along and with that i will pass it over to stephanie hi good morning team i uh, i don't know if any, anybody else got sun yesterday but i definitely woke up with like a bit of a sunburn this morning from our, our walk yesterday 
So um, as Amanda said, we talked last time about the brand refresh that we're working on here at Washington State Parks. And when we last spoke, we were at the end of our quantitative research process. So that was a, a heavy survey of external entities as well as internal staff. We got over 7,000 responses that we spent hours calling through, and we were able to tease out some themes from that initial research phase. That initial research phase also ended up um, dumping us into what I'll call our kind of our power users. So our, our camping list was a really big response entity in that survey. So it was a lot of the same um, person that we usually contact with when we reach out and do um, you know, surveys and communications. It's, it's what we consider our power user at state parks. So in order to combat that, we went into a pretty extensive qualitative research process, um, which was the focus groups that we did literally the week after we left the commission. Um, so we worked with uh, specific groups recruiting um, people from around the state who I'd consider our outer circle. So people that maybe don't have as much communication with state parks, aren't as familiar with us as a brand, aren't as interactive with us um, on social media, on our email lists and things like that. And we made sure that we were encompassing, this screen is this guy, this guy, that guy. Um, so we made sure that we were intentionally targeting younger audiences, more diverse audiences, and then people who live all around the state. So uh, survey results were heavily skewed to the western side of the state. So we made sure that we are intentionally looping in people from the eastern side of the state as well. So over two weeks, we did 12 focus groups, and that's not counting all of the micro conversations that we had with our individual partners in um, statewide equity groups. So talking to well over 80 Washingtonians, and we're talking like in-depth conversations. We were all on um, on Teams and on screen for, for well over an hour at a time. And what we learned from these focus groups, so we used this time to, uh, to test out some imagery, have people react to different scenes from our properties around the state. We talked about the brand and how people, again, just as a refresher, when we talk about brand, we're talking about people's emotional connection to the agency. So um, we talked a little bit about how our, our brand is doing with these people across the state. And then we also chatted a little bit about and pressure tested some different strategies that we might be able to implement for um, this evolution of our brand and this shift in our priorities. So when it came to imagery, we showcased some pretty iconic scenes from around the state, as well as some other scenes that were a little bit more of the everyday scene you might see in parks. So things like Dry Falls State Park, um, Sunrise at Deception Pass, uh, and a lighthouse at Lime Kiln, but also photos of like a snapshot at um, Miller Savania, like along the, the shore of the lake. And overwhelmingly people, and I'm talking like way beyond statistical significance, it's the it's the photo of Miller Savania. So people really related to this photo of like this everyday park experience, um, something that I, I you know that they would take their kids to on the weekend or meet up with their friends to go kayaking or have a picnic or something like that. Um, across the board, um, unanimously, it was it was the snapshot of Miller Savania. So people looking at our iconic imagery, you know, going forward, we'll we'll be slating those as more of like use for marketing campaigns targeted to specific groups that we're trying to. Um, to invigorate to, to visit these specific locations. But when it comes to, you know, looking at our visual identity and our core brand, it's that it's that everyday outdoor recreation experience that people are really relating to. So then we tested out how our brand is doing. And the way that you see how people are feeling about your brand is you show them your logo and you ask them to respond to it on an emotional level. So we put up the logo and we started having conversations about how does this make you feel? Like, what do you think when you see this? What are what are some of the the takeaways that you have? Um, and our logo for this outer circle, again, the sound like, nah, it wasn't. You know, people didn't have any violent reactions to it, but people weren't overwhelmingly in love with it or engaged with it. Um, so we and then we get you know prescriptive feedback about you know this this tree looks like this or this color looks like this. But on the whole, I mean, people weren't averse to it, but nobody was um, really over the top engaged by it. Uh, we also took the opportunity to test different strategies. So a lot of the themes that came in the quantitative research, we we called those together and tested them against this audience. And then we came out with what we're very excited about um, as our updated and adjusted overall um, brand strategy moving forward. So what does it all mean? We spent hundreds of hours talking and being very, very um, active in terms of seeking feedback from a broad range of people from all around the state. 
And after listening and calling all that information together, we know that we're we're doing okay, right? We're not, um, we haven't really um, destroyed any trust with people. We've built a lot of equity when it comes to recognition across the state, um, but we could do better. We could pivot and be intentional about um, reaching out to different communities and making sure that we're being inclusive of everybody across the street and really across the state and really working on making sure that people from all walks of life feel not only welcome in our state parks, but comfortable and safe and actively invited into our spaces. So in order for us to do that going forward, as our comms team, um, we have implemented and identified a new brand strategy. So this is, um, it's not a, it's not a slogan or a marketing tagline. It's, it's not something that people will see outside of internal audiences. Um, it's a mantra that we'll be using, um, for ourselves. It's a yardstick against which we'll be making decisions when it comes to adjustments to visual identity, marketing campaigns, messaging, um, training, things like that. So the adjusted brand strategy that we will be moving forward with is this idea of outdoors for everyone. So. In doing all of our listening and all of our soliciting feedback, we, um, we came across this same idea of being in, being able to, or, or making sure that we are making our natural outdoor spaces for everyone, hard stop, period. Um, so we have natural beauty across the street, our, our parks encompass, you know, unparalleled, um, gorgeous scenery. We have, um, and our highest purpose is to make this um, this experience for everybody, whether you're coming to the parks for the first time, whether you have been coming with your parents and your grandparents for years, whether it's like a generational tradition or you have that generational gap where your parents didn't take you to parks, um, you know how to, like some of our team members in comms, like you can scale mountains and hike with like five pounds on your back, um, or you're <laughs> coming to parks for the first time and you don't know how to put up a tent or gosh what even to bring so um making sure that we are we are providing a space for everyone for our current generations and that's also generations yet to come so make sure, sure that we're stewarding these locations um through to the future but the idea is that here in washington the outdoors are for everyone and that's a hard stop um and that's something that we as a comms team especially as we communicate out internally and, ex and externally, this is the mantra that we'll be saying. So we'll be asking ourselves when it comes to adjustments to our brochures, like, are we providing outdoors for all? Like, how can we make this better? How can we have this more, have more utility to relate to more people and things like that? So we did our research. We have our new adjusted brand strategy. We're all really excited about it. How do we now put that into action? So looking at this adjusted brand strategy, this outdoors for all, we need to make some adjustments to our visual identity. Now, when we come forward again, when we talk about brand, I know people immediately start thinking logo, but the logo is really one part. It's a very important part of um, an overall visual identity. So your logo works in tandem with things like, um, is this next slide? Okay. So your logo works in tandem with um, your messaging, your imagery, um, your materials, the way that you're um, responding to community members. It's one piece of this, this big tapestry that is your overarching visual identity and your strong, consistent visual identity supports a strong, consistent brand. So your visual identity, it reflects you. It's, it tells people who you are and what you stand for and what you do. Um, it establishes trust. Again, having a consistent visual identity, having people have relatable, similar experiences. Think about every time you go to Chick-fil-A, they say the exact same thing. Every single time you go through, the packaging is consistent, the product is consistent. They've built trust with their communities over time. Um, and then that's what your visual identity will do. And that's what ours will help us do. And then it also differentiates us. So national parks, city parks, other outdoor recreation entities. Um, our visual identity will help us differentiate in those fields. Why would you change it? So there's a couple reasons in the industry why you would update your visual identity. So one is outdated. So as tastes change, as um, themes evolve, um, something that you was, was had a lot of impact and was very powerful decades ago may not have the same traction and have the same relatability as it does today. Um, your visual identity doesn't update your evolution. And I think that the previous presentation was a really good indication of that. Like we are doing a lot of work when it comes to community engagement and equity. And does our current brand strategy and our current visual identity reflect this evolution that we've made as an organization? 
And then number three, it's not in sync with your new strategy. So this new strategy of outdoors for all, does our current visual identity and our current materials support that adjusted strategy? So that's, these are some of the instances of why you would adjust it and um, check, check, check. We have all three here at Washington State Parks. So again, when charting a path forward, visual identity, really big landscape that goes outside of just the logo. So we're making adjustments to, we make adjustments to your imagery, so your database of photos that you take, your digital archives, updating your materials, brochures, newsletters, um, all those tangible things that you feel in parks. Things like shape, so layouts of bulletin boards, um, how things look on our social media, uh, your tone and your messaging. So having really, really crafted um, messaging that we then teach out to our internal staff. So everybody is staff, so everybody's speaking from the same page, providing like elevator speech quotes, core message training and things like that. Um, and then updating things like your colors and your um, your relatability when it comes to your, your visuals. The logo. So a very important piece of visual identity and where your brand visual identity really starts is with your logo. So this is our current logo that we have as of today. And before we talk about making adjustments for the future, we have to look back and see where we've been. Um, so this is a, a, a broad timeline of our visual identity with our logo cornerstone since inception. So you have the, the patch outline of the state with George Washington's likeness. Then we move into this iconic shield shape that's really been, been known for, like the state parks has been known for since the 50s. We remove that quad screen in there and we go with one consistent um, overall um, landscape theme, which then we've carried through since the 60s through until today. We had a 10 year, a decade blip for um, the centennial where we had this like fern bow situation. Um, and then we pivoted back to our, um, our core logo identity that you see today. So minor changes with like color gradients and things like that. But the logo itself has been standing since the 60s. And we are not who we were in the 60s. Um, so as part of this evolution, we've been doing a lot of work when it comes to what will this cornerstone of our visual identity look like going forward? And we are still very much in draft working form phase of this, but this is the direction in which we will be heading. Again, I cannot stress enough, super draft form. We are doing a lot of workshopping with these options here, but some big things that you'll see, some changes that we're recommending across the board. I don't know what it's gonna look like in the end, but big recommendations going forward. One, we got some feedback that the shield shape itself um, doesn't communicate well with communities across the state. So um, for certain entities and certain people gave us feedback that that shield, um, for them it relates in a very like authoritative way and not very welcoming and more like I'm gonna get in trouble because I'm not um, doing X, Y, Z. So we um, are recommending removing the, um, the reinforcement of the Washington and the state parks. Because if you look at our shield as it stands right now, that shield shape is reinforced like three times visually. So you've got your outer shield, you've got the inner outer shield, you've got the words also reinforcing the shield. You have an inner shield that goes around the landscape. It's like four shields and one shield. So we're recommending unifying the text, which in and of itself is very indicative of like a unification of, of for all, all together. Um, we're talking about adjusting color palettes. So going from a more monochromatic um, sign of blues and greens to having a more diversified color palette, bringing in some of those colors that you'll see in the eastern part of the state, some rich browns, some golds, and things like that. We're also um, unifying and um, updating landforms. So our current, even though this is a depiction of a park that's not on the western side of the state, across the board, feedback-wise, everyone said that this was western Washington. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're creating like a magical place. So this place doesn't exist anywhere, we're pulling in some really iconic landforms from around the state, and we're marrying them together with these adjusted colors um, to create a new um, a new cornerstone of our visual identity that encompasses things that people see from all around the state. And as you look at it, you'll be able to relate to like, oh, that reminds me of a mountain I climbed, or this is a river that I spend time with my family by, or that's the grassy place where my kids play. So allowing people to see themselves in this new identity, no matter where they are around the state, no matter where they are in their lives, um, and no matter what their background is. Next steps. So we are iterating on this like crazy this summer. Um, we will come into a point where we feel that the adjusted logo is 
representative of this new strategy and that it's going to take us into the next era of state parks in the right way. And then we are working with a very talented design firm in Seattle. Um, we went with a small uh, female owned business called Design Elements Incorporated. They are helping Sherpa us through this process. So we are, um, we'll be working with them through the logo. And then once that happens, they'll deliver some solidified brand guidelines. So when it comes to brand guidelines, it's they give your visual identity as like a football field and your guidelines are like the goalposts. So it just keeps us on this same playing field while allowing us to have creativity um, and flexibility with our materials going forward. And then how this is playing out in the grand scheme of the brand refresh roadmap. So research strategy is done. Um, we are in the middle of the brand design right now. We're also updating photography. So we've been um, providing photographers for a lot of our community-based groups and a lot of our equity groups. So we've been paying for um, freelance photographers to go join them on their events. So we can take photos of people just recreating in parks in a really natural way. And then we also have a photo shoot scheduled the first week in August at Deception Pass. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different than what we've done in the past. This is gonna be kind of a marketing style photo shoot. We are um, reaching out to people from across the state and seeing if they want to come and be a part of this campaign. So I talk about it like um, like a Dove body ad meets like a Patagonia ad kind of thing. So it's people from all walks of life, recreating in all kinds of different ways. Um, and we're working with a really talented photographer for that. And then we are also working on updating some of our, um, our map standards to make sure that they're ADA compliant um, and really resonating with a broad cross section. And that. Okay, questions. Um, before we launch in, I just wanted to add a couple more notes. So one of the exciting things that we're doing when it comes to photography is when we are working with community groups, we ask the community group uh, if they have a photographer that they would like to use. Um, and so that way we're not necessarily using a single source model or using the photographers that have been in our database forever. We're, we're working with those community groups to use somebody that they feel comfortable joining them on their excursions and activities. Um, and the byproduct has been really amazing. And we're super excited to share uh, these, these pictures once we're ready for that phase. Um, and I have a couple more things about the logo, but I wanna make sure that we have time for questions and comments first. All right, questions, Commissioner Dannenberg. So I guess maybe I might have questions later. I probably have a couple of comments. Sorry, it was kind of hard. It's hard to go going through it. And I was like, okay, let me, I am taking the notes. Um, one thing I was just going to say is that it would have been just nice. You're talking about the imagery that connected and didn't, there was like no imagery in this. And I was like, oh, I'm curious what that might be. So just in the future, I think it would be useful if you actually show us the imagery because I, I'm imagining what it could be, but I think it'd be, it, it would have been useful to actually see what, I mean, to visually see what you're visually talking about, you know, <laughs> picture worth more than a thousand words in this case. Um, in terms of the, um, and then in terms of the logo, I know that there's, it, it, I'm curious about, um, you had kind of mentioned, uh, sorry if you go, and by the way, I'm just going to note this also with the logo. The logo looks different, at least the, the your, what's showing on the screen, the coloring looks very different on, on my computer. Yep, um, that can happen. Uh, it, it looks, so yeah, I was like, I, I'm not quite sure which one is the correct one. Um, that one looks a lot more yellow than what I'm seeing um, at, on ours, but um, oh gosh, sorry, I have to now go back. Um, you know, you're talking about sort of visual distinction and um, I do think our logo, if nothing, I, I'm sort of curious, you know, you kind of had this outer circle. Did you do, are you also sort of, are you mostly focusing on this group? Like, because I, I am curious how it resonates with um, established users, people who, you know, who have been going to, to state parks. I look at the lo new logos and it looks a lot like the national to me. Like, there's no distinction. It almost looks like those meme posters of national parks to me. The coloring looks like national parks. The font script looks like the national forest. So to me, you know, and, and so it's not that I don't dislike it because I actually personally have an emotional attachment to that font, right? Um, when I see that national parks, that font. And, and so I look at it, I'm like, oh yeah. But I will say that that's probably why. And I don't know, is that something we were going for intentionally to look like, to be consistent? color wise and font wise and look wise with the national parks and forests. Okay, so I'm going to try to address a couple things here. Yeah. Um, number one, the imagery definitely noted for the future. <laughs> um, a quick, easy way to think about it is glamour shot versus uh, people engaging. 
And the glamour shots are great for the Sunset Magazine, great for our certain promo things, but the people love seeing real people engaging with the land. And so that's what we're trying to get to is those, those real people, not models, not you know fitness pros, but real people doing real activities in our parks. Um, when it comes to the logo, yes, there will be color variations. If you look at every single screen, every single printer, it will vary slightly, but kind of the, the goal is kind of a golden rod for kind of that yellow. It's not going to be a super harsh one. Um, when it comes to the national park influence, you know, I think there's a couple of ways to think about that. Um, we're talking about the, the cursive script. Is that really where we want to go? That's giving a nod to the national parks. Is it too close? We're still having discussions about that. In terms of the general aesthetic, um, you know, we have to think about how do we reflect the history and all of that brand and uh, equity that we have with folks and kind of that sense of tradition with also pushing forward into the future. Um, so I think that there's still some fine tuning that can be done, but it's not to just copy and paste the national parks by any means. And Stephanie has done a fabulous job um, collecting an internal um, kind of for focus group and so she meets with these folks every single step along the way and says hey you know what is what does this stuff mean to you how do these changes reflect so we're hearing from staff um, we had a really good user base with our, our diehard campers and visitors that we pulled from the front and so we're compiling all of this research to determine where we want to go if that makes sense yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, you remove the, the snow and so it's sort of, and to me that that probably does take, again, it's, it takes us away from national towards, right? Because is the sort of the snow capped mountains tend to be the national parks. <laughs> and so to me, it reflects state parks a little bit better that like the snow caps are gone, but um, it's it's an interesting change. As I said, I was sort of curious what more established, you know, because, you know, you see people, they change like Coke and they change their logo and people freak out. <laughs> so. I have a lot of feelings, but we don't have enough time to talk about branding in general. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Commissioner Brown here. Any questions? Commissioner Latimer. So I like I, I like the logo. It's uh, the colors, um, and I, I like the mantra the here in Washington. Uh, but were you trying to were you trying to sort of make that statement in the in the logo somehow? Because when I look at the logo, I'm not sure that I get that you know I, I'm not sure that I feel like at least from the logo I mean right so um and again I have a whole logo roadshow and I know we don't have enough time to go into it in depth but um a logo can do a lot but it's not going to be able to do everything mm -hmm. so we're we're doing this delicate balance with res respecting the equity from the inner circle that um Commissioner Dannenberg referenced so bringing people along in an evolutionary step of the logo so certain things um need to stay right so the, the outer shield shape we know that we have a lot of equity built up there and a lot of recognition over time so we've got to respect the outer shape when it comes to the inner um landscape of it in our testing of both internal and ex inner and outer circles number one thing that people talk about when they talk about state parks is the beauty of the landscape so we've gotten questions from people about like why isn't there a tent in there like why isn't there a specific tribal influence or why don't we have a specific person in there um and the evolution of the logo itself and the research that we've done indicates that we need to focus on our natural spaces and our natural beauty and, and providing that that space where people are welcome to come to the the for all is coming in with how we're conducting this part of this brand refresh so um you know melinda talked a lot about this this pair of work that the state's mandating that's pretty much an outline of what we've been doing up until this point um you know i i feel like we've built our own little mini like pair focus group with our community-based groups so talking with them about this idea for all it's it's all encompassing in how we're doing the work and less so of like what the logo itself looks like because if you talk to these community groups they couldn't care less they couldn't care less what colors we're using they couldn't care less what it looks like they want to know what work we're doing behind the scenes to make sure that we're really living this new um this new era in parks and we're doing the work to make sure that we're being better stewards and partners so in talking with groups they're very pleased and that's the first question people ask like when you talk about dei work what exactly is it that, is it that you're doing and you walk people through like this is the work going on behind the scenes um when it comes to you know um being prescri prescriptive about like the logo itself it's not going to be able to encompass all of that people are going to feel that in other ways so when we start to do like camping 101 materials you'll start to get that feeling of like for all when these new images roll out when people start to see themselves in parks um 
regardless of where they are um, in their um, in their their life journey. That's where that for all is going to start coming into it. Um, you know, there's 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 things that we're doing within the logo in terms of like unifying landforms from all across the state, diversifying palette, unifying text. Um, and by the way, the scripted font um, for Commissioner Dannenberg is not going to go forward. I'm just going to okay. say that right now. Um, it's in the work. The the for all is in the work. It's it's the behind the scenes. It's the it's the duck feet churning under the water. Um, but I really appreciate you um, asking that question. Any other questions? I have one comment. I, uh, you know, when I look at, at logos, uh, uh, park logos in, in particular, so many of them do not have people in them. Uh, and I just think that's missing. Uh, and I think it's missing from our our logos in the past, too. And I, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me there's a little spot right there. You could have uh, some stick figure people with a little kid and, you know, looking out at the over the water to the sunset but you know it would be not very intrusive but i'm not a designer so don't take that as any kind of anything other than i think it, there ought to be human beings connecting to nature uh and not just nature so I'll, uh, i have two cents stickers than i do have <laughs> i was gonna say i'll let our design from now send them a picture of you uh commissioner bounds and say <laughs> commissioner bounds wants to be in the logo <laughs> That no, is thank not you for true. That feedback. <laughs> I, I, I genuinely appreciate that. I was not Just a little, to... little bit <laughs> Anyway, thank uh, Commissioner Milner. In recent uh, videos that they put out yeah. and the way they morphed between um, animation and real video and ending up with a scene with a a park ranger walking up a hill with a child next to them and the sun is going down. It, I agree. It, that's the part that gets you inside. Yeah, you could have the ranger hat there too. Right. Yes. right. No dogs though. No dogs. No dogs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just noted. Yes, and uh, right. thank you, Commissioner Milner. We still have those videos saved and I think you all will be very excited once you see the suite of things that will go along with this. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, I know we are wrapping up our time, but we talked about the 1913 on one of the iterations of the logo um, and how that kind of represent, represents a point in time. There is a lot of history that happened on our lands before that 1913 date and not all of our parks were established there. So when we're moving forward, how do we make sure that we communicate that story that this state park was not here since the dawn of time? There's a story that was before us. There's a story that's going to come after us. And how do we pay uh, respect to all of those really, really important pieces of our history? Great. Well, thank, thank you, you guys very much. Nice presentation. <laughs> like the thoroughness of it. Next up, past program update. Amanda, you get to stay right there. I'm going to move chairs just to, you know, keep this fresh up here. Um, but today I'm excited to have Carrie Murphy join us. Carrie is our um, visitor services manager and she is going to be going over our discount pass program um, and she's got a really great presentation plan. Um, she will remind you of this as well, but we are going to save questions for the end and there's a lot of material. So please make sure to jot down some notes as we clip along. And with that, I will pass it over to Carrie. Good morning, commissioners. First, can everybody see my uh my slide deck okay yep we can see your deck carrie okay perfect um as amanda mentioned my name is carrie murphy i'm the visitor services manager here at washington state park um, and i'm here today to give you an update on our discount pass program uh, some of the challenges we experience as an agency and some considerations for the future we're going to start today with a quick recap of the program as a whole then we're going to focus in on three passes specifically our lifetime disabled veteran pass our off-season senior pass, citizen pass, and our senior limited income pass, um, as well as some of the challenges and considerations associated with those passes. Uh, then we'll touch on some uh, technological challenges, as well as some um, options for future improvement. Um, and then I'll finish up with options for next steps, and then as Amanda said, open up for questions and discussion. Uh, to start with, I wanted to give a quick bit of background um, over the past several months, the Information Center, which uh, manages the Discount Pass program, um, has spent a considerable, a considerable amount of time uh, doing a deep dive 
um, into the program. And the goal here really was to get a better understanding of the uh, agency-wide impacts and gaps in the program while considering changes uh, both in the interest in camping as well as our funding source since uh, the time of creation um, of, the, of, of these passes, which was the 1970s for most of them, uh, versus now. Uh, part of these uh, efforts included consultation with field staff across the, the state. Uh, we also analyze the common rule violations that are processed uh, through the Information Center, um, as well as examined our issuance processes. So currently we have uh, five discount programs. We have our disability passes, which offer 50% off of camping. We have our lifetime disabled veteran pass, which is 100% uh, free camping. Um, we have our senior citizen off-season pass, which um, upon purchase, uh, people can uh, secure camping for no additional fees between October and April of each year outside of reservation and utility fees. Um, we also have our senior limited income pass, which provides 50% 50 off, 50 off camping and our faster foster family camping program. Uh, one thing to note, uh, with the exception of the foster family program, all of these were um, created in the 1970s, and all were created before the Discover Pass was introduced. Um, currently, with the exception of the off-season pass, they now all include free day use. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the numbers. Our, po our passes are popular. Um, in 2021, the Information Center issued over 8,000 discount passes. Uh, with our most popular pass being our Lifetime Disabled Veteran Pass, followed by our Senior Citizen Off-Season Pass, our Disability Pass, and then our uh, Senior Limited Income Pass. So we'll start today by talking about our Disabled Veteran Pass. For a quick recap, this pass offers Washington State residents with a 30% or greater service-connected disability free access to parks. Um, this is the only pass that has truly 100% free camping, meaning um, pass holders do not pay utility fees uh, or reservation fees or cancellation fees. Um, again, this was passed, was uh, written into statute back in the 1970s. Uh, this is a really great program and we're very proud to be able to offer these benefits to our veterans. Um, with that said, um, there's not, it's not without uh, some challenges. Um, the first challenge I'd like to uh, present is we have seen um, a pattern across the system of reservations using this discounted rate that are neither used nor canceled. And this poses a few challenges for both the agency and the public. Um, for, from a public standpoint, it creates a loss of opportunity for others to secure reservations. Um, from an agency standpoint, there is a lost opportunity for earned revenue. Um, it also doesn't look great um, optically. Reservations today, as many of us know, are really hard um, to secure, very competitive, competitive um, and we do regularly receive public uh, feedback expressing frustration over the inability um, to secure a reservation and then visiting the park and seeing vacancies. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Information Center um, process all pass rule violations. Uh, no call, no shows are by and large the number one violation of the rules that we process. Uh, since 2021, we've had 475 um, reported to us. The number is likely even larger than that because currently it requires uh, manual effort by the field to let us know if a reservation is missed. Um, challenge number two, um, is a, a common pattern of behavior we see associated with this pass, in which um, pass holders make multiple reservations across the state, often for the same night at different parks. Uh, the impact, impacts with this are, are largely the same, missed opportunity for the agency and would be campers. Um, but additionally, while our pass holders do not pay any transaction fees, state parks does. Um, for both fiscal years 2020 and 2021, uh, we ended up paying close to $470,000 to our vendor 
um, and we're on track to do the same for fiscal year 2022. So this pattern of behavior also feeds into challenge number three, which is a high number of cancellations associated with this task. Uh, between January and October of 2021, um, over 15,000 cancellations were processed. Uh, putting that in monetary terms, that means state parks paid at least um, $250,000 in transaction fees associated with those canceled reservations. That number assumes uh, that all of those reservations and cancellations were processed online. Um, if they had gone through our call center, that number would even be higher. Um, just a little bit of perspective, rate type wide, for the same period, the agency saw about 87,000 cancellations. This brings me to challenge number four, which is probably our most sensitive and delicate um, challenge that we're encountering. And that is that uh, many of our parks are experiencing residency. Um, obviously, this has uh, the same impact as above, but or as I previously mentioned, um, but it's also not in accordance uh, with the purpose of state parks as defined by our WAC. And our fifth and final challenge associated with this task is simply the fact that lifetime passes are hard to manage. Uh, currently, we have between 40,000 and 50,000 uh, records in our system. Now, obviously, not all of these are valid. Um, some pass holders may have passed on. Uh, some may, may, may have moved out of state. Um, however, it requires intensive labor to uh, verify death records against our database. And we have no way to reconfirm residency after the pass is initiated. Um, oftentimes, we will learn um, a pass holder has moved out of state if we get a call to replace the pass, or um, if a member of our field team notices an out of state license um, in conjunction with um, the discounted pass. So, there's a few things that we as an agency could consider uh, to mitigate, mitigate some of the challenges with this pass. Um, we could request a change to the RCW uh, that would require pass holders to, to pay some sort of fee. We could consider look, um, implementing stay limits specific to that um, of Oregon. Um, Oregon, when using their uh, disabled veteran pass, only allows for 10 days per month system-wide um, in which the discount is available to the pass holder. Any other um, reservations within that period would be charged at full rate. Um, we could also look at implementing a five-year renewal period, uh, which would allow for reconfirmation of residency as well as uh, be aligned with our renewal periods for both our senior limited income and our uh, permanent disability pass. The next pass uh, we're going to discuss is our senior citizens off-season pass. So upon purchase, this pass to give Washington State residents who are at least 62 years of age or older uh, camping at no additional charge outside of utility and reservation fees between October um, and April each year. Uh, it goes on sale each September. Um, and this pass was created on authority of the commission. It's not written as RCW back in the 1970s. The main, um, the two points of uh, consideration here are that this pass was created in the 70s with the goal of filling vacancies in the off season. Obviously, population growth, RV access, as well as just general interest in outdoor recreation have uh, drastically changed the camping landscape. Um, while anecdotal at this time, we do have popular parks uh, re reporting turning away full rate campers. Um, and um, the other consideration is somewhere along the line, um, it became unofficial a policy that um, people could pay full rate ahead of the September sale date and then request a refund once the pass is purchased. Um, so obviously this, this is not aligned um, with the original intention of the pass, and it's also created um, an administratively burdensome and inefficient process to refund fees once the pass is purchased. Moving forward, um, there's a few things we could consider as an agency. We could look at increasing the price of the pass. Uh, the last 
pricing adjustment was made back in 2011, we could consider discontinuing the tax and replacing it with strategic uh, discounts, really targeting parks that are struggling to, uh, with occupancy. Um, we should, um, we've already started a conversation about changing the advanced pay practice um, and are considering ways to engage with our pass holders. Um, you know, previously there was actually information on our website directing people to, to do, the, do so, and uh, we've, we've removed that. Um, and we could also consider limiting the number of nights per month the discount um, allows. Our third and final pass is our senior limited income pass. Quick recap here. Um, this pass is available to those to Washington State residents age 62 or older with a combined household um, gross income that would meet the requirements of a property tax exemption in the county in which they reside. On average, this is about 40,000. Obviously, it's going to vary by county. Um, and this pass gives 50% off of, uh, of camping, um, camping fees. Um, the first, the first challenge with this pass is currently the WAC allows for uh, submission of the SSA 1099 um, as proof of financial eligibility. However, uh, the SSA 1099 does not always paint um, the full financial picture, and um, mixed income levels are really hard to verify. Um, the second issue is that our only limited income pass has an age re restriction. Um, limiting a scope and um, excluding younger limited income populations. Um, and it's really not aligned with um, the agency's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So a few things we could consider for the senior limited income pass. Uh, we could look at updating the WAC to remove the SSA 1099 as documentation of financial ability. We could consider um, allowing proof of food, cash, or medical assistance as proof of eligibility for those who are not required to file a tax return or don't own property. We could look at expanding the age of the pass. Um, and as with the other two passes, we could consider limiting the number of nights the pass will produce the discounted rate. So obviously not all of our challenges are just specific to the pass. Um, we also um, currently have some technology challenges within our reservation system. Um, Specifically, that, it, that our reservation system does not have the ability to verify by pass number or um, have business rules that would prevent um, multiple concurrent reservations. Uh, we're currently engaging with our vendor uh, to explore options for implementing better, um, better control. And the other, the other technological issue is that there's currently no easy way for our field staff to uh, have see information on our pass holders, any history of violations, et cetera. The final, the, the final challenge there um, is, I mentioned previously that the Information Center um, processes all of violation of pass rules. Uh, currently, this is a really manual process. Um, since July of 2021, um, we have processed over 600 violations. Um, this slide here just kind of gives you a breakdown of where those numbers lie by pass type. I also wanted to share with you some um, program improvements that we've made over the past year. Um, we've expanded our violation process into all pass types. Previously, we had um, focused um, primarily on no call, no shows uh, associated with the lifetime disabled veteran pass. However, as we worked through this, we did identify other educational opportunities um, across all the past types. Uh, we also created a quarterly newsletter um, just for our lifetime disabled veteran pass holders. Uh, this newsletter contains both um, hints and tips. It has cool features on parks across the state. I believe the first edition, um, we uh, highlighted some you know, parks with military history. The latest edition, we did fishing holes, and then we combine it with a gentle uh, reminder with what the past rules are. Um, we also developed a reservation auditing process to address multiple concurrent reservations ahead of, of expected arrival dates. And the team and information center has been proactively reaching out uh, to those past holders um, to, you know, 
educate on the rules and, and free up some of those campsites. Um, and so today, uh, we've talked about three passes um, and both the benefits and the challenges. I've presented some topics for consideration. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, anything we do going forward needs to be well planned out with ample time taken um, to explore all options, assess potential implications and impacts on the people that we serve. Some potential steps forward would be consulting with the Department of Veteran Affairs, obviously engaging with key stakeholders, both internal and external, and we'd obviously want to um, develop a roadmap for change management. And, and before I end my remarks, I just, as a final reminder, I wanted to just um, call out that the Senior Limited Income and Lifetime Disabled Veteran Pass were both created through RCW. Um, the off-season pass was created on authority of the commission and can be changed by the same. And uh, that's all I have. Thank we have you, questions? Mary. Thank you. Questions? Brown? Mike, 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 Mike. Yeah. First of all, uh, this shop was the record result of the commission asking for an overview of this. So thanks for responding to that. And this is very, very useful and very helpful. Uh, while I support the disabled veterans program enthusiastically, I have to say these um, multiple reservations, um, <laughs> candidly, I mean, they're, they're unfair, they're, it, it's selfish. It's expensive, not only in terms of lost revenue potential, but having to pay the transaction fee. Uh, and it's not an insignificant amount of money. Um, and so I would support doing whatever we could, uh, either administratively or technologically, to avoid these concurrent reservations. It seems to me that technology ought to be our friend in this regard. and. I personally would also support um, stay limits in view of everything that we know in terms of demand and usage and cycles of usage and seasonality. I mean, we we, we need to address that. Um, on slide 11, real quick, just three more real quick, just almost yes or no's on slide three. Um, on residency, by that you you mean that people, these, peop these uh, folks are coming and they're they're still subject to the limitation we have on the number of nights that you can camp in a park. So are you saying they're just moving from one park to another? Is that, you're shaking your head, okay, yes. So that's the issue there. And then on slide 17, and I think you answered this subsequently in a later slide, but do we have the authority administratively to increase the price of the pass? And I think the answer to that is yes. On slide 17. For the off-season? For the yes. off-season pass? Yes. Yes. So that does not require statutory change, okay? It is not written in RCW. It was it was created on authority of, commission, of the commission. So and, the and then it looks like on slides 20 and 22, again, uh, and it looks like we have the statutory authority. There's no, we could make those adjustments without a statutory change. Isn't that correct? Um, for the, uh, the proof of financial eligibility? Yes. Yeah, so that is written into WAC. Um, I'm not sure, and I don't know if Owen's back there, um, as far as expanding the age. Um, did I see him? Um, He's coming, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> as quickly as he would like to. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. I believe we can make both of those changes uh, by a, a rule change that the commission can approve under their authority. Thanks, Owen. Thank you, Owen. Okay. I thought um, so, but I didn't want to. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Do you have a question? Commissioner Dannenberg? I guess just for clarification, um, in slide, um, oh, let me find it. For the disabled veterans, you had noted that there's 400 some thousand paid in fees for no shows. And then verbally on that slide, it says 41184 for empty reservations. And then on the next slide, um, 10, you had verbally said that there was about 450 paid um, in transaction fees for canceled reservations. So are we really saying we paid $1 million in fees or are the, is that the same number? Is it the same 450? <laughs> 
Yeah, so it's a bright, so if we're looking at the fiscal year, um, it's not just for the cancellations. Um, every time a reservation is, is made or canceled, we pay um, trans transaction fees for a vendor. Fiscal, like, as a total, uh, we've been averaging about $470,000 uh, in uh, payments to the vendor specific to reservations using this pass. Cancellations within that same number is about 250000 does that make sense? Okay, so it's about 470 we've paid and then 270 for I see for cancellation. Yeah. And that's just and that's different than the transaction fees that's shown on slide 9 for empty reservations. All of all of the transaction fees associated with the veterans pass are looped or or lumped into that uh $470,000 the um I broke out the number of reservations that were canceled and the fees that would have been associated with those, but we're not adding the 250 to the 470. It's about yeah. four. It's That's averaging what, about 400. Can we just go to slide nine and you'll see what I'm talking about? <laughs> Please. Yes. Thank you. Yes. The for sure. for empty reservations. So I'm trying to figure out the empty reservations means that there's a no like nobody actually stayed there, right? So what is the 411? There's no 470 there for 20 for 2022. So is that, is that just through? Through so May. Through May, okay, so that so the 411 is just through 22. That's not for empty reservations. That's for all reservations because it says empty. Transaction fees paid for empty reservations. She's looking at the little header. Um, oh, sure. yeah, no, I'm sorry. That's just that's all reservations using the, this discounted rate. I see. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so it's run, it's running about a quarter million. Okay. And this number is fairly important because if we're going to go to um, the legislator and ask them for a change, there's a big difference, right? If it's a million or half a million, or what's the actual hundred percent? Um, hundred percent. It's a, each fiscal year. Fiscal year for so the past few fiscal years has um, ended about four hundred and seventy thousand in transaction fees, and we're on track to do the same this year. I see. Okay, and then um, for the. Um, you, you, you sort of have mentioned violations. What is the consequence of a violation? Like, did we just call and say, oh, that was terrible? Or is there um, an action? <laughs> so no, no, we have actually um, a, a whole process. We typically start off with a warning um, and we'll contact the pass holder, uh, usually by um, letter. Oftentimes they'll call and engage with us. Um, depending, we, we do keep track of the number of violations each pass holder has. And if we have subsequent violations um, after we have engaged, um, we can and have moved towards suspension of the pass. Uh, typically that's for a period of between 30 and 90 days, depending on the number of violations, the nature of the violation, that sort of thing. So there is a process built in of escalating consequences. And in uh, severe situations, we can also do a revocation. Okay. I mean, so. Okay, so with just sort of those clarifications, I mean, generally, you know, I, you know, clearly this, this is an issue, especially um, the multiple reservations, empty reservations, that's just completely, you know, taking advantage of the system. And as Mark said, it's completely selfish deciding that you're just going to prevent other people from being able to take those spots when we have full. So, you know, clearly I would support, um, you know, practices that would, that, that would limit that. Um, even a nominal fee, $5, you know, I think. To make a reservation for Mount St. Helens, it's like five or six dollars, right? And I do think that limits people from saying I'm going to reserve every single possible day because while it's five dollars, if you're going once, is not that much. If you're going to try to reserve every, you don't know when you're going to go and you're going to do thirty, it starts to add up, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think you know figuring out what is something that might um, limit it, and you know we can work with you know Owen to see if if the ledge would support some kind of change, some kind of limit. Um, certainly the idea of um, having to renew different passes, I think that probably makes sense so that we can ensure that, you know, they're not taking advantage of, um, uh, you know, different people using them or people using passes of someone who's passed away, et cetera. Um, I would like to see, um, and then for the senior pass, you didn't note this, but I mean, it seems like one possibility is honestly just to restrict not allow the use at our most popular parks. You simply cannot make a reservation with that pass um, with with a senior pass at our most popular parks period. Um, mm -hmm. And part of this is not that I don't support the senior pass and as I'm approaching the age where I'm going to be here for all the discounts. Um, 
I don't see that as supporting our equity goals. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I, I don't recall the numbers, but I think that seniors actually use our parks disproportionately are the number of the people that we are not, that are not using our parks are actually probably um, ones that we're trying to attract family age, you know, with children, et cetera. So I don't see why a non-income limited, non-ability limited senior pass supports our DEI goals. Um, I would be interested in seeing if we have any sort of study of um, of the diversity of our discount pass usage, whether or not they are actually being used by a diverse population um, outside of what, are, what is named. So obviously a, a disabled veteran pass, we know that they are disabled and they're veterans. Um, is that also reflecting um, gender and, and racial diversity, for example, um, mm -hmm. our senior passes, our senior limited income, you know, are they truly supporting our DEI goals? Because I do think that these passes you know, and so I mean, as much as we would like to, I mean, it would be fantastic if we could offer discount passes to large groups if there is a financial trade off, which I don't know, I'm not sure if we're quite there yet. Um, you know, if we're saying we're choosing, you know, as you know, a senior who could be, you know, sitting on half a million dollar a year retirement and we don't have a discount pass for, you know, uh, um, a mother with a single child who's limited income, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I would, you know, I would rather have that that limited income. So I don't know if we're at the point that we're making changes, but I do think also looking at this and saying, is this actually equitable? Is this just, is this actually supporting our DEI goals is going to be really important. And my sense is at the moment, it's probably not. Um, along with just the problem of, as I said, with people obviously taking advantage of the passes and what we can do to resolve that. Thank you so much, Thank Commissioner Dannenberg. Appreciate your comments. And we, I saw Carrie taking feverish notes. So, as she mentioned, this is the beginning of the conversation, and I appreciate your your deep thought on those considerations. Commissioner Latimer. So, um, on the disabled uh, veterans pass, well, let me step back for a moment. Um, I haven't been able to make a state park camping reservation in a while, but I, I isn't. Isn't there like a uh, sort of prorated uh, penalty um, when you make a uh, reservation and you cancel within a certain period of time, you get a prorated refund? Isn't that correct? Yes. So right. why not on the, I mean, I, I fully, as a veteran, I fully support the disability pass, but why not at the time of the reservation, you know, take a credit card and if within a certain period of time, uh, they don't cancel the reservation. They're subject to the same penalty as everybody else's. I, I think that would completely eliminate a lot of the issues that you're having. That's a really. I mean, veterans of all people, sh you know, understand accountability. So, uh, you know, if 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 they're you know trying to to abuse the system, um, you know, I think that's that's a fair alternative. Thank you. I'd like to note that uh, Commissioner Holly Williams has joined us. I see her on the screen. Wish you were here, but glad you're there and available. So great, thanks. Uh, com uh, Commissioner Milner and then Commissioner Conley. First of all, Commissioner Conley and I had a chance to hear this story in, in the budget committee, so we have a bit of a head start here. Um, but let me say, first of all, that one of the issues is is that this is beginning to hit the media and i'm reading a headline right now from rv camper that says reserved but empty campsites the campground side of the story and it addresses many many upset people who could not get a reservation but know that there are empty campgrounds and where i came down is exactly where commissioner latimer came down we do not ever want to do anything to limit the benefits that we provide to a disabled veteran, period, end of story. However, for anyone who abuses the system, irrespective of their status, their protected rights or whatever, they should be paying a penalty if they have an extra, uh, if they cancel uh, and they do it in a way that does not allow the campsite reservation to be refilled. So um, I think that should be across the board, irrespective of demographic or socio-demographic uh, background. It just has to be. Um, the next thing I, I, met, I remember talking about, uh, Commissioner Latimer also raised the idea at Alderbrook, I think, 
of identifying sections of our camp of our parking lots for uh, dry RV camping with the idea that after sunset, when all the day use visitors are supposed to be out of the parking lot anyways, if someone is stuck and doesn't have a reservation and they're in an RV that is self-supporting to the extent that they can just park in a spot in the parking lot for the night, that helps with what I think to be one of our biggest strategic challenges right now, which is we don't have enough capacity. Not enough capacity. Let me say it again. We don't have enough parks and capacity to meet demand. Um, and and I don't want to bring up what, what now is probably 30 articles I've read from uh, the National Park Service uh, and, and uh, various newspapers all proclaiming what's going on in our wilderness areas as a consequence of us not doing our duty. Um, so um, as far as a senior pass goes, a senior discount pass, I think we should just look at how to fill the shoulder season, right? And start from scratch. And if it's a good idea to offer a special pass for seniors who probably are more available to use the campsite, you know, when families have kids in school, okay. But come back to us and say, this is how we think we should fill out the shoulder season. That's that's my 10 cents worth. Commissioner Conley. Thank you. Well, yeah, since we had had that conversation, one of the things, the previous conversation, one of the things that I came back to, which, you know, Commissioner Latimer and Milner have, you know, is the idea that if someone is, a, you know, violating our, the, the use of the past, then there needs to be consequences. And we need to, if we need to do a technological change that allows us to make that an easy process, we need to do that because, you know, we, I mean, I, I also support the past, but I don't support people, you know, it's costing real money and that's, that's not fair. And I guess we, some of the other things you talk about, like, would you, you know, the, the use of the senior pass during in certain parks, like, is that, you know, again, maybe we need to look at where we have capacity and where we allow the pass to be used. And then also how much time people can use these passes in our parks, I think. And I think the more that we we have this based on rules that apply to everyone. I mean, these are not aimed at a specific pass holder or a group, but these are how we're going to operate the parks. I think that's the way we need to move forward. So we have very clear, consistent ways that you can use any of your passes. So thanks for the work though. This I know how much work this must have been. <laughs> Commissioner Williams. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Commissioner Williams, do you have any questions, comments? Commissioner Latimer? I just wanted to piggyback on uh, Commissioner Milner's comment about the uh, the overnight camping in, in the uh, parking lot. So a lot of RVers, including myself, do what they call dry camping, where you have a generator, self-contained, you can dry camp for a week to two weeks. So I recently took a road trip down to Arizona and other than one night where I stayed in a hotel because it was too hot in Phoenix, um, I basically camped overnight in parking lots or, you know, areas that, and I have an app that tells me where I can go. So, so I think there would be a lot of interest in that and maybe you charge a reduced fee because you don't have full hookups, but I think there's enough parks in the state of Washington where people would really have interest if they could easily access that, right? So um, on one of these apps, my my house is, I, I act as a host and so people can actually stay at my property for free. And I've had, so far since March, I've had 15 RV campers stay at our house. And normally I get seven to 10 in a year, but so far I've had 15 and and the whole month of July is 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 pretty much booked with people staying because they can't find a place to stay anywhere else. So if they had the ability to go to um, a state park and even just dry camp overnight for a reduced fee, I think you'd get a lot of uh, traffic there. Thank you. Do you serve breakfast? <laughs> yeah, what's included? Fresh eggs. <laughs> uh, did you have anything to add? Any, anything else? Uh, my only comment is thank, thank you uh, for really doing a deep dive on this. I think it is an important issue. I would say personally, um, senior passes uh, as a senior are 
uh, overrated in the sense that I think it ought to, everything ought to be income based uh, and not age based. I, I'm honored to be a senior. You know, it's much better than the alternative, right? Uh, and some of us can afford it, and some of us can't. Whether we're seniors or whether we're we're young families uh, trying to make it, and I, I just think that's the income based is to me the most equitable way to to provide discounts to uh, disabled veterans. I think that's a certainly a legitimate uh, uh, discount uh, for the service they provided the country and the consequences of that service. So I, I think. But that, to me, that's the a little bit more. I know it's difficult to do income based. It's not. There's not a simple way to do that uh, and be fair and equitable. But it's. I think it's the. To me, it's the way to go. And and thanks for the work. I I just wanted to give uh, one more shout out to Carrie and her team. They've done a lot of work to really take a deep yeah. dive, looking at these past programs. Uh, Carrie joined Parks uh, in February of 21 and really hit the ground running to see these gaps and they've a lot of this auditing and calculating and even past violation follow-ups has been manual um and the you know and even the proactive outreach is brand new uh trying to help people avoid these situations before they get into them um and so i just i really want to thank her team for the the hard work and i know there's still a lot of hard work ahead but i think we had a really great conversation today and I'm looking forward to see where we go. So thank you, Carrie. Thank yeah, you. thank you. And it is break time uh, for, for see, it's 1045 at 11 o'clock. Let's come back at 11 o'clock and we'll uh, hear more about Kukatali. And it's 1101. <laughs> We're going to call a work session back in order and welcome uh, uh, the Cucatali Management Board members, and I'll call on Lisa Lance to uh, update us. And and before you get started, Lisa, just a big thank you to Lisa and Todd and everybody else that uh, we met yesterday and had the opportunity to walk out to the island and uh, hear what was going on. I think that was a benefit to all of us, and thank you guys, and thank you for all the work you've done as a partnership, and uh, we really appreciate that. So. Lisa. Thank you, Commissioner Bounds. Um, good morning. Um, I will go ahead and um, I think you all know me, but <laughs> I will allow my colleagues here to introduce themselves again. I'm on camera somewhere, right? <laughs> oh, it's right there. Uh, hi, I'm Todd Mitchell. I'm the uh, environmental director for the Swimish Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, I'm also a tribal member. Uh, my traditional name is Swaledum. Uh, I've been working for the tribe for the last 20 years, actually 22 years. I keep easy to keep count, right? Starting 2000. Uh, but I've also been on the Kukatali Management Board as an alternate or member uh, since the inception uh, around 2010. Uh, so, yeah, I have a lot of history that uh, included in uh, the tour we did yesterday, but also in the PowerPoint coming up. Great. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> Tribal member. Uh, I have been on a, um, just a little over a year. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. I'll just say that it's been kind of exciting for me the last couple of days because um, we have two new board members and in, including Catherine and I have only seen them on my computer screen until yesterday. And so being able to meet Catherine and Alana in person was um, one of the highlights of the meeting thus far for me. <laughs> is this better? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Todd is going to be my co-presenter on this presentation today. And um, some of what we're going to talk about with regard to Kukotali Preserve will be, be a bit of a review of some things we talked about actually out at the site yesterday. And some of them will be showing you things um, regarding the um, preserve's history, et cetera, that um, we couldn't do well in the field. So there will be a little bit of both in our presentation today. Um, so I will go ahead and kick off. There we go. 
So just to give you some background information, once again, Kukatali Preserve was acquired back in 2010, and it is co-owned and co-managed by state parks and the Swinomish Indian tribal community. This is the first co-ownership and co-management arrangement in the United States between tribal and state governments. Um, so it's a very unique situation that we have at Kukatali. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a layout. Um, I know that people were looking and pointing out this is this island and this is that island as we were standing on the ground, but I, we wanted to give you some context while looking at it from the air. So we have um, Kukatali Preserve here. Um, this is the parking lot on Fidelgo Island where we started yesterday. And just for some context, you can see it's in pretty close proximity to Deception Pass State Park, as well as Skagit Island and Hope Island. And with that, I will um, turn it over to Todd to give you a more up close orientation. Okay, yeah, so here's the, can you hear me? How close, is this close enough? <laughs> um, so here's the close up map uh, of the park uh, preserve area. So it does span uh, Fidalgo Island on the east side uh, where you see uh, Kicket Lagoon. Uh, the main portion is Kicket Island in the middle and they have the uh, small uh, flagstaff point uh, way on the west side. And I noted on here a couple things that uh, we call the Kicket Tombolo connection between Fidalgo and uh, Kicket, the Kicket Tombolo, uh, and the other one, Flagstaff Tombolo. Uh, it's basically sand spit beach formation uh, that uh, connects two larger bodies. Um, so just kind of a special thing. Um, uh, that you don't see very often. Um, I think that's good on that. So a little bit of background history um, that we heard a little bit yesterday. Uh, the the area uh, uh, of the reservation, uh, Lower Skagit watershed, uh, used since time immemorial uh, by our Swimish uh, ancestors. Um, uh, you know, for fishing, um, especially along the river, um, but also at the uh, these near shore areas, uh, beach sailing, um, and other kinds of fishing and shell fishing. Uh, so, especially at uh, Kukatali, uh, there were uh, fish camps uh, during the summer. Uh, hence, the name Kukatali comes from uh, the Lusu seed word uh, that means place of cattail mat. So cattail mats were used uh, as utilitarian uh, things for a lot of uh, uses. Uh, you could use them to erect uh, little tents or shelters uh, uh, for uh, uh, you know shade in the summer. Um, actually used also for um, uh, like sleeping pads and that kind of stuff, or or divisions in in longhouses. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? <laughs> All right. Please, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, okay, yeah, next one. Um, I think it has animation, so it should go by itself. Oh. Oh, <laughs> now you can see it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that was talking about kind of, you know, uh, the longer history, but uh, the more recent history uh, for the preserve is um, uh, Swinomish is uh, signatory to the Treaty of Point Elliot in 1855, along with many other tribes in this uh, area of eastern uh, Puget Sound. Um, so the area ownership was owned by the tribe in, in general uh, from the time of, well, beforehand, but also uh, you know, that was set up during the treaty, um, and that did change uh, with the Dawes Allotment Act, that is called in 1877, uh, which was designed to uh, divide up reservations uh, across the nation uh, to give ownership to individual tribal members uh, in which they were able to use the land as they needed, uh, but also sell it. Uh, which I think was the the point of the act uh, that um, you know everybody would sell off their land and there wouldn't be reservations anymore because nobody uh, tribal owned their own uh, land. 
Um, so this was allotted to a specific tribal family who owned it up until about the 1928 uh, when this entire uh, preserve area uh, was sold to a group of developers uh, who had the idea of basically uh, dividing up uh, the Kukatali portion uh, for summer cabins for, I assume, Seattleites um, to have summer places. So luckily that didn't happen, so this place stayed pretty natural. Uh, one mm -hmm. uh, developer bought out the rest uh, in 1943, um, and that's the owner that built the large house uh, that was at the West End, um, also the caretaker's house. Um, and other improvements, uh, but that's about the extent of the improvements, uh, the two houses, roads, and, you know, a few outlying buildings, but largely uh, still a natural area. Uh, that owner uh, eventually did sell to uh, Seattle City Light, and Seattle City Light, as you can see in the, in the um, slide, a uh, picture from the newspaper, uh, that CLC Light was looking to uh, research and develop a nuclear power plant out there. Um, so there's various uh, uh, mixed feelings about that all around in the county and, and the tribe, uh, but luckily that didn't happen. So luckily uh, it still stayed a fairly natural area. Um, and uh, CLC Light eventually sold to another fee land owner um, and uh, that largely stayed stayed the same. Uh, some minor improvements, but still largely natural. Um, but I should say, you know, at that time when uh, the tribal uh, allotment family sold it uh, to the developers, that was just for the uplands. Uh, so the tidelands uh, around the reservation uh, have been and always been owned by the tribe in general. Um, so the tribe owned it, uh, the tidelands, and had rights to harvest uh, but that was severely curtailed uh, during that entire period of uh, fee land ownership. Um, and we hear that we heard that a lot from our elders saying we used to go out there and do fishing, used to go out there and do clamming. And during that period, it was it was hard to do it, um, and especially with the the last uh, last few owners. Um, it was severely um, curtailed uh, because of the uh, supposed dispute of who owned it. Um, so that owner um, in the 2000s, uh, 2009, 2010, was looking to actually sell and a uh, consortium of grantors, state parks came together to purchase it back. Um, I think that's good. We talk more about that later, right? Is that you or me? It's you. <laughs> um, so, okay, yeah, so, um, uh, and we talked about this last yesterday too, of what this historic agreement to uh, uh, co-own and co-manage this area. Um, as I said, the uh, tide lands were uh, always owned by the tribe, even though there were some improvements on it, and especially the road built over the Kicket Tombolo uh, on the eastern side. So even though the road was built over uh, tide lands, it was still a tribal tide lands. So I think that was part of some of the negotiation of um, this agreement is that uh, uh, to have access uh, to everything on the west of, uh, in Kicket Island uh, needed to cross tribal tide lands. Um, so um, they worked it out. I wasn't part of that. I was just part of everything afterwards in, in developing things, but uh, kudos to everybody working that out uh, because uh, like we said, this is a very unique area uh, largely undeveloped and doesn't take much to make it uh, um, uh, even more natural than it, than it was. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Talks about it right there. <laughs> I get ahead of myself sometimes and I can't see all the slides. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, through that agreement, you know, the, the 38 plus acres of uh, tribal Thailand ownership was reaffirmed during that agreement um, because, you know, all those uh, fee land sales, you know, said, you know, like they're quit claim type things of like, we quit claim on this and uh, you can't quit claim on something you don't own anyway. So um, that made it, you know, very contentious of like uh, the, of various owners who, who th thought they might have owned those. 
um, but it, you know, especially important to restore tribal access, not just to the Thailands, but also you know the other areas of the of the preserve. Um, and there we are. We had that that big celebration in 2010. I think it was July, so almost exactly what is that? 12 years ago. Um, and uh, there's the original management board. Uh, maybe many of you remember their Jack Hartway on the right side. Um, and yeah, I think it was a great day. Um, so to go to the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, the governor came out and, you know, we're, they were all to walk around and enjoy the area. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure how last chance deal this was, but still, it's great that they made it happen. <laughs> And every time I pull this up too, it's like, I, I always forget. And it's like, oh yeah, that's barefoot bandit time. <laughs> um, but I think the the best part of it was getting, you know, many of our tribal elders back out there who said they hadn't been out there ever or in generations, um, just a long time uh, because of, you know, the, the, the that it was hard to get out there with the um, different uh, uh, upland owners. So, um, yeah, even the the bottom picture. My my kids were small. They brought them out there too. It's like, yeah, it's a special day because, um, you know, the first time, you know, we're inviting uh, the community and our tribal uh, community and elders out there uh, to see this area for the first time ever or in a long time. So. Yeah, if you look at the co-management agreement, uh, it's called Kicket Island Co-Management Agreement. So while I was on the board um, and during the time I've been on the board, um, I didn't remember that uh, we have a, a Puget Sound geography book that lists out many of our place names. Uh, so if you click it once, there we go. So on this map, uh, it says right there here, this area is called Kukatali. Um, and it says in there, this is called Kukatali, which means place of cattail mat. So I brought that to the board saying, you know, we should return its traditional name, uh, which will help um, both our tribe and our tribal members to make it theirs. Um, and that's what we did. I said, I brought it along and say, hey, let's do this. And that's what we did. So that was the um, why we are now named Kukatali Preserve. Um, because of, you know, bringing, repatriating its traditional name that had been forgotten for a while. So adding on to that, uh, in conversations with somebody yesterday, uh, we were pointing out the islands uh, uh, to the south. Um, so one of those, is, a large one is Hope Island. And the, the small one uh, just off of Flagstaff Point is uh, Skagit Island. Uh, so um, and there's a couple other uh, traditional names around Kukatali. Um, but I think so, they, they said too that you have another Hope Island in the system somewhere. So uh, I personally challenged the Parks Commission <laughs> to rename our nearby Hope Island uh, with our Swinish traditional name, um, as well as, well, probably Skagit Island too. Um, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you could pronounce it for us, please. That one, I might need help from uh, <laughs> KP. Does Kokoi? Kokoi. Kokoi. Okay. Uh, but yeah, this is from our uh, place names map, uh, which uh, the tribe put together many years ago. Um, uh, uh, looking at all kinds of sources and talking to a lot of elders to uh, get our place names there. And especially, I think, you know, after, uh, you know, I brought the Kukatali name uh, to the board and, and our own uh, governing bodies, uh, it's become a pet project of mine also to uh, get those other names out there too. So uh, I don't think you, when you drove out here, out to Kukatali yesterday, you didn't see the signs, but uh, just recently, this spring, we were able to put up stream road crossing signs where our streams uh, go under our roads uh, that list our traditional names on them. Um, uh, one of those things that, like, pet project takes a long time because you don't have a lot of time to work on it. So I think it took about five years uh, working with the, the tribe and the county. Um, but I think, you know, place names are really important to us. 
um, and, and really help tie, uh, tie ourselves to these places, uh, especially our ancestors who, who named them in the first place. Um, oh, another thing we didn't talk about yesterday uh, is uh, part of that uh, renaming. Uh, I also suggested, hey, we should probably come up with our own unique logo since, you know, the preserve is not wholly parks and it's not wholly tribe. Um, so uh, I brought it up. It's like, we should do it. And they said, yeah, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did that. So I uh, drew up a watercolor. Our communication department uh, digitized it. Uh, but it's a representation of a cattail mat creaser, uh, which is used in actually constructing uh, cattail mats. Um, and uh, uh, it actually represents uh, some of them. Uh, this one has uh, two heads basically representing our two entities um, that come together to do this. Um, so the next slide shows a, a cattail mat. Uh, so you can see the, the vertical lines there is where the cattails are sewed together. Um, so the cattails are running um, horizontally on there, and then you sew through them uh, vertically. Uh, but then the cat, the creaser is used to crease where you put the uh, um, uh, the the twine or the the threading through, uh, so that the the stalks don't split too far apart. Um, uh, so my representation, and actually built, I, I carved a rep the representation also. Um, I would have brought it, but uh, I actually submitted it to the Washington State History Museums uh, in the Spirit Exhibition. So it's right now it's in Tacoma Museum. So anybody who's in Olympia and goes to the Washington State History Museum can actually see the one I carved. So that exhibition is running through September 11th. So if you happen to find yourself in um, Tacoma, please stop by and check out um, Todd's artwork. So just going to talk a little bit more about the natural resources that I mentioned briefly yesterday. Um, as I mentioned, we do have scattered old growth trees on Kukatali, but overall um, it's a fairly mature forest. And if you noticed as you were walking around, there are several canopy layers, so um, different heights. It's not a bunch of trees um, all the same age, but there are trees and shrubs providing habitat in different layers of the canopy. Um, there are some large trees, and um, if any of you have been around on the Commission long enough to hear me talk about tree risk and developed landscapes, you've heard me talk about the tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it. We call that habitat, and that is what we have at, at Kukatali because most of the property is undeveloped. And we allow forest processes to proceed naturally. Um, as a result of that, if you walk through the forest, you'll see there are broken limbs, down trees, um, large stumps, um, but all of that provides habitat for a variety of creatures that live on the island, including um, um, reptiles and amphibians and small mammals that are making use of that downed wood that come from those trees. Although we didn't get to go see it up close and personal, the other really unique thing that we have within the preserve are the rocky balds. Um, and so again, these are fairly unique habitats within Puget Sound. They occur in areas where they're largely on bedrock with a small amount of um, developed topsoil, not enough to support trees. Um, and so what we have at um, primarily on Flagstaff Point is particularly unique. And I included a quote here from Peter Dunwitty, um, who did a survey out here before the property was acquired. Peter previously um, worked for the Nature Conservancy, but he's um, one of the best respected ecologists in the state of Washington. And just to read out here, he says, I would estimate there are fewer than a dozen such sites scattered throughout the San Juans, and very few such grasslands remain anywhere in the northern Puget Lowlands. Some particularly unique taxa occur as well, such as Delphinium menziesii, um, which is a larkspur, if you're unfamiliar with it, with a scientific name. Um, but Peter is the leading expert on habitat within the San Juan Islands. So he is someone who would know exactly how unique this is. So what we have on Flagstaff is very unique, which is why we have closed it to public access to try and protect the, um, that unique habitat. Obviously, the preserve also has the tidelands that we've talked about. And Todd, do you want to say any more about forage fish or salmon use there? 
Yeah, the Thai lands around the preserve are yeah very productive for uh, forage fish um, and uh, yeah various other things. So that's why well, I guess we talk about later why uh, uh, various areas we've uh, closed to actual public access because of the unique nature of uh, those tide lands um, and and so forth. But uh, yeah, and we talked a little bit about shellfish uh, that you know there's. Uh, there's there's shellfish out there, but they're not very plentiful. So that's uh, why you know we had embarked the fishery department has embarked on looking at uh, building a clam garden. Um, but you know there is a lot of natural area there, which is very uh, productive for forage fish, which we know are you know uh, important for salmon. Forage fish are um, well, they're. Uh... A handful of species, um, surf smelt, sand lance, herring that are you that are food sources for um, a number of species, but primarily salmon when we talk about forage fish. So turf it, typically if you hear someone talk about forage fish, they're talking about surf smelt and sand lance. Yes, yeah, so they lay their eggs in the upper beaches. Um, so when they have a lot of natural upper beaches, uh, it's very uh, attractive for a lot of spawning. So in areas where there's been a lot of um, shoreline armoring, armoring um, bulkheads, it eliminates habitat for forage fish. So they're they're spawning in the upper areas there, and oftentimes you need the vegetation overhang that you see in this picture to provide appropriate habitat for spawning. So a lot of spawning habitat has been lost on Puget Sound as a result of shoreline armoring. So I just wanted to talk in a little bit more detail about what co-management really means. Um, as we mentioned, we have a formal document, um, which was the Kicket Island Co-Management Agreement, now Kukutali Preserve. And the fundamentals there are really, first of, of which is it's managed by a six-person management board, and that includes three representatives from from the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community and three representatives from state parks. One of the other tenets of the agreement is that all decision making is done by consensus. Now, if you watch the news these days and see what happens in our elected um, <laughs> um, legislative bodies, that may seem like an impossible thing. How could we possibly make decisions by consensus? And I would say I started on the board in 2012, and some of those some of those decisions took a lot more conversation to get to perhaps than they do today to reach consensus because we were growing we learned learning to understand each other's perspectives on things and growing to to build trust in in each other and how we were going to manage this place um i would say i it's i can't I remember the last time we had a particularly consensus dis, or con, contentious decision that we had to make a lot of them are just like oh yeah okay that's good, and we move on to the next item on the agenda. We've reached a point, I think, where we're very comfortable working together, and so that consensus decision making is not typically very difficult. The other part of the co-management agreement states that both parties will make equal funding contributions. And as I mentioned yesterday, that was initially very difficult for state parks. We acquired this property in 2010, and we began the first of our um, Great Recession-related layoffs in 2009 so we were not in a good position you know moving into 2011 2012 we laid off roughly a third of our workforce so being able to make equal funding contributions at kukatali was a, a tremendous problem for us and we would not have been able to move forward with anything at all on our own um, but the tribe was there for us at that time and helped to support a caretaker on the site, helped to support the master planning on the site until we could really get our feet back under us as an agency. And we really wouldn't be where we are today without really the generosity and the patience, I would say, of the tribe as well, until we were able to sort of um, regain our footing. So the co-management agreement has several primary objectives laid out in it, and that really forms a framework for us to understand what we jointly agree is important on the site, and that helps to contribute to those consensus decision making. In some ways, it makes it easier for us than it does for some managing some of our other state park sites because we don't have 
um, formally agreed upon objectives for how we manage some of the other parks in our system. So lots of times we're making these ad hoc decisions on how do we balance recreation? How do we balance natural and cultural resources? Whereas these are already laid out in our co-management primary objectives, which I'll just go through here for you. I include actively preserving, protecting and restoring ecological habitat, promoting healthy functioning of near shore habitat for migrating birds, fish and marine mammals, facilitating scientific research regarding the natural values and functions of the preserve, respecting and sustaining the continuity of tribal culture and exercise of tribal treaty rights. Also preserving, protecting and encouraging respect for culturally significant sites and other cultural resources, providing opportunities for low intensity, non-consumptive and managed public recreation and education use, and finally providing programming and facilities to inform and educate the public about the natural and cultural history of the preserve. Okay, so working off of that, and as Lisa said, you know, early, early on, we wanted to get an idea of what uh, natural resources were out there. So, um, uh, I went for a, uh, a grant to do that, basically build a conservation management plan, uh, which is built on uh, these kind of studies. Um, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of surveys, baseline or status surveys uh, for shellfish, wildlife, uh, avian, uh, fish usage, uh, botanical, uh, as well as uh, geo geomorphology and geomorphic studies uh, along the beaches. Um, uh, because we wanted to get an idea of what was out there since uh, the they did do some very extensive ecological studies um, in uh, studying it for the nuclear power plant, um, but that was back in the early 1970s. Um, so uh, we wanted to use that old information, but also update it uh, to see what what had changed over the years um, and what information you know we could use in building a conservation uh, management plan uh, based on all, all of these new studies. I think it'll go. Um, so here's just a few of those uh, studies. Um, uh, and it led to uh, basically the one in the middle, uh, our uh, research uh, a summary and conservation uh, recommendations. Um, so I think this was, you know, a, a great way for us to partner in that and one having uh, tribally uh, led research uh, to research those uh, resources that are important to the tribe um, and furthering that and coming up with uh, conservation recommendations, um, uh, you know, specifically laying out how uh, those resources should be protected, enhanced, restored, uh, and so forth. Um, so that led to uh, uh, basically two parts, the, the um, scientific summaries as well as the conservation recommendations. And that was adopted in whole as an appendix to the master plan um, uh, to make it easy for us to say, here, here it all is and, and you know, if you want to read about it, it's all right there. There, I think there's um, here. The next slide is uh, there's some very unique uh, things we thought of um, as part of it. Uh, oh yeah, you can talk about. It. <laughs> so based on all the information that we have about the preserve, um, it led us to make some management decisions that are unusual for not completely unique, but unusual within the state park system. And the first of which is that pets and livestock are not a lot allowed at Kukatali. Um, when I first see livestock, I always have this mental vision of someone wandering around with their cow, but no, we're really talking about horses for the most part, but no, no dogs, um, no horse use at the preserve. And this has sometimes been um, somewhat contentious. There are neighbors who are used to wanted to bring their dogs there regularly for a walk, or you'll have someone who comes to visit the preserve and is driven there from a significant distance and needs to let their dog out and um, are not necessarily pleased to find that there are no dogs allowed, but this is an opportunity for us to protect the unique resources that we have at Kukatali. This is not the only place in the park system that we have closed to dogs, um, but it is fairly unique within the state park system. 
We have also closed Flagstaff Point as well as um, the North Shore and the Lagoon to public access, again, to protect sensitive resources. So we have Washington Administrative Code um, that allows the director to make the decision for a closure to pets or a closure to protect um, sensitive natural resources. And we have done that um, in both cases here. Um, but when it comes to law enforcement, it becomes a little bit um, of a challenge because we have state parks rangers who do can do enforcement work there, but we also have the tribes um, law enforcement officers that drive by as well. So what's happened at Kukatali is that the tribe has adopted complementary code to our um, regulations, which allow them to be able to enforce the same things as our law enforcement officers. So yesterday we talked a little bit about the master plan that we have for the preserve and it was developed by a landscape architect that the tribe hired. Um, Parks led a public process similar to what we would do for other master plans to get public feedback on the elements of the plan. So the primary elements of the plan, many of which you saw yesterday, um, included the installation of a small parking lot here on Snoosh Road. Um, it included um, some trail development. It also included some day use development um, down here, uh, which was the area that we visited with the picnic shelter yesterday. The master plan was adopted by both the State Parks Commission and the Swinomish Senate back in 2012. And one of the basic elements, um, fundamental elements of the master plan is that the preserve is to be day use only with no overnight facilities. The initial development of the preserve started in 2014 with the construction of the parking lot, which was funded by the tribe. I've included some pictures here, which were the opening of that event, which included um, the tribal chair and the commission chair um, planting a tree together. Uh, we also were able to enjoy mu music from the Swinomish Canoe family at that event. And then in then we were able to obtain a grant from the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program to build out other elements of the um, master plan, which included that picnic shelter, as well as a kiosk and um, various interpretive panels. Um, this is a photo here from the opening of the new day use development in that picnic shelter. Is that more Todd graphics, sir? <clears throat> This, this is Todd's logo. Yeah. Um, are you referring to this one here? Yeah. I don't, this is not. I think that was by, by the artist that did the other art for the interpretive panels. So as I mentioned before, the artist um, that we worked with, Cecilia Lapointe Gorman, um, Sam Watipka with State Parks, worked with her to commission the artwork for those um, uh, interpretive panels. And she is a tribal member. Okay, so um, our second stop on our tour yesterday was at the restoration site. Um, so we've actually done, I guess you could call a couple of restoration things out there, uh, including the, the, this area, the Tombolo, but also uh, we mentioned there, there was a large residence on the west side in, in the day use area, and that was, I guess, basically restored uh, as in uh, demolished um, since, uh, uh, yeah, it was a kind of mid-century house that we talked about, and we, we didn't have a specific use for it or uh, couldn't really fit it into, you know, park use, and it didn't really fit with all of those elements uh, uh, of the co-management agreement. So uh, that was the... Uh, recommended to be uh, demolished, but it was uh, documented uh, well beforehand. Um, the other portion uh, that all of our uh, geology and geomorphic studies went towards was trying to figure out um, the feasibility of restoring uh, the tidelands underneath the road uh, at the kick it um, So those studies, you know, were, were separate feasibility uh, study, um, but we did do extensive outreach, you know, with the board and uh, the tribe and parks because it would it would, would change the nature of the access because you're going from a road that's always above uh, high tide to uh, a natural beach which goes uh, under water uh, for possibly several hours during the day. Um, so we did a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, basically just tide analysis just to say how long would it be underwater um, and are people comfortable with that um, but also touting the um, the you know the rest restoration and improvements to the area uh, for uh, both sediment transport uh, in uh, sediment uh, uh, helping out with, with the lagoon uh, uh, area as well as uh, driftwood transport um, as well as fish use transport uh, over the area at high tide. Um, so uh, we were able to move that you know from feasibility uh, to design uh, to construction through um, mostly a surfboard grants um, and that was completed in uh, 2018. Um, and yeah, beforehand, you know, we had done all those studies and we also continue to uh, study the uh, elevation along a transect uh, there um, just to note how things have changed over time. So the, the last thing that we wanted to share with you, um, Senator Alana Quintasket, who is also on the management board, who you met yesterday, talked to us a little bit about clam gardens. And she was not able to join us today, but she did provide us with a link for a YouTube video that I did want to share to you that share with you that um, tells you more about clam gardens. And so I think it has to be played by Mahar.
So that was our last slide. I did just want to say that um, Alana let us know that um, they've received their permit from the Corps of Engineers to begin the work and uh -huh. um, the first delivery of rocks planned soon. Sometime in the next month. Next month. Um, so the clam garden at Kukatali will be underway shortly, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, so that concludes our presentation for today. I would just like to speak personally, having served on the board for the last 10 years, I guess, um, that this has been a really unique part of my um, time at state parks. And I've gotten to um, be involved in some events that I will never forget. Let me tell you, if um, having been invited to the blessing of the fleet with the Swinomish is uh, of event, I will never forget. And I'm not just talking about the food. <laughs> Although the food was amazing, I have to say. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's been a, an amazing opportunity um, to build this relationship and build this very special place at Kukatali. Um, so I will leave you with that. And I don't know, Todd, do you have any closing words? Um, yeah, I think just thank uh, for having us here and being able to present this to you um, and all of our new board members here, uh, commission members, is that what you are? Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just one of my favorite places and it wasn't one of my favorite places cause we could never go out there, uh, in the past, but, um, it's definitely one of my favorite places now, uh, because it's, you know, very, very nice and natural, um, quiet, um, and you can really, uh, get out there and, you know, you know, become one with nature, um, and the resources that are out there, um, because it's such a special place and, um, Put a lot of hard work into it too and you know being out there and uh on the ground with the restoration projects and helping out and so yeah very special place and um yeah if anybody is in the area uh, in the future let me know and um can show you that and our other things too thank you thank you todd thank you lisa and catherine this is uh, uh both yesterday and today has been very informative and i think it, important for the commission to hear what's going on and the uh, activities in the partnership that's truly been uh, amazing. So thank you guys. And we have any questions. We'll start, look over here first. Questions or comments? Sophia, question? So I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. So this might be more of a suggestion than a comment. Um, I, you know, we, I mean, I, I think this, it was so interesting to, to visit and to sort of learn so much about the history and, um, and, you know, the, the, the oh. recent history, especially of, of the park. And, you know, we have the interpretive panels. I was curious if we're planning any, like with the clam gardens, are we planning any interpretation or any sort of, it seems like there's going to be sort of a dual, um, cause I could see that there's no harvesting, like on the map, it was saying, you know, no harvesting on the edge. So that's something we need to inform the public, but also being able to also educate sort of the public about the history and sort of about the clam gardens. Is, is there any interpretation planned with that activity? Yeah, I think there would, yeah, need to be some outreach on, you know, what the, what the clam garden is, but also, um, you know, how things are, are set up to say, you know, that remind people that, you know, the, the tidelands are tribally owned, but they're, you know, open for, for public use, uh, just recreation wise and non consumptive. So, um, so I think, you know, we'll, we'll have to, uh, work with, uh, the board will have to work with the, with the fisheries department and, and thinking about what that outreach needs to be, uh, to protect, you know, the new clam garden and, and the way it needs to be protected. Uh, but informing the public of what it is, because you know it'll be it'll be visible, you know, at lower tides, um, and I think it'll be of you know interest uh, uh, to to visitors when they're when out there and see it. I think the history it's, it it helps with the, I mean, not enforcement, but when people understand the history, I think then the temptation to to harvest or to sort of break those rules is less. You know, does that make sense? Um, so I think that the interpretation hopefully also helps with the, you know, with the enforcement of the no harvesting so that you don't have the public coming to harvest the clams. Simple. Yeah, I'll give just a second. Uh, Mr. Milner. Again, thank you. Uh, do you foresee any changes to the founding agreements and master plan coming before the commission in the next few years? And if so, let us know what those are. I don't think so. Yeah, we haven't just <laughs> we, we haven't been building a list or anything. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay, great. Uh, 
Let me ask Commissioner Williams, have any questions or comments? Mr. Brown. I think I myself is pretty fit, but I struggled a little bit getting down to the beach. And I realize it's a trade off. It's a, you know, it's a natural preserve, but I just wanted to mention that because, you know, we do have the sign directing people to the beach. And I've got two new knees uh, in the last three years, including one pretty recently. And I, that was a bit of a struggle for me to lift up over those logs. So I don't know if anything can be done about that. Again, I know we're trying to keep things natural, but again, just a, an observation that I wanted to share with you. Okay, and I'd also like to turn this over to Commissioner Brown. Second visit yesterday. Thanks to the Catskill Man team. Honored us. Today we especially want to thank the Honors Club. Celebrating a dozen years of Ann's We can Photoshop mark out. He's the new Jack Hart. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark, and thank you all to the uh, board members. I think it's time we can take our lunch break. We will return at one o'clock. And uh, what does that look like, Becky? What's our our plan? Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll adjourn until one o'clock. Okay, we're going to come back to order. And we have the WWRP State Parks Category Project Evaluation. I noticed we have an hour and a half on the, our agenda, which seems I long. don't think it'll take that long, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, but okay, let's give it a try. I mean, you know, hopefully since we do have a few things after that that might also run longer than we would like. So um, let's I will see what we can do. Yeah, I'll just share with you. It's only, my presentation itself is about 22 minutes. Okay. And then the, Great. plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. You're on. Great. Is oh I'm you oh why thank you, Peter. <laughs> All right, well, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the commission. Can you hear me okay? I feel like I need, might need to be closer. Uh, and executive leadership team and everyone else in the audience. Uh, this presentation is a precursor to item E1 that you will be considering tomorrow morning. This afternoon, I will be talking with you about the WWRP State Parks Category Commission scoring. These grants support uh, the customer experience and providing for exceptional recreation, cultural, and interpretive opportunities that all visitors and and enjoy and support. So I will go over the WWRP State Parks uh, category evaluation process and where we are in that process. I will provide a brief overview of the projects that you've been asked to rank as part of the evaluation of the projects uh, and provide a quick overview of question 10, the commission scored question itself, and then present the draft commission rank list for discussion. The list is a preliminary commission rank list. There will be time after this pre presentation for discussion and to answer any questions that you may have. So in front of you is the WWRP evaluation process for the State Parks Category Grant Program. You approved the project list in January of this year. Uh, since that time, the projects have uh, been further scoped and fine-tuned, and staff submitted applications to the Recreation and Conservation Office, which we, re we refer to as the RCO, um, in May, and they have undergone a technical review process at this time. So I'm here with you now to talk with you about the commission scored question, which will be incorporated in the overall evaluation of these project applications. RCO will take these scores from this question and they'll collate them into the evaluation scores um, to, and uh, come up with a preliminary ranked list for the Recreation and Conservation Funding Board uh, consideration at their October meeting. The approved rank list will then go to the legislature for their consideration when allocating funding for the WWRP program out of the capital budget. Funding is typically available in July of 2023 and then agreements will be uh, issued shortly thereafter. The Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program is a grant program funded by the state legislature as part of the capital budget and administered by the State Recreation and Conservation Office. The total legislative appropriation is split into three chunks with 90% of it going to outdoor recreation and habitat conservation projects and 10% going to the farm and forest land preservation projects. Those three accounts further broken down into 12 grant categories. As you can see, 
the uh, this majority of the presentation focuses on the state parks category which receives 30 percent of the money that goes to the outdoor recreation account that's a total of about 13 and a half percent of the overall wwrp appropriation this category is only for state parks projects but we are also eligible to apply in several of the other grant categories which i've shown in the green uh, on the screen it's important to note that the state parks primary funding source for land acquisition is through grants and specifically this grant category. There are 14 projects that staff submitted applications for in May. Uh, there are eight acquisition projects and six development proposals totaling over $18.9 million in grant requests. So to provide some perspective, this shows how much the state parks category re would receive at different WWRP funding levels. Back in 2009 and 2021, WWRP was funded at the highest level of 100 million. Outside of those um, appropriations, the appropriations have ranged anywhere from 45 to 85 million. The list of projects in front of you reflects staff's estimation of funding of the WWRP. W, WRP program at 110 million, which would theoretically fund most of the projects, but would still allow for some alternates um, to, to receive any potential trickle down funding in the event projects close short or they're unsuccessful. Um, however, it, the Washington State Coalition is advocating that the program be funded at 130 million. And if that would happen, it would likely fund all of these projects. Um, but that has not yet at WWRP has not yet been funded at that high rate yet. So move on. This gives you a quick snapshot of the historic funding levels and what state parks category received from WWRP in the past. So as mentioned earlier, there are eight acquisition proposals that were submitted uh, in the state parks category and by statute, 50% of the funding must go towards development projects and 40 to 50% of funding can go towards acquisitions. So when the statute was updated to decrease the amount that would be allocated towards acquisitions, state parks quickly communicated with the RCFB that we uh, would like to maintain that 50% for acquisitions. And so they have approved that for this category only under WWRP. So the split is 50 50. This map shows the distribution of acquisition projects throughout the state. Please note the in holdings and adjacent property project is statewide. So that's off to the side and that would be uh, dependent on where those priority acquisitions are um, that are next in line to acquire on the in holdings list. So as mentioned, there are six development proposals that were submitted totaling over $9 million. And here's, here's the distribution of those projects across the state. So over the next 25 slides or, or excuse me, or so, I will be reviewing each of the projects with, with you and I will start with the acquisition projects and then move through the development. So these projects may sound familiar to you as I presented them to you at the January commission meeting when you did approve the list. What you will find is that there's a couple of modifications. Uh, we did add the Hoko River State Park Schultz property to the list. Um, since that time as the, it came on the market and it was identified as a priority. Uh, and I presented Alta Lake as an alternate, but that was prioritized when the Hayak Trailhead acquisition project fell through. So the first one I'll talk with you about is Alta Lake State Park located in the southern part of Okanagan County. It's right where Okanagan County meets Douglas and Chelan counties. The park is on the northern end of Alta Lake. And this project will acquire several parcels, about 50 acres within the long-term boundary on the west side of the park. Can you see my cursor by chance? Okay, so the, this is the parcel for acquisition. And this would allow for a future campground and trail expansion to protect the view shed, wildlife habitat, and wetland, which is currently already partially within the state park's ownership. Uh, the project will also include a, uh, an agreement for a trail easement on the east side of the lake, 
we're hoping along here um, to allow for trail expansion and to allow for a trail to go around the entire lake. The next project is located near Black Diamond in King County. This project is the second part of a phased acquisition of 16 parcels, totaling approximately 105 acres. The number of parcels acquired will depend on the appraised value, but ideally this phase can purchase nine parcels, totaling approximately 62 acres. Uh, excuse me, I didn't introduce where this is. This is an uh, acquisition at the Green River Gorge. It's Icy Creek Phase 2. Uh, phase 1 was applied for last grant cycle and was funded, and we have appraised and negotiated um, Phase 1, and it's under contract and should close by the end of the year. And so Phase 2 is this portion here. And phase one is here and should close by the end of the year. The next project is at Hoko River State Park on the northwest corner of the state in Clallam County. As mentioned, you have not seen this project. This came to our attention recently and because it is on the market, the director approved this project for application by commission delegated authority in January. Hoko River State Park includes about 940 acres on the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the Hoko River, and the Little Hoko River. The Schultz property is 17 acres on the Hoko River, surrounded uh, by the park on two sides. It is close proximity to Cowan Ranch portion of the park. The Cowan Ranch was an early 1900s dairy farm and ranch that includes several historic buildings. This property is included in the long term boundary of the park and includes parcels connecting the existing parts of the park and protecting the Hoko River and the Little Hoko River on both sides. And this is a closer view of the land classifications and long term park boundary. This property is needed to allow riparian restora restoration and to provide public access to the Hoko River. Okay, the next project. The inholdings and adjacent pro um, properties grant is one that we have submitted every grant cycle since the mid 1990s. So far, we have successfully purchased 62 properties with this funding and are close to closing on three more here shortly. This is arguably one of our highest priority acquisitions as it allows staff to move quickly on high priority smaller acquisitions. We do maintain a list of 50 or so priority in holding acquisition or properties at any given time. It's reviewed continually, added to, and it's reprioritized regu regularly. We have historically applied for $1 million um, from RCO for this grant. This biennium, we have been given approval to increase the in holdings request to 1. Excuse me, 1.5 million. So that's really exciting. So I would like to direct your attention now to the Little Spokane Natural Area in Spokane County. The Robinson property is an 8.2 acre in holding within the Little Spokane Natural Area. Staff submitted this application for this project in 2020, and it is actually still on the 2020 list with the potential that it could be getting some trickle down funds. Uh, we don't yet know that at this time so to be safe we did reapply for this project um we we do have willing sell sellers and the situation is complicated with a trust that involves three sisters that live in different states the next proposed acquisition is located adjacent to saint edward state park in the city of kenmore in king county This project would acquire six and a half acre property that is adjacent to the northern boundary of St. Edward State Park and includes almost 300 feet of shoreline along Lake Washington. Forterra has been actively partnering with us uh, actually for the last couple of years. They applied in the WWRP urban wildlife category last grant round for this acquisition and did not score high enough. 
we worked with them on that application. So we've continued partnering with them and we decided to submit it in the state parks category. It is one of the last undeveloped parcels on the lake and the purpose of the acquisition uh, is for the protection of the wildlife corridor and trail continuation and connectivity at the park. Uh, Forterra has been working with um, the landowner as well as they have been applying for grants to partner on this. They have secured a 250,000 watershed grant to help with the incidental cost for this project as well as they've also secured a conservation futures grant with King County. They, it does not show as match on this project because it's not eligible to, but they would be buying development rights with that, which then decreases the value of the property for us to go and buy it more affordably. And yes, this is the more affordable price. Next, we will look at the property in Klickitat County along the Klickitat Trail State Park. This project would acquire properties between Klickitat and Warwick along the Klickitat State Park Trail in an area known as Swale Canyon. Swale Canyon is commonly considered one of the most beautiful sections of the trail. Most of the acquisitions will focus around protection of rare habitat and restoration and water quality improvements. The Yakima Nation and U.S. Forest Service have been active partners on the trail and support this project moving forward. Now I'm going to direct your attention west to the Willapa Hill State Park, the far west, specifically the city of South Bend in Pacific County. This project will purchase a 2.22 acre Pacific County parcel located within, within the city of South Bend. You can see it right here, highlighted in yellow. And this would be the new western terminus of the Willapa Hills Trail, which is currently right here. And it's zoom over here, and it's a little restroom. The city is concurrently working with us. Um, they are interested in acquiring two parcels with the intent to provide overnight accommodation for trail users. And it would be these two parcels here that they would acquire and then develop into overnight accommodation. Our, par our parcel would be used as a trailhead, parking, and restroom for the park. Uh, the city is also concurrently working with DOT to provide the half mile connection via the sidewalk on the right of way of Highway 101 to continue the trail to this new uh, terminus. So that completes the review of the acquisition projects. Over the next dozen or so slides, <laughs> I will provide an overview of the development projects that were submitted in the state parks category, and they are in no particular order. We will start down south at Cape Disappointment State Park, located in Pacific County. So this is a project at Cape Disappointment. There are two separate ends of the Three Waters Trail at Cape Disappointment State Park that already exist, and they are in the yellow. Can you see these? It might be kind of tiny on your screen. Yes, no, the yellow. And yeah. then the red is the proposed project area. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. I thank you. Uh, the first, so so the first located on the Columbia River, and the, okay, yeah. So there, so one is on the Columbia River side, and then the other is on the Pacific Ocean. They were dedicated in two thousand six. Two thousand six. The intention of this project is to link those two trails together. Um, it's called the Three Waters Trail. It was first designed by one of the most important landscape architects in the in U.S. history, Maya Lin, famous for her design of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. This project proposes to build a 0.3-mile section of trail that will be aligned in such a way that it will provide access to the wetlands and Lake O'Neill along here in this section, thus completing the vision of linking by trail the park's three waters, including the Columbia River, the wetlands in the lake, and the Pacific Ocean together. The next development proposal is located at Fort Casey State Park on Woodby Island in Island County in the northwest portion of our state. 
This project will modify accessible parking, provide a barrier free route of travel to the lighthouse, waypoint interpretive hub and an accessible restroom. The interpretive hub will include a paved plaza with interpretive signage and benches. And it will allow for a gathering space for educational programming. So this is a project that I reviewed with you in January, but not under the WWRP state parks category. This was reviewed under the trails category. This is the Palusta Cascades trail Malden to Canova development proposal. Uh, we decided to um, move this one under state parks category and move Anderson Lake project to the trails um, after further consideration of how competitive the two projects would be uh, to increase their chances of funding. So this is a project to develop a section of the Palusta Cascades Trail in Whitman County from the town of Malden to Canova. This project follows on the heels of the development grant state parks received last grant round for the, Ros for the Rosalia to Malden surfacing project, which is the, in the purple. This section is currently um, we are in the process of signing contracts now to start work in early August and expect completion uh, sometime in 2023. This uh, per, this trail proposal, if funded, would be for the 23-25 biennium. Uh, this project would upgrade five miles of trail surface between Malden and Canova, as shown in blue. It will also restore and fireproof three burn trestles in this section and build a new trailhead access point. Ultimately, this project will prepare for the next phase of development to provide access to Rock Lake. Now I would like to direct your attention back to the west side of the mountains to our newest state park, Nisqually, which is located in Pierce County just outside of the town of Eatonville. The park is on the Nisqually River, about midway between the National Park and National Wildlife Refuge. It is near the University of Washington's Pack Forest, shown in teal, right here. And the park itself is red. This project is part of phase three construction of the park and will build, starting from the future campground, a paved in and out multi-use ADA trail that is 5,900 feet long and 10 feet wide. With it, it will also have a four foot wide parallel rock trail for equestrian use that leads to a cantilevered overlook of the Michelle River Valley and view of Mount Rainier. Other improvements include benches and interpretive signage to provide information on the environment, history and culture. The, plat the platform will be open graded fiber, uh, reinforced plastic mesh, allowing visitors to see through it, producing the experience of walking over the edge of a slope and floating in air. And the platform itself will be about 720 square feet. Okay, now we will go east again, but this time to Riverside State Park in Spokane County. This project will complete the final phase of Bowl and Pitcher Cabin Project. Initiated in 2015, the first phase completed the design of all four cabins and installed two out of the four. This final phase will construct the final two cabins, providing the park and Greater Spokane area with desirable cabins in one of the premier locations within Riverside State Park. The final development project is located on the Willapa Hills Trail State Park that stretches from Chehalis to the city of South Bend. This project will surface approximately 19 miles of trail with compacted gravel from Pluvius to Menlo in Pacific County and improve Bridge 43, which is a 75 foot span that is about 10 foot wide by stabilizing the structure and installing concrete surfacing and safety rails. Compacted gravel will eliminate uneven rocky surfaces caused by railroad ballast. So here is a quick glimpse at all of the projects that are being proposed and all of the um, in in the grant programs and categories. Uh, well, in the state parks category, so it, it shows both the acquisitions and the developments and their distribution across the state. So we have 14 projects in this category requesting over $18.9 million in grant requests.
So in the WWRP state parks grant category, there are 12 questions total for project evaluation. Questions one and nine, one through nine are part of the project evaluation that is going to be taking place in August shortly here. Um, and they are evaluated by an independent volunteer advisory committee. 11 and 12 are questions that are scored by RCO. And then question 10 on the screen here is why I'm speaking with you today. This is the commission scored question. This question asks the commission to rank the projects based on how well the projects implement the commission priorities with 14 points being the highest priority and one being the lowest. You have each ranked the projects. These projects will be given a proportional score for question 10 in the project evaluation based off of the average commission ranking, which I will show you now. So there was a modification uh, right before this presentation. So the, the list that was sent out was, was modified since then. So I sent this previously to you for your review. Um, so here is the preliminary draft ranked list for your consideration and discussion. Is it big enough on the screen there, Peter? No. Oops, wonder. Let's do this. Does that make it better? What? Right here, so I'm did it work? Oh, present. Sorry. Oh, good. Is that better? Okay, so as you can see, the individual scores by each commissioner and the average of those scores are in the column here going down. The far right hand column indicates the actual priority ranking from 1 to 14. So the number one project would get the highest number of points available for question 10, which is six points. If during discussion this afternoon, the commission would like to make any changes to the rank list, then that is possible and it can be done at the commission meeting tomorrow by motion before submitting to RCO. So this does conclude staff's presentation at this time. I welcome any questions or observations about the preliminary rank list. Yeah. Um, is is this what you were expecting? Are there questions about specific projects? Are there other topics that you would like to bring up and have a discussion about? About this, uh, about this item. About this item. <laughs> right. Oh, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about the weather and we should be outside or something like that. But Laura, while you're so looking let's... up the weather, could you put your cursor on where Swale Creek is? Like Swale Creek? Yeah. Uh, which uh, which one? Like here's Swell Creek right here. Okay. So, uh, so four. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll let's let's three maybe three. organize this a little bit where let's if people have questions okay. about individual okay. projects, whether we under understand them well enough or not. Uh, if we could maybe do that first. Um, so this would be questions about clarifications on particular individual projects. Uh, are there any questions regarding individual projects? Well, this is good. Oh, there's uh, Commissioner Milner. I have a comment since there are no oh. questions. Okay. If there are indeed no questions. Okay. I'd just like to say how uniquely situated we are. Closer to the mic. We are very uniquely situated here in that we have two people who are very much on the inside of RCO running this, Laura and Peter. Peter's on uh, the funding board. And how many years were you working in RCO? I might have been, I may have been there seven years. So may have been, <laughs> without incriminating myself, seven years. I just want to say that uh, tomorrow I'll make a motion that we grant the standard rich and famous contract to these two people because they have had huge impact <laughs> positive impact on our ability to work with this system. So well done. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just open it up for anything related Maybe to this topic. Questions, comments? Yeah. Yes. 
Oh. Holly? Commissioner Thunberg. Yeah. Sorry. Was that is that Holly? Is that I can't tell because you're on full screen. It was. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. But go ahead. Oh, Holly. Sophia. Yes. Go. Go, go for it, Holly. Uh, okay. Um. Um. So. One thing I just sort of wonder for the future is if it if there isn't any merit in sort of ranking development and acquisition separately, since it's my understanding from you, Laura, that, you know, it, they really are two separate pots of money, but that's neither here nor there for right now. Um, I just wanted to uh, share with the commission that I did talk to the executive director of the Confluence Project about the Cape Disappointment Three Water Trail. Uh, he was very enthusiastic to with uh, to know that um, this project would be uh, hopefully on our list. I'm, you know, I would personally like to see it score a little higher because it's been something that's been a long time. We've been waiting for it a long time, and it's a park that and it's in a park that gets a lot, a lot of use. So I think it would be a really wonderful asset. But hopefully, we will receive enough money so that that won't be an issue. That's all I have. Thank you. And a bit Any of history, other? if you'd like it. Sure. Before there was RCO, there was IAC, and our former commissioner, Russ Cahill, also former deputy director, I think, um, was a part of the movement to put that this whole program together. And before that, all of these grant proposals from across the state came to state parks. And people put a great, Larry Fairley was part of that effort, he explained to me. And this is a way to equitably approach um, distributing money for outdoor recreation, not just not just to state parks, but to, you know, many of the swimming pools in this state were built by grants that came through state parks back then. And so this is what you're seeing is a long term evolution of how grant money from the state uh, came to be as it is. And uh, so. Yeah, and I think for uh, uh, Commissioner Williams, I just say, I know when I went through these projects and mm -hmm. downloaded all the information that Laura had provided, and I actually sort of thought about them in those two different categories, acquisition and development, and personally putting acquisition a little bit higher, even though it's, you know, 50 50, um, just because, um, you know, a lot of times acquisitions are available and then they're not. Uh, and development is perhaps ready and it can still be ready. Uh, and so uh, that was sort of the way I approached it, uh, thinking of those two. Two pieces, big pieces of the puzzle uh, and like and the information you provided us was was helpful. Uh, would have, you know, might have been helpful to have, to have gone through that this presentation that you just did Prior before to, we, right? You know, made the ranking, but you know the the summaries you provided and the the links uh, I think helped at least helped me a lot. So any any other comments, yes, Commissioner Dannenberg? Well, your chance to um, a few more yeah. Riverside. So I, you know, I, yeah, I agree projects. that it. It, it might be, I mean, I think for me, it might be interesting to see. Obviously, we don't know what the funding will be, but um, do we, you know, if we have a sense if we can, since it is sort of two different pots between if we were to split, actually then show it split, um, where would sort of the water line be? Where do we think would be sort of above and below the water line? Um, I'd be curious. Um, does that make sense? If we like, if yeah. we were to sort of guess what we think that the funding level might be. Um, so, what's likely to go below and what's likely to go above. And it's hard to tell because it's not just like 11, it's not just the so, rank, right? Right, With the acquisition, that's a really good question. So the acquisition and developments are on the same list. So if say we get 100 million, the state parks category will get 12.9 million. So half of that 6.4 million towards develop. I mean, I'm just right. throwing out some numbers. You know, 6.4 million for, for development projects on this list and 6.4 for acquisition. So you start going, you start with in holdings, you got 1.5 million, and then you add the next acquisition is Green River Gorge. But that, so also keep in mind, this is one question that's six points. There's nine questions with 
a lot of a lot more points associated for the overall evaluation. But if you were to just look at this, you could go down and see how far it would go with just this question in consideration. So 1.5 plus is you know, so that plus Green River Gorge or over 3 million, 4 million mm -hmm. with Swill Creek. Now, um, next one would be Riverside. Five, maybe you're getting closer to five and a half and you'd be making it down to the Willapa Hills. Willapa and then and maybe even the next one after that, Alta Lake. So maybe partial funding. Maybe so, Laura, for, for tomorrow, which was just when we vote on this, if you could maybe do that for us, kind sure. of give us a, a chart that shows at the different going, acquisition potential funding level. levels. Yeah, 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 and kind of where they would land. And, yeah. and, uh, then, and I assume, I assume we. That was just the first question. Just to, okay, I will. Uh, yeah, I will. But uh, I assume. Uh, I mean, RCO. Uh, will stick to the 50 50 or they don't have to is that right or do they? it's policy yeah, now they, okay they okay. will for state parks sorry commissioner Dannenberg. go ahead yeah. i don't know i mean we can have a discussion i just meant if we're going to go off topic i just want to make clear that was only like the first thing i was going to say but if somebody else had no, comments no. that we can come back no. to from that do you have any comments commissioner Brown? Uh, no i have a question uh for laura um i know that i sent you a few emails and we had a nice exchange on a number of questions one of them though escapes my memory at the moment i had asked you about commissioner milner's idea that on uh, ada we have a category that's ada not specific to any site or property so that there was a resource available for us when we had opportunities to make progress on that front what, what was your answer to my email question about whether we could do something like that? If we have a pot of money, I'm not sure if I addressed that question. So my apologies. Um, if we have a pot of money for ADA projects specifically. We do. Oh, right. Multi-site so for ADA. We were talking about that when we were updating the policy for the state parks category evaluation, The all of the the uh, the when we were modifying the evaluation questions, we were talking about adding the multi-site um, eligibility policy to state parks category because it's eligible to apply for a multi-site development project in the state lands development category of WWRP, which is what Fish and Wildlife and DNR apply in. So we were proposing to have the same eligibility in our grant category for state parks. That did not make their policy update. So we weren't able to get that updated for this grant round, but that was the thought was that we could be looking at, okay, uh, maybe we could be looking at within a region, multiple parks that needed ADA upgrades or potentially playground installations or, or removals and have that as a um, pot of money that you could use for that. So that was part of the policy update for next grant round for sure. In addition to that, Peter, do you, is there, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, is there any money that was allocated for ADA improvements? Take away in the capital budget. Yeah. Oh, yes. okay. Yep. No, the How other much thing, is that, Peter? A million or? No, more than that. I more think than it was three or something. Three. That, yeah. no, I'd have to check. Yeah. The other, the other issue is um, the state parks category requires new development only so it's kind of threads the needle if you're going to do a renovation for ada right um so what what we usually ask for are kind of the like what you see for the fort casey project a, a new path that provides new access ada to a to a feature or amenity okay anything else yeah, yeah. Mr. Denver. I was going to comment on um, so one of them. I'll just I'll start with that one since we're talking about the ADA is that um, I was, so one of the, the the sort of redo on the chart is I realized that I had actually right. I had done the ranking wrong. I basically did it completely in reverse. Um, so I did rank the ADA high, partially because, you know, I don't I, I don't know. I don't have a sense, but I don't have a feeling that, you know, we have a lot of, you know, ADA accessible sites at state parks and we have all this you know discussion about, you know, 
Disabled veterans and DEI and you know equity and you know I'm, I am disappointed to see that you know per, pretty much no other commissioner thought that that was the priority at all that it was ranked so low to everybody else um, and and I can only hope it's because you're assuming that it was going to be that that it was going to be funded some other way because I do think we need to really have some serious discussion about you know chair you know our chair. When you know, we yesterday we went to a park that was not ADA accessible, you know, would not really be accessible. And then he had made a comment that he wasn't able to step over some logs on the beach path. And yet we're saying, oh, but you know, if you're on a we're fine with someone who's on a wheelchair not even be able to get close to that beach path, can't even go through there. And for that particular site, I think there's very good reason for us not to have ADA accessibility um, in order to protect the natural resources. And I think that we have to make that trade off so frequently that we have to decide that, you know, this is something where we cannot have something that's ADA accessible because of a natural resource impact or some other impact. And so where we can, where it is very much a, I mean, it's pretty much a tourist site, right? We're talking about, you know, our ability to put in ADA accessible path. I, I would hope that, you know, we we want to do that and that we prioritize that. And I just feel uncomfortable with the messaging that says it's just not a commission priority. Again, except I did see, you know, um, I was happy to see the commissioner Milner made a note um, on his ranking that um, he believes it should be funded some other way. And so I really do think if we're going to have this, you know, so low, we need to be saying, you know, what are we doing about, you know, ADA accessibility to places where it's it's possible and would make sense. Um, and then I did put a note on my rankings regarding the trails and I, um, and this actually came from you, Commissioner Bounds, because you were talking about whether or not we should be sort of, some of these numbers for the trail resurfacing is a lot, you know, it's a lot of money. And if we're not happy with the, what we're using for the trail surface, you know, I, I was wondering if we should have a discussion about, you know, does it make sense to spend, you know, two and a half million dollars on crushed gravel and that's us to come around and say, mm, but we don't like the crushed gravel, <laughs> you know, is that like, you know, should that we be having a discussion about um, spending this money versus, you know, do we think we're going to have different um, surfacing right. um, options? Because I, I look at, you know, the this the largest sort of dollar value project, some of the largest ones on here, and it's trail resurfacing. And then we go back and say, well, but we don't like what we're using for the trail surface. And, it's, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> you know. Right, it's a two pronged process. There's the, getting the answer to that question yeah. <laughs> and getting the, the, answer, the correct answer, which is it will be a surface that is usable to the customer um, is, still has to be answered um, and i think we're going to have a we'll have a, somewhat of a conversation about that yeah tomorrow, so I, but you, you may want to speak to that right now for willow i think we have planned to do a september next commission meeting in-depth deep dive on surfacing okay. <laughs> uh, um, commissioner colony uh, Connolly and i and uh the trails program manager um lisa anderson were um, and Tico in a number of places, Malden, Rosalia, um, a few weeks back. So um, I, I feel like I'm getting a pretty serious education on the topic myself. And so, <laughs> so, um, uh, and John was there too. He was really great. Um, the, so, so this is sort of a collective deep dive that we'd like to take in September and, and in between have some additional conversations. One of the things that you'll see that we do um, not infrequently in grant projects and capital projects is that we'll spec out the, the most expensive version of, of what we could be doing as far as the surface treatment. And then through the design process, once we get the grant, then we can adapt that and modify that to suit. So I think this is something that we're trying to build in. Um, uh, that we have a pretty significant amount of flexibility in terms of what that um, what that surface ultimately looks like, because there is the design element that's that that happens before we actually go to construction. It's not as though we just sort of do exactly what's in the grant and now we go straight to construction. There is a design phase that happens first. Okay, so we think that I mean, because some of these are, as I said, some of our the Plus to Cascade, the Malden to Canova, and you know, some of these. I, th I, th I thought they said crushed gravel and that's what we were costing out. And, and, and so I was questioning, okay, are we, are we moving forward? And then are we doing it sort of backwards or we're saying we're moving forward with this project? And then same with the will at the hills, I think resurfacing, which is, you know, and then we're gonna come back and say, oh, but we want a different surface. 
Yeah, and I think we have some time to come to that conclusion um, okay. more specifically. And, and uh, again, what I'm hearing about the current grant that we have, surfacing grant, is it's is it's um, about a mile of crushed rock, and I think a much longer stretch that is is being treated in a different way. Um, and so it it really is. We have to fine tune what the treatment is to achieve the standard, which is um, that people can ride their bikes on it, horses and pedestrians, and and to the extent the utmost extent, make it accessible for uh, mobility devices and wheelchairs, et cetera. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, I think a real challenge, because this isn't the first time we've had this conversation. Uh, and I think the real challenge may be if we're trying to meet uh, different standards for different users and perhaps not making anybody happy. Uh, because the trail surface that a horseback rider prefers versus a trail surface that a let's say a, a road bicyclist prefers versus a trail surface that a, a more casual trail biker uh, uh, prefers versus a surface that a pedestrian may prefer may not all be compatible in the same. 12, 15, 20 feet. And I don't haven't had the answer to that. Uh, and I think that's a could be a real issue because I my own observation is that at least for the for the few um, sites I've seen or been part of, uh, it doesn't I'm not sure you could have a trail that works well for all of those users. The various sections of the trail is that it is not the trail itself right now. It is not uniform, right? And so you look at one area, you'd walk, I don't know, 20 feet and the what's on the trail right now is a different kind of rock, a different size rock. So it's it's not a matter of having one way to do a huge swath. It's going to be it's right. So then yeah. the challenge is how do you design that and build it so that it works? I yeah. mean, a piece of land you're building a house on right. parts of it, you know, right. can handle a certain kind of foundation, parts of it can't. And if you're going to build a house, you got to figure it out and mm -hmm. make it work. So, yeah. Yeah. well, and broadly I'm speaking, not, what we want to do is right now the, the the thought here that we've talked quite a lot about is develop it to a high a high state of completion in and around the small towns and have have people be able to do outback experiences. And so it's in, in those towns, it's highly accessible. And then as you work your way out, it's going to get less and less accessible, not hopefully passable and good, as it, uh, but then we'd be able to to work on um, uh, those intervening points uh, over time and, and perfect those over time. All right. One more question, because I'm troubled by the ADA at Fort Casey Lighthouse as well. Uh, if is there any other pot of money available nationally for us to address AD issues? And I also wonder, and I don't know if, if Peter, you're the right one to ask this of, but I also wonder where does the law where what triggers and sometimes I think of these things as not being options. There's a reason we we have an Americans with Disabilities Act. It's the law. So at what point do you reach the point where everybody else can go in there, except it's a real challenge or impossible for people with disabilities, and you have to do something about it? So kind of rambling here, but I think you probably get the thrust of my questions. Yeah, I think the, the law more uh, kicks in um, for new construction. That there's standards that we have to meet when we start touching a, a place and start putting capital dollars into it, then then we have to achieve some standards. Um, where it's just uh, an existing state park, there's nothing that says um, that you have to meet a certain standard if you haven't uh, put an investment in that or a contemporary project into it. What there what the law requires is that we create a what's called the transition plan that gets us from where we are now to accessible. Um, Appropriately, appropriately accessible uh, access to all of our parks. 
And so we created that about two years ago and updated that plan and now have a, it's about a $40 million cost that we've um, sort of amortized out over several biennia to achieve that accessible standard uh, mm -hmm. to, to eliminate the barriers that we've um, inventoried throughout our state park system. It, there's there's different ways of achieving access too. It's not always that's that um, a person with a, a mobility disability can get from A to B and achieve uh, every experience in a park. But there's something called programmatic um, access, where uh, and I think a good example was what you saw at Cape Disappointment when we walked down the trail to the lighthouse. The last part of that trail wasn't able to be made accessible. But that what we did is we provided interpretation and a pull out there at the end that somebody with a mobility disability could experience the lighthouse, albeit from afar, but there was some photographs and some very good interpretation of, to provide that edification and enrichment for somebody with disabilities uh, programmatically where we weren't able to provide actual access to that specific site. So there's, there's different ways of achieving uh, accessibility. Um, but again, it's, it's sort of the, the main thrust of it is that we have a plan in place to go from where we are now, uh, of overcoming the barriers, uh, and then anytime we put new money into something that we'll, we, we will try to achieve that. The commission has said we are trying to achieve universal access, which is an even higher standard than just accessibility uh, from uh, as strictly construed with under, uh, within ADA. So, so excuse me for interrupting, but what was it about this particular location though that triggered you and others in our staff to want this to bubble up to a high level of consideration. What was, what caught your eye about this project? I think very similar to the Cape Disappointment. I think that was a, a mm -hmm. good example of where you have a really prized resource, which is finding access to a, a lighthouse that is iconic and, a, and in a setting that is otherwise highly accessible to be able to provide uh, access to that. And I think John can talk a little bit about this too, but. Yeah. You know. The Hamilton Lighthouse wanted it to be accessible for, for years. It would do you know extreme damage to try to do that to the to the structure, um, and so you know creating a like experience is is a hundred percent better than what we have right now. Uh, we just don't there there isn't any way to get you know somebody that has a mobility issue you know to the lighthouse. It's you know rough gravel, so. Something like what Peter's describing, or what this this plan is, just makes a lot of sense to get us that much further to providing a, a meaningful experience for someone. But it's access to the lighthouse, right? It's a similar, not in the lighthouse, yeah, right? It's a similar dark, situation because right. they getting access within a, the light. This particular lighthouse, too, or the doorways and all kinds of stuff make it very difficult. And so, programmatically, providing appropriate access to an iconic thing is to provide this secondary. Right. Um, Overlook and interpretation, and being able to provide that uh, that experience to people equitably. And if I if I may add to that, Northwest Region, this is a huge this is a high priority for Northwest Region. Uh, I was I was just looking at the capital budget during this discussion, and there is the ADA compliance for twenty three twenty five is at the one point nine 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 funding level, so it's two million dollars basically, and then they've also. Um, put a line item in for Fort Casey ADA improvements for 877,000. So, and I think the intent is if it's, they're not successful in this grant, they have some money to do something there. It's that high of a priority. So they, they put it in both locations. Mr. Milner. Close to the microphone. 20, 25,000. <laughs> 10 years, 25,000. 25,000. Yeah. So, in my mind, and in the private sector, many of these ADA projects are maintenance projects. Yeah. And, and they can be little, like adding grab rails. They could be adding ramps to um, uh, 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 washrooms. And, but it can also be uh, larger projects. And and twenty five thousand dollars doesn't get you all that far. So it's somewhat disturbed. I don't know what the traditions are, whether it's built into the Gasby's or whether it, uh, you know, why OFM puts that cut line up there. But I think we could get a lot more done on the operations side and maintenance with ADA if that was open to us. Yeah, and we do that, particularly the deferred maintenance list. 
and that's mm -hmm. that list between 25,000 and a million, but uh, that that has a lot of room for exactly that sort of thing. Commissioner Williams, you're now on the screen and I see your hand. Thank you, Commissioner Bounds. Um, so, um, Laura, I believe that the Cape D3 Waters project will be an ADA accessible trail. It doesn't say so, I don't think, in the document, but I believe that's true. Is that correct? Yes, that should be true. Right, because the other two pieces are. Yes. So, um, I don't know if that's helpful as we move projects forward um, to make that more visible. Um, I did like what um, Peter Herdsock said about the um, the cross the long distance trails that in the more um, inhabited areas will be ADA accessible. It sounds like I think that's important. Um, but um, yeah, just a thought. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you, Laura, and we will look forward to our conversation tomorrow. Now we're scheduled for a break, but my suggestion is we go through the state grant applications. Well, let me just see. I mean, what do what do my fellow commissioners think about? at least starting the state um, grant application presentation and then if, if, if it keeps going then uh, we can maybe take a break at 2 30. It, it won't keep going <laughs> and so let's let's get started on that great thanks perfect are we are you doing an intro <laughs> oh <laughs> thank you thank you peter you need a break. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, but I will present. So let's share. This is helpful. Some, some things that. Is, is this where we say bye to Holly? At least on the screen, not that you're leaving us. It's the <laughs> state grant. All right, well, I won't introduce myself again. But uh, this presentation is a precursor to item E2 that you will be considering tomorrow afternoon. So this afternoon, I will be talking with you about the second round of grant projects that staff is proposing to submit for application later in the fall. We refer to this one as the fall grant round. Oh, okay, so thank you so much. I just spoke with you regarding the commission scored question for the WWRP state parks grant category evaluation. That grant program and category is currently under evaluation. Uh, the list of projects that we'll be focusing on in this presentation is for application in the fall through the RCO. There are three grant programs in which we are proposing to submit applications for, and they are the boating facilities, program, the recreational trails program, and the non-highway off-road vehicle account. I will go over each of these programs with you today and provide a brief overview of the projects in which we were proposed to submit grants. There will be time at the end of the presentation to address questions and have an opportunity for discussion. So I'll start with the boating facilities program. And that's really what started the agency as we know it. So when Commissioner Milner talked about the IAC, this program um, really was the reason why the IAC became um, an agency. It was established in 1964, um, and the IAC was established to manage these funds. So it was a voter passed initiative as a way to ensure that there would be places for people to vote. The focus for this money is on facilities that accommodate trailerable vessels, usually those boats under 26 feet in length, and it must be for transient recreational boating. Funding comes from the state gasoline taxes paid by boaters. It is divided equally from um, 
from state and local agencies. So it's a 50-50 split. Typically, state agencies that apply in the boating facilities program would be state parks, fish and wildlife, and DNR. However, it's primarily fish and wildlife and state parks that competes for this money. We like to get it. It's all friendly competition. So there are four projects that are being proposed in voting, and they are listed here in no particular order. The total grant request is 5.9 million. And I will note, um, typically we get anywhere from like a 15 or $14 million. It, it varies on the allocation for boating, but about 14, 14.9 um, is what we got last grant round. Uh, and then that would be split between local projects and state projects. So this map shows the distribution of the boating projects in the state. As you can see, three are in Northwest region and the one at Swim Bay is in our Southwest region. You may notice there aren't any in uh, Eastern region and there's a reason for that. The last grant round, Eastern region received several grant grants in the boating facilities program and they are in the process of working through, through those and getting those under contract. Uh, they got, they received a couple of Sacagawea planning projects for river floats and parking improvements. They also have a 25 mile creek boat ramp and moorage floats planning project in place, as well as they've been working on the Lake Wenatchee launch improvement planning project. A lot of good stuff, as well as we have other boating programs that are active as well, or boating projects that are active as well. Uh, the first project I would like to tell you about is located at Squim Bay State Park, which is on the inside of Puget Sound on the Olympic Peninsula. This is a planning project that would fund the design and permit of a new pier located near the boat launch, uh, shown in the upper right-hand photo, which is, um, it would replace the existing pier structure, as you can see in this photo on the lower right. Uh, it is in failing condition, condition and beyond repair or even replacement at this specific location. Uh, and that's due to the instability of the slope above it. So the proposal is to re relocate the new pier near the boat launch and, as, and this pier is going to be removed in 2023. The next two projects are located in the islands in Northwest region. BFP funded the planning for both of these projects in 2016. In 2018, we attempted to secure the development funding for them and we were unsuccessful. In 2020, we attempted again for the development funding and we were successful in getting the Stewart Island mortgage replacement at Reed Harbor. Reed Harbor is this one right here. So that one was funded. However, the Susha Island Moorage did not make the funding cut. So the proposed projects uh, would fund the moorage replacement on Susha Island as indicated. Um, and the moorage replacement at Stewart at Prevost Harbor, which is shown here. The final boating project that we are proposing is located on Orcas Island in an, in an unincorporated community of Olga in San Juan County. This is a, again, a planning project. You Planning is huge in the boating facilities program because of the time it takes to get through design and permitting over the water. So oftentimes we will submit planning before we move into a development proposal. Uh, the plan, this is, a planning project to fund and design fund the design and permit for the full replacement of this heavily used dock. We have a memorandum of agreement with the community to maintain the dock. Uh, the dock is a public dock. It's open to everyone and we use it for our park boats when we are coming to the island. Um, and we're estimating we may have 10 years left on of life on this dock. So we need to get moving on the planning and development for this dock. So that moves us into the recreational trails program. 
Uh, this program provides federal funding to maintain trails and faci facilities that offer a backcountry experience. This funding is vital to keep keeping trails open to the public. As public agencies face funding shortage, shortages, maintenance, maintenance is often delayed or eliminated. This grant program is one of the few for maintaining backcountry trails. Uh, typical projects include maintaining and rerouting trails, building trail site and trailhead facilities, uh, running environmental education and trail safety programs, uh, and those types of activities. Uh, the program emphasis is on providing a backcountry experience and addressing backlog maintenance. This is a grant program that is um, eligible for local entities, uh, federal, nonprofits, special purpose districts, states, and tribes. And it's really one of those few programs that RCO offers that's open and um, has uh, nonprofits eligible to apply. And they do apply in this program, and they're it's they're very successful. So the nonprofit organizations that typically apply in the recreational trails program would be those trails organizations like Washington Trails Association, the Backcountry Horsemen, Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance, and they do very well in this program, as does the U.S. Forest Service. So with the exception of the Winter Recreation Program grant, State Parks has seen moderate success in our applications in this program. Uh, however, I'm happy to say that hasn't really stopped us from being creative and trying to continue to leverage money out of this program. Uh, the Winter Rec Program does plan to submit uh, some projects this year. They're estimating about five, but I will not be talking with you about those today as they have not figured out uh, the scope of those projects at this time. Uh, I do have a list to go through. Uh, there is one change to this list, the St. Edward State Park, which is the fourth project that is listed on there, the trail reroute, that was determined to be moved under the Northwest Region Trail Maintenance Project. Uh, they felt that it would do better being incorporated under region priority uh, maintenance. So they have um, requested to pull that off the list. So we have now three proposed projects and five proposed alternate projects. So the subsequent slides will reflect um, three, uh, will, will still reflect four proposed projects, but it's actually three now. So this map shows the distribution of the, uh, the proposed and the alternate projects. Proposed are indicated by the red star and the blue stars are the proposed. We will start with the Anderson Lake State Park project, which is 20 minutes from Port Townsend on the Northeastern Olympic Peninsula in Jefferson County. This project, although state's development on the slide is actually considered a maintenance project, RTP, um, at, when, when you are providing maintenance on an existing trail there are some they're more, more they're more lenient in what they're calling development versus maintenance the grant would maintain the savage memorial trail and install boardwalk at the south end of anderson lake as shown in the top aerial photo the flooding is due to beaver activity there have been uh, um, efforts in the past to control the flooding uh, by installing a pond leveling device in 2021 however the flooding has continued. So this proposal would address that issue at the park. The next project is located at Beacon Rock State Park on the Columbia River Gorge in Skamania County. Staff submitted this project last grant round in the NOVA category uh, grant program and it, and it didn't make the funding cut. Staff is proposing to submit submit this project in RTP and see how it competes in the uh, RTP pro program versus NOVA. If this, is, this project is considered again a maintenance grant and would reroute a half mile of trail above mile two and formalize existing social trails that access viewpoints. Uh, there is an active state, la uh, state lands restoration grant that we did receive last year, or excuse me, last grant round 
that um, proposed to restore the bald habitat at this location, but this grant is critical in making the restoration successful at this site. So um, in order for the project for the state lands restoration to be protected, the act, um, this project needs to be funded to eliminate visitation into those sensitive areas. Okay, the third and final proposed project in the RTP category mm -hmm. is located at Riverside State Park in the Little Spokane Natural Area in Spokane County. This is phase two development for a project that was submitted last grant round in RTP for the development of a new trailhead, a pro which is located approximately 0.25 miles northeast of Painted Rocks Trailhead. This trailhead would provide dedicated parking for the seven mile knothead loop it includes a paved entrance and two gravel parking areas with 40 spaces and ADA accommodations, restroom, kiosk, fencing, fee station, and trail access between trailheads. And why this is phase two, it did get funded late. Um, it was on the cusp of getting funded in the last grant round under uh, RTP. We did get money for it, but we don't anticipate because of inflation, we will be able to complete that this project in its entire scope. So this is a subsequent application to complete the project. So as mentioned, this project uh, was removed from the list. This is the one at St. Edward State Park, the trail reroute. So I'm going to skip this slide as well as I will skip this one. And we will move on to the Blue Mountain Education. So our first proposed alternate is in the southeast corner of the state in the Blue Mountain Management Area, specifically at Flus Falls and uh, Camp Wooten, located in Whitman and Franklin counties. Uh, last grant round, staff submitted for an education project to fund education materials and staff time at Flus Falls State at Palouse Falls State Park. And it was really exciting because it was the really the first of its kind that we submitted and it was successful. Um, it had a few hiccups, but we're uh, utilizing those funds. The intent of resubmitting this project would be to provide education at both Palouse Falls and Camp Wooten. However, staff needs to further scope the idea. So this is just leaving this project idea on the table as a proposed alternate as collaboration continues. And the next three proposed alternates are ones that would address priority trail maintenance needs identified in their regions. So this is Eastern region, we have Northwest region trail maintenance and Southwest region trail maintenance. And realistically, the grant would be used over two years um, to provide backlog trail maintenance for high priority trails throughout several state parks in the prospective region application. Uh, this is a new idea. It was submitted last grant round by Northwest Region staff and it was funded. It did not score high, but it made it under the funding cut. So they had identified 13 or so, so parks in their region and have funded work that includes brushing of trails, windfall removal, tread repair, drainage concerns, uh, and those types of smaller trail needs. Um, that don't include large uh, items of work like boardwalks. It is one of um, it is one that all of the regions are discussing quite extensively and strategy strategizing about whether or not it would be appropriate to submit all three applications or if we should be just submitting uh, one region application. And the final proposed alternate is located in the Puget Sound on the Cascadia Marine Trail. Uh, this project would maintain 40 Cascadia Marine Trail day use and camping sites, which would include signage and informational kiosks. This project was applied for last grant round and didn't make the funding cut. So further collaboration and strategic scoping are necessary if this project is brought forward. So that brings us to the non-highway and off-road vehicle account, which provides grants to develop and manage recreation opportunities for users of backcountry trails and non-highway roads. So 
So the big question is, what is a non-highway road? It's a road that is owned or managed by public agency or private roads with an easement for public use or for which money from the motor vehicle fund was not used to build or rebuild it in the past 25 years or maintain it in the past four years. That is complicating, complicated to say the least to begin to understand. We do uh, say parks does have non-highway roads to access our parks. However, the advisory committee that evaluates these projects will oftentimes look at our our project and say that does that road is not long enough to constitute a non-highway road. So there has been we have had some challenges when we apply in this program, and we have seen varying success. Uh, typical projects va uh, vary from maintenance of intensive use areas such as off-road vehicle sports parks to development of trails, trailheads, restrooms, and picnic areas. Funding is is awarded biannual biannually and comes from a portion of the state gasoline tax and off-road vehicle use permits. Is that you really? <laughs> <laughs> right before you crash. <laughs> <laughs> Looking good. So uh, funding is divided between recreation facilities and education and enforcement. 70% of the funding does go to recreation facilities and 30% goes to education and enforcement. And the program sees about seven and a half million every two years. And there's no match required. So that's a really nice, uh, nice feature. So we have uh, three proposed NOVA grants. Uh, all three NOVA projects are located at Riverside State Park in Spokane County. The NOVA grants have really helped to support our ORV park in terms of maintenance funding and enforcement over the last several biennia. The OR ORV park is the only off-road vehicle park in the Washington State Park system and attracts 90,000 visitors per year. In fact, there are only three ORV parks in the state that actually I'm aware of. We have, there's one in Grace Harbor County, there's one I think in Tri-Cities, and then there's ours. The first proposed NOVA grant is for maintenance and it funds staffing at the ORV park to maintain facilities, protect the natural resources. It, uh, they also complete special maintenance projects and provide customer service over the two year period. It does fund one year round park aid and one part time park aid. A ranger supervision and contracted labor to con control noxious weeds over that two year time frame. Uh, the education enforcement is similar in that it has funded a full time E and E ranger for the last several biennia to patrol areas that are open year round and collectively support more than 4 million visits from both motorized and non motorized Nova users on an annual basis. And then the last uh, project is an ORV planning grant that would be used to complete much needed planning at the ORV park um, in terms of. I think my my sheets got mixed up here. Um, in terms of parking and fencing and safety enhancements for the park, that's oh, right here. So the total requests for the fall grant round are shown on the screen with um with the adjustment though it's slightly modified. Uh, the RTP projects will go to the proposed projects go down to 450,000, dropping the total requ request from 7.05 million to 6.9 million. And with the alternates, it would drop it to 7.52 million. So a slight modification. That concludes staff's presentation. I would like to open it up for questions or comments um, that, that you have on the proposed list of projects. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, any questions, comments? Looking to the left, looking to the right. I have a, I have a couple of questions. One on the Marine uh, Park Trail, 
is are those trails uh i mean is the is the funding request for improvements to the campsites as part of the trail as part of the well or improvements to trail within on the land where the sites are thank you that's a good question yeah. so last grant round we yeah. hear me last grant round the application i believe uh really address the day use areas and signage for the day use sites where uh, kayakers would come in on the Cascadia Marine Marine Trail. Okay, so they're they're, they're focused on that on the Marine Trail and making yes, sure that the, trail is. It's the Marine Trail. Okay. That's correct. And we did highlight three different parks. You can see Bayview, Larrabee, and Birch Bay State Park. Right, right, right. And the, the RV uh, request. I assume the reason you didn't just package it all in one, as it's, it's all Riverside, is you're not sure you'd get that much money or so with nova there are different so there's different pots of money so 70 uh -huh. percent of the funds go to recreation grants okay. and 30 percent go to education education yeah, and enforcement so okay. there's two different applications there as well as we're also limited by funding requests yeah so it's being strategic on what how we can leverage those funds so out of the recreation pot of money we've decided to put together a planning proposal for the park so we can be strategic on the on the what the layout of the park should look like with the visitation that we're seeing and that and and nova is one of the few along with boating facilities programs that allows for planning uh, so yeah. we would like to um, request some planning funds for that and then we submit our maintenance fund uh, maintenance application and our e and e and then back to the trail category, the so the region maintenance funds, 150,000. Do they use? Um, do they leverage that money with WTA grants or with Conservation Corps or other organizations that do trail improvements? Or is it, are these are our staff that would be doing this? What's the how do we approach that? So the the grant are you're talking about the Riverside ORV maintenance grant? No, I'm 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 sorry. I'm back to the to the trails. Oh, the the general trails. The general region. Trails. I'm sorry. The, okay. Yeah. Um, this one. No. Do we take our money and leverage it with other partners, or do we use it with our own forces sources? I guess. So, the Northwest region, the way they did this, I, we do we do work with partners, but WTA uses their own volunteer hours for their grants, and that's right. why they rank number one, right. two, three in RTP. Right. Like they have multiple grants that they submit, and they are top ranking. And they do some of their projects in our parks. Yeah, well, we also we've leveraged Conservation Corps, uh, and John Keats is the one that actually brought this one forward. But I understand we've leveraged Conservation Corps to do some work out on our trails, hmm. and um, and our own staff time right. has gone towards. Um, making the it's like what peter was saying but from our trails perspective when you go into a park and you start you the first so many first couple miles of a trail should be easily accessible brushed out cleared out and they're just they just aren't right now right and so the intent would be to prioritize what trails need the immediate attention under these grants and get that work done. And tomorrow's presentation, I actually pulled some pictures from this grant project that um, that has been occurring, I think as recent uh, as of April yeah. of crews out in the field. Uh, Commissioner Williams. Thanks, Commissioner Bounds. Um, kind of a follow on to that. So, um, cause I know with the beacon rock, uh, Hamilton mountain trail project that, you know, in my conversations with WTA, they're ready to help. Um, so I'm just wondering to, to what extent does having the commitment from those kinds of partners improve our ability to compete for these grants? 
That's a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I think with RTP, uh, the, our biggest challenge is that we're competing against large areas, right? Like we're bring, we're proposing to bring Beacon Rock into RTP and, and we're competing against WTA that provides statewide trail maintenance and, and hundreds of hours of match contribution. And so our uh, state parks applications don't typically stack up. And so even if WTA is supportive of, of, of that project, that it's not necessarily going to, from my perspective, increase our competitiveness. It may a little bit, but we do, um, we do reach out to get letters of support, but um, it's just the nature of how RTP um, has been evaluated and the nature of the projects that are brought in. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, well, why don't we take our break? Uh, we will take a 15 minute break and be back at uh, 2.40. and times, I guess, or number of times. Let's put it like that. And Becky Ellison, not Becky Daniels, Becky Ellison will uh, make a presentation. And Okay, and Holly's on board, right? Yes, we're good. Okay, great, thanks. Um, well, hopefully she'll be back in a minute. I know. So thanks for having me today. We're here, of course, to discuss our 2023 commission dates and locations. Did not work. Why is it not? Why am I not going forward and back? Won't go forward and back. There we go. We're stuck. So we're view. It is uh, the commission's goal to hold our commission meetings around the state. Uh, this is to better understand our local needs, ongoing emerging issues. We meet with stakeholders, enables outreach with our local officials and community leaders, and provides commission members to tour parks and other properties. We uh, typically meet six times a year, plus a planning meeting, and the tours are on Tuesdays and or a Friday of each week. Like today, it's a work session on Wednesday and our commission meeting on Thursday. In 2021 and 2022, we opted with a five time in person with a virtual work session and of course our planning meeting. For 2023, the executive committee and staff are proposing three different options for discussion and consideration. Option A is a four quarterly in person and all meetings would be hybrid. So a in person slash hybrid meeting in January, April, July and October with an in person planning meeting as well. These would be supplemented with four virtual meetings in between in March, May, August, November to ensure that we are meeting more frequently with this one. Option B is the option we're doing for the last two years uh, with the January a March virtual a May instead of April. This year we were in April and it wasn't spaced properly. So a May meeting, July, September, November, December. And then option C would be what we used to do about five years ago, which was six meetings. It's about seven weeks apart. January, March, May, July, September, November, December, and a planning meeting. Some locations we would like to meet in Olympia in January to also facilitate uh, outreach with local legislators. We try to go to Spokane every other year, so that would be in 2023. We have not been to Ocean Shores since 2011. And then possibly in Ellensburg, Cleelum, when I can't see what it says behind there and I don't remember. Let's see if it's on the other one. I can't read it. Good. Winthrop on there. Winthrop perhaps is on there. Yep. Ellensburg, Clay Elm, Stevenson. That's Thank good. you, Stevenson. There we go. Because we've been trying to meet there a couple of years in a row now. So here are the three options laid out next to each other. So you can see very easily 
that option A is we are meeting more. Option B is what we're doing now. Option C is one more meeting. My goal today is after discussion with each of you <laughs> that we come up with some kind of consensus on which option we want to go with. I will then go back to the drawing board and start contacting the locations to see where we can have the meetings because I need to make sure we have space, that we have a <clears throat> adequate internet, and that we can get government per diem. So I will go back to this one, and I'm going to ask at this time that the executive team discuss the three options that they all, so Commissioner Dannenberg was going to speak about option A, if she would do that now of why she thinks we should do A. Hey, sorry, well, let me sorry. ask you a question. Can I ask a question first about that? Can um, I assume that under any of these, we will have the capacity to have commissioners be either here or virtually yep. if for whatever reason they can attend them? Every meetings. single meeting will be a hybrid or hybrid. fully virtual. Okay, thank you. And just a clarification on the December planning meeting in all three options is that intended to be in person yes but if the commissioner options. can't make it i will i will virtual right they will i can make them virtual so, so then just to be clear so then option a would be five in-person meetings b would be six and c would be seven correct okay I usually don't thank count you the planning in it <laughs> oh so um i thought of option A um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I'll probably, I mean, I'll go ahead and just start with sort of the most selfish, um, which is, you know, I joined the commission um, right before the pandemic and having gone through the last, you know, and so we went to virtual and hybrid and we're sort of forced to figure it out. Um, and as we're coming out of the pandemic um, and seeing sort of two things happen, one is my work life is picking back up. Um, but also seeing um, that we were able to do virtual meetings successfully, that people were able to participate. Um, and, you know, it, it seemed like a, a workable solution um, for what I think is a, a huge issue, which is just an equity issue on the commission. Um, it is so difficult to participate and to be a member of this commission. This commission was created to supposedly, you know, reflect and be the voice of Washingtonians, but we're not. We are essentially, I mean, even with option A, we are the most privileged, most privileged. You have to be upper income. You have to have a ton of free time. Um, the only reason I can actually do this having a job is because not only am I you know, a sort of a, you know, a, you know, an information worker. I'm a person who, you know, who is, you know, a college educated information worker who doesn't actually have to be somewhere, but I happen to also be in a union so I can flex my time. The company, you know, I only have to work 40 hours a week or they pay me overtime, which gives them a lot of incentive to let me take a couple of days off. You know, there's a lot of special circumstances, but this would be impossible if I had any other sort of job and the job and the situation I have is very unusual for anybody in America. It's unusual for a privileged, you know, well off person that I am. And it's, you know, we tried very, very hard in recruitment. I have talked to so many people about, you know, being part of this commission, particularly people of color, you know, um, women who have children, you know, people and, and they think it's laughable. When I told them that I thought, you know, I'm proposing this quarterly in person meeting and there's probably going to be some pushback. My friends who again are all also pretty well off politically active, you know, people all said, oh, so they're not going to want to meet quarterly. They want to meet less often. Like they thought like the pushback was going to be that that's so many meetings. Um, but yeah, I mean, I looked at it and in person, it's something like 30 weekdays a year. <laughs> you know, once you include all the travel and in order to, and that's not something somebody working can do. And so I do think, you know, this is a compromise that still honestly still maintains somebody who's very privileged and can take a ton of time off work. Um, Cause doing, these are not two days, right? We're not here for two days. It's almost a whole week. Um, it's, you know, and, and it's, I think you can't, it's hard to fully be a participant if you didn't attend the day before and after plus the time to travel. Um, the virtual meetings also allow us to meet more frequently. We've had a lot, a lot of special meetings that we've had to pull together sort of last minute, and this would have something on our calendar um, that's more frequent. 
where if something you know doesn't have to have to happen in the next week, but you know we could actually put it on the agenda of the virtual meeting, um, and the virtual meeting can flex to what's necessary. So whereas once you know you already heard Becky talk about what she has to do for our in-person meetings, once we do that you know, they got to fill the time like, you know, like we're, we're meeting and staff is going to come up with stuff, whether something's happening or not. Um, and so I think this virtual meeting allows us to have, meet more frequently, but also to if it's, there's only four hours of material, we only meet for four hours. Like we don't have to stretch it out for two full days of meetings if there's not really two full days of stuff. So I think it reduces staff effort as well. Um, and so I just, again, this was sort of a, a way that I still think it's a lot of meetings. I mean, I just, I can't even just tell you the, the five in-person meetings is still a lot. It turns out to being something like 14 days. So it's the same number of days, but it's, um, again, it's at a more frequent cadence, also allowing, you know, people to participate virtually. Um, and I do think that the virtual hybrid is it's the way of the future. I mean, that's just how we're going. I, I kind of noted yesterday that we have not, to this moment, had a single in-person meeting with the full commission. But something has happened at every meeting that somebody's not been able to attend. And so I think just people's lives, um, it accommodates people's lives better. I just, everything about it, you know, so. <laughs> Thank you. We're on to uh, Vice Chair Brown Bounds is going to speak about option B. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, I actually agree a lot with uh, what Commissioner Dannenberg said, and I uh, and I thought a lot about this, and I, I especially agree I, in in many respects that it, any one of these three options, uh, none of them, I guess, is the way to say this, is going to deal with the equity issue uh, at all. I mean, because it's just it's tough. The commission does require. I think a lot of time, a lot of commitment, and it's virtually impossible. I agree uh, with her for a, a full-time uh, employee with kids, especially um, taking being able to take the time out to do this job is is uh, virtually impossible. So I think, to me, I think any one of these is still going to be a barrier. We're not going to achieve those objectives. I think, kind of as an aside, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to to do much, much better in engaging affinity groups and engaging uh, citizens in specific issues that affect their lives. And as we're in the process of making decisions uh, that we know is gonna affect their ability to access and use our parks. And we need to do a much better job of figuring that out. And I think having the affinity groups that we had with, under contract and the uh, paying people to participate and all those good, innovations that uh, I think Commissioner Dannenberg helped us achieve more of this year is a good thing to do and will solve a lot of those issues about getting people engaged in a decision making process. That said, uh, like I said, I think any of these options are fine. I do believe that having um, uh, more as much time together as a commission and commission and staff in person uh, makes for a better commission and a better commission and staff functioning. Um, and so that's really my only argument is one more, one more week of meetings in person. Uh, and, and I think Commissioner Danberg's absolutely right. I don't think we were missing uh, any, we're, probably having the same amount, if not more time under option A, where we're actually in a meeting together uh, because we're doing those the virtual meetings uh, every other month. Uh, but I think getting together as a commission and as a commission with staff uh, is important. And um, so that's my only, I think it's worked well this, this year and we will be able to have uh, hybrid meetings, and if that's the way it works for future commissioners that they can't make the meetings, then we can make all that work as well, so. Yeah. Um, first of all, just wanna make sure that I am clear. The way that I, the numbers I come up with under option A, we would, assuming that the in-person meetings involved of uh, both Tuesday and Friday, just with that assumption, applying that across the board. 
So there'd be 18 days in person and four virtual. So that's 22 days that we'd be together. Is that correct? So we have four times four is 16 plus the four is 20 plus the two day planning meeting. So 22 days that we're together. Uh, option B is identical to that, 22 in person, uh, and obviously no virtual. And then option C is 26 in person. So the range is from 22 to 26. So, I mean, that's just, that's my math. So here's a couple thoughts that I wanna share. Um, and we've actually had a really robust conversation about this. I think it was a couple years ago as we were trying to figure out, should we go from six, should we go to five? Should we focus more on virtual than in person? Uh, but I think it's important for us to see each other often enough and to meet often enough uh, to provide a continuity uh, of our discussions on uh, and to spend a, a sufficient amount of time together discussing a budget and policy personnel, those things that we're responsible for. It's just a reminder that we're not advisory. We're not an advisory board or commission. I mean, we literally have things that only the commission can do. Um, and I, I've mentioned this before, but I do think it's important to spend time in person together. Commissioner Bounds mentioned that. Um, you know, it's to our advantage, I think, to be together in terms of team building. A couple of you may remember that when we had the most recent discussion about this again a couple of years ago, I'd actually done some research and brought to the meeting a copy of an academic study that was done on governance boards and the dynamic of in-person versus virtual frequency. And there's just no question that that being together, seeing each other, that human dynamic uh, in-person dynamic is really important in terms of team building uh, for a governing board like ours. Um, I also want to say that, and I think you all know something I feel very strongly about, but being in the field, meeting with field staff, touring parks, being briefed on projects and initiatives in our parks, like we had the opportunity to do yesterday, to me, meeting with our partners, meeting with concessionaires, uh, meeting with community leaders, elected officials. To me, this is actually one of the most important parts of our job. And, um, you know, being out there in parks is essential and a big part of our job. And I was struck in thinking about this the last couple of days. You know, we had this legislation to move this agency under a larger umbrella organization and to make this board advisory. And I had worked with Owen on preparing some remarks in the event that we made a decision that we would testify. Uh, actually, at that moment in time, it wasn't going to be pro or uh, pro or con. It was going to be just providing some information to the legislative committees. But in that process, like a many of you, because I've talked to some of you about this, I heard from a whole bunch of our stakeholders who are very concerned about that legislation. And at least by the dozens, and actually it was several hundred, signed up to oppose that legislation. And it was really interesting about the comments that I received, and, and I even wrote some of them down, but these people were saying that we know you, we see you, you're in our park, you're in our communities. Um, so that outreach on our part, those meetings, those stakeholder meetings that we do, uh, all of that seems to be kind of part of our history and our culture and our DNA, and I think it's served us well over the years. So I also want to just say I'm sorry for going on, but this is the first state board or commission I've ever served on that didn't meet monthly. Uh, and I can't remember not being on a state board or commission my whole life or adult life. So this is, you know, came into this organization and it was it was kind of a struggle for me, frankly, to keep up, to keep current, to be informed, uh, to feel like I could make a contribution. So having said all of that, um, I want to say that option B, I couldn't personally support and would not want this agency to continue because it's just not the kind of frequency that we need. And I don't think I say need to say much more about the fact that this April to July gap, for example, 
that came with that model, uh, I think it posed some uh, some problems for us in terms of continuity, and we've seen some of that evident in some of the concerns that we're going to hear, I think, in part tomorrow as well. But it's just it's just not frequently enough, and we end up with too big of gaps. Uh, we end up with trying to compress too much into our workshops and into our meetings. Uh, we end up with very little time for uh, much more than staff presentation, and that's not good. So regular meetings, in person, virtual. I say when I look at these options, um, I actually like option A because I think it's the best of both worlds. It's a frequency that I like. It's enough in person for us to do the traveling, the stake, I don't mean traveling, the stakeholdering, the outreach work. Uh, take advantage of modern technology. It won't compromise public participation, and it will lessen the load from 18 in-person meetings to if you went with option C, you're up to 26. And if those eight days make a difference between whether somebody can participate and be on this commission, then I'd argue in favor of going in that direction to accommodate them and that interest. So uh, I do have two other things, and I could absolutely live with option C as well, uh, but I'm inclined to support option A. I think it's creative, and I appreciate your taking the time to uh, uh, to construct that model for our consideration. And then finally, I, I, I would say two other things on locations. I don't think we need to meet in Olympia personally. Because if Owen needs us there for lobbying to go up on the hill, those things can be arranged on an ad hoc basis. So that's just that's just an opinion. Spokane, we have to get to Spokane on a regular basis. We've just got too much going on there. And I do think it's time for us to get back up into the northeast corner of the state. And I think you're proposing that with Winthrop, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And then finally, I'd just say, and I think I mentioned this to Commissioner Connolly. Sorry for going on so long. I think it's my third finally. Um, on the operational side, if we were to go to option A, I think it would free up enough staff capacity because we wouldn't be doing the, the two-day, two-day, the side trips and associated with it to, uh, to strengthen our, our committee system somehow in a positive way. Because frankly, our committees are largely, and this isn't bad, but I think you they're largely used by staff to stage a discussion that's coming to the commission, uh, sort of a trial run on action item B that's coming up in two months or three months. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's not a lot of original thought by commissioners, ideas, concerns we have. You know, Commissioner Milner mentioned to me that he's had a number of concerns over the years about public outreach as part of our budget process. Well, we haven't brought that into a committee to really flush that out and talk about that. And so I'd like to hope that this commission in the years ahead, uh, actually in the short term rather, could figure out how to strengthen our committee structure so that there's more original work done by commissioners and it's not all, and this isn't a criticism at all, but you know, kind of spoon fed by staff. I mean, they're doing their job. That's that's your job and we're giving you that opportunity. But I'd like to see some things that are a little bit more commission in their origin. Sorry for being so long, but there you go. No worries. We've got plenty of time. So let's uh, let's just move down the let's move down the aisle here. So Commissioner Milner. I've heard this debate six times. Well, you have an opinion. I I, I don't really have standing, but I <laughs> yeah, you're but my the position I have always taken is to make this accessible, we need to do it at night. To make this accessible, we really should be looking at doing it at night was my position I've always taken. People are working during the day. Average person, average family is tied up with school, with their jobs. There's people that work night shift, people that work graveyard shift. There's all kinds of folks, but um, you're going to reach out to the most number of, of our users, if or our, our public, if you do it at night. Now, the objection that I have heard six times, and it's it's something that seriously has to be considered, is what that entails on staff's time, 
and and how many times you have to go pack up the whole show and and move it somewhere and and do this at night in addition to you know the day it's it's more work it's off hours work for most of the people here not that they don't already put in hours during the during the evening but and i don't want to argue your perspective too hard but that's been the trade-off and um so we are where we are mr. i agree Conlon. with commissioner danberg's comments i agree with yours mr conlon i definitely i mean i, I it is a trade-off between um the in-person and the virtual and i i'm kind of intrigued i think option a when i went back and looked at it the thing i like about it is it has like it has frequent enough meetings that if we have an issue that is we need to deal with we'll have time to do that we can you know slot it in or if one of those virtual ones doesn't need to be a full-blown meeting we can have a half a day um i but i can also live with b and c fine too i mean i i do I, I didn't this year. I thought we had that that gap was too big between the right. two meetings, but you know, um, <clears throat> the virtual meetings I think have been very valuable. And there's a lot of things we could do with virtual meetings too that we haven't done before. Like we did the meeting on Palouse Falls, and we had you know tried to they use some movies and stuff to give people an overview of it. I mean, we went beyond just a regular PowerPoint. And I mean, I think it was very valuable. You got the feeling for what it you know what it looked like. So I think we could. Right on that. Commissioner Latimer. So I guess uh, one question and a comment um, on the virtual meetings. Is that designed to be a work session or is that a one day work session and a one day commission meeting? So the option A would be a one day. We would post it as a commission meeting, but that doesn't mean we couldn't do a work session in the morning. If we say it's going to be a commission meeting, it does enable us to take action. Okay. If we advertise it that it's a virtual work session, we would have to call a special meeting to take any action. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So it would be a it would be a commission meeting. Okay. So I guess um, uh, my personal preference would be option A. Um, I have a pretty flexible work schedule because uh, I'm the manager of the office, so I can kind of you know sort of you take off whenever you. I want to. But <laughs> at the same time, you know when you sort of look at the number of days I'm out. I mean, it's it's a lot. I mean, it's uh, right. I mean, it's six, six, seven weeks almost out of the year. And I kind of think about, I mean, I I really get behind at work at times. And there have been times that I've thought, gee, can I can I really uh, sort of not financially, but can I afford to stay on the commission from a time perspective just because I have so much going on at work and I feel sort of guilty that, you know, I'm I'm having to make up the time either working at night or on the weekends or coming, you know, coming back and working twice as long just to get sort of caught up. So I like option A because I think it gives a little bit more flexibility and, and there's a little bit less of that stress that <laughs> is developed by being out so long. Commissioner Williams. For many of the reasons stated, I prefer option A as well. Um, I think I agree. I hear what you're saying, Commissioner Bounds, that it may, it will still probably be difficult to um, attract people to uh, participate in this commission, um, th those with who have day jobs, because it's still a pretty big time commitment. But I am feeling um, a need to at least make a move in that direction. Um, I, I do hope we would consider maybe doing the business part of the virtual meetings, maybe starting them, you know, at four or five, uh, or, you know, something um, to, to address what Commissioner Milner was talking about, um, because I think that's a really valid point. Um, I think, you know, we, as we are asked um, always by the legislature to be efficient in our work, and I value the relationship building as well. I'm very sad not to be there right now. My body's not cooperating and it's it's enormously frustrating, but um, I am I am getting value out of uh, hearing you all and being here in this way. Um, and, and I will say, um, you know, I found in this last three months, you know, I've actually, you, you know, we still, even if we're not meeting as a group, we, we, you know, there's still trips to Olympia 
and I've had many, many, many park visits and great conversations with park staff and great conversations with partners. So um, obviously, if we uh, go to option A, which I hope we will, you know, it will be incumbent on us to um, do a little homework, uh, a little more homework on our own. That's all I have. Great. Well, I. I think we've come to agreement. Um, I wanted to ask staff a question if I could. Sure. Yeah. So Commissioner Milner mentioned the work involved Microphone. in putting these. Commissioner Milner mentioned the work involved in putting these meetings together. Um, you know, under option A, there's nine meetings to organize. But on the other hand, you don't have four times two. You don't have eight days of sidebar meetings to organize. So on 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 option C, there's seven meetings to organize, some of which in, would involve four days. So I'm just wondering, I think uh, we would benefit from hearing from staff in terms of any yeah. thoughts you have. Uh, uh, I, I well, I'll stop. I'm actually, uh, since this is my second commission meeting in this role, I'm going to defer to some of the staff that have been involved in this for quite some time. So, uh, uh, Assistant Director or Director Herzog, if you'd like to uh, say anything about I'm this, and Mike to start with. <laughs> <laughs> if we we have a football. We can <laughs> just kind of throw out. There. I think Becky's the person. I did this on purpose. I'm just telling I know. you. I'm, I'm going to hear about it from somebody. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, who who's going to go? Peter, I, I guess I'll start. I I think a lot of it closer to the mic, please. A lot of it depends on. Um, a lot of it depends on what the expectation is for some of these virtual meetings. If these are uh, more casual uh, kinds of meetings, um, that that are that you're not expecting three or four requested actions and formal written reports that's sort of the same way that we would have for for the a normal commission meeting i think that would help a lot i i wonder at that kind of a frequency uh if we it's always been one of my nightmares that we run out of agenda items um uh and and so uh and i say that in the nicest possible way but the I, I think that I, my concern is that if if um, if we if we start getting so directed on providing and creating content for a commission meeting that how much that um, eats into the other work that we're doing because we we kind of have this dual responsibility to the to the commission and then to the work that we have to produce. Um, I'm particularly concerned about this next year coming up about the sort of staffing situation that we have and the and the kind of uh, work that we have to onboard new staff and and keep things moving um, effectively. So um, I guess I'm, I'm being honest in the sense that I, if this represents a lot of extra uh, additional work, not extra work, but additional work, then I'd have concerns about it. I think we can probably make some adjustments to make it not be um, uh, like full blown commission agenda items and more discussion kinds of things, which I'm hearing from Commissioner Brown or is sort of a more original thoughts and things like that and 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 uh, and commission interaction um i'm i would be concerned just a, just about the volume of work that's right. that would be uh in option a yeah and I, i'd just i'd have a uh, just a quick response to that i think the the under my understanding is that i think those uh virtual meetings uh well actually as we all know all of our meetings are pretty much staff driven in terms of what's on the agenda, uh, when the actions are, and that sort of thing. And so I think the virtual meetings are, are going to be largely up to uh, Diana's ability to sort of manage where that information comes from within the organization in a way in which it doesn't burden you. Uh, but if you need a decision for an acquisition or you need a decision for something else, we'd have that option. Then you've got that option, yeah. and we're there. There's something every month where we're available to make to, to help move something along. So I think it's largely up to you, uh, but. You have to talk to Commissioner Miller. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, and then and I, I think what basically he's uh, I won't read what he said, but 
there will be times when we may have another St. Edward meeting, we may have another Mount Spokane meeting, we may have uh, a meeting where, a PDA meeting where we've got 100 people needing wanting to speak and we're gonna have to have a public session. This, I, you know, I think an advantage that was not mentioned on, on option A, which I saw an advantage when I saw uh, uh, Sophia presenting that was, is that it gives us that flexibility in a timely way if we have a something like that that demands a public meeting that we can we're all going to have some availability each month on a regular basis to be able to accommodate that action so i don't know if that's what you intended but i think that's that's at least uh, my response to that and comment. avoid special meetings because we've right. got one coming up soon enough right right just to respond, I think that I mean, I had asked you before that, you know, what I'd said is if we meet in person less frequently, I think it will be a little bit on you because a lot of the capital projects people like to see, they, they want to see something. So it's sort of a little bit of advanced planning on your part to say, OK, when we're doing the tours, et cetera, you know, can we make sure before a big decision comes up that, you know, that commissioners have had an opportunity to see it? And you had said that, yeah, you think these tend to be long lead time enough that you could manage that. Um, I think Commissioner Milner brought up a good point about the time, um, but I think I, you know, I've always been envisioning these virtual meetings as um, flexible, because um, what I've said is, you know, if we are meeting in person, you know, there's just, I, I don't, I, it's funny because I'm like, you know, if there's nothing, we'll just cancel it, and I just realistically know that'll never happen. Um, but you know, we could cancel it, or we could say it's only going to be four hours from, you know, four to eight. That's nah, not a great time. Three to seven. <laughs> I don't know, two to six, two to six sounds reasonable. <laughs> um, you know, that we could sort of adjust the time as needed. Um, and so versus, versus an in-person meeting is just very difficult to adjust. Um, and it gives us, or we've got the whole day marked on our calendar. We know we're available. And then if we don't need it, we just, you know, bring it down as needed. I think that's kind of what I thought, um, and, you know, and we could cancel it completely. I think it's, as I said, it's just easier to do than, again, the, the logistics involved with an in-person meeting. Just it doesn't. It's not reasonable really to do that. Not that we didn't do that, but it was quite costly. Stevenson, twice. <laughs> yep. So. So, Mike, are you uh, prepared to talk now? Gotcha. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea of the flexibility. If that's really where folks are at, and that we assess what really is the need for this next virtual meeting coming up. Um, I also am thinking, Commissioner Brown, about some comments you made some time ago about having an opportunity to be able to have dialogue with one another that you felt like you don't necessarily have in this meeting format, uh, discussing just discussing issues. At least I, I feel like I recall you um, talking about that and maybe liking that about the planning session. So I don't know if you'd have a thought as well about potentially using some of that virtual meeting time to be able to have some of that engagement that I think you expressed was missing. I just say, I think, uh what's already been said uh, what we're doing is we're saying this is the amount of time we're going to allocate and the number of meetings and the nature of those meetings as far as how they're all constructed i think that would be premature for any of us to I guess or assume it's a new approach and whether a vir one virtual meeting is in essence a special meeting with limited topics or it's a workshop i think that's all uh, something that lies ahead based on the ebb and flow of work and circumstances. But, you know, we have, as I think Commissioner Dannenberg said, we have the flexibility to do all of that. I was mumbling here too, by the way, for those of us at this table and Holly, not quite so much, but think about the number of special meetings we've had in the last two years. I mean, it's a dozen. I mean, it's, it's, but Becky is the hopefully not as many is going hopefully up. not as many and so with this future. kind of a frequency of meetings I think we avoid that potential but we potentially limit the number of special meetings so yeah as much as I know Commissioner Latimer loved all those special meetings <laughs> last year right, right. <laughs> just really wanted to have them in person Mark <laughs> <laughs> So Becky, so this is this would be only four you have to. Oh, well, I, I do want to forgive me, but I, I do want to um, be certain, Becky, I know that there's also technological things that need to occur for virtual meetings and the workload 
may be different, that doesn't mean that it's less than for for Correct. the logistics uh, side of this. Virtual just means that Mahar is not on the road for the whole week, which I'm sure his supervisor and he appreciates because he has a workload outside of this. This was not his original job duties. I think we just here. Um, so he still has to run the meetings uh, virtually, but he can do that from his desk and he can be multitasking and doing his other job. So for Mahar in that regard, I think it'll lighten up for him. So consider, yep, you're getting the thumbs up from Mahar because there is a lot. This is, he yeah. leaves early Tuesday morning, him and Tina, and they don't get home till late Friday. It's they're here running everything. So I appreciate that we're sound like option A. Yeah. Well, could I ask Mr. Chair? Yeah. Uh, would you entertain a, a, a quick round table if we're moving past the schedule? Uh, what do people think in terms of locations? Where do people want to meet next year for the four in person meetings? I've already mentioned a couple of my preferences. Yes, I think uh, what Spokane others. and Winthrop, and uh, it will be the same requested action I did last year. When we do propose the locations, I'll have the second part will be, but I can change the locations in consultation with the exec committee so that we don't have to call a special meeting. What if there's a big fire in Winthrop and we were supposed to go there? Right. So it will be the, we'll pick locations, but we will have flexibility. You were, you were thinking two east, two west. Yep. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. So, Commissioner Williams, you have a question. Oh, um, so, but it, it's my understanding there are actually five in person meetings, even with option A. Well, four in the planning meeting. So, the, right. so right. four that's commission five, meetings so and a planning. Person, yes, right. that's five in person meetings. So, we need five locations, just to be clear. Planning meeting, I usually either do at CAMA or somewhere like a. So I, I need to come back to you guys with the option for that or Seattle because uh, it's in December and I can fly you in. So I try to look at either Seattle or Cama Beach is the consistent of where we do that. Yeah. OK, and any other comments about. Location or. Well, I think we have a consensus. I think the option A will work just great and uh, we'll give it a shot. Uh, next year and. I'll be back in September. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, great. Thanks. OK, uh, we're moving now to our executive leadership team updates. Director. Thank you very much. I would like to call on our deputy director, Mike Sternback, for his update, please. Thank you. Uh, just a couple things. I've been in this position now for three months. Uh, most of that has been uh, working on the operating budget, but I have had an opportunity to spend time with the senior managers in uh, administrative services and in parks development, which has been great. I've definitely gained a better understanding of their programs, uh, what they do. Uh, not a surprise that we have really quality, dedicated uh, um, folks, but getting to know people a little bit better has been uh, a, a great part of the last few months. One other update on uh, voting program, which at the moment is still with me as well. Actually, it's on Winter Rec. Um, Rob Sendek with voting has stepped up to uh, also supervise the winter rec manager now so that they're combined sort of. Uh, we uh, it's been an, uh, a quite a ride on the winter rec uh, manager. Um, you know, we talked Pam McConkey into sticking around through this winter. Uh, she she hung in there for a while. We uh, we ended up hiring uh, Laura Grickar from I ever say her last name right? Greek car. Yeah, that too. Greek car. Um, uh, uh, out of Spokane, uh, who was working for uh, Diana. And then when Diana promoted into the director job, there was an opportunity for the region manager there. Um, while Laura was a fantastic fit for the winter recreation program, she also uh, is a great fit for the region manager job in Spokane. And so she's been uh, appointed in that. I don't know if I stole thunder or not. You'll get the name right. Um, uh, but we do have the person we have in there right now, and I don't think you've met this person, uh, but Corey Toller uh, is the fiscal analyst for both voting and for winter rec. And he has stepped in to be the acting winter rec manager, um, which uh, uh, staff are very happy about uh, there and also our advisory groups uh, because he's uh, been handling the money. He's kind of central to most of this anyway, uh, and, and their budget work that's going to come up in the next couple of months. So Mike, uh, so what, we do Rob, have a recruitment out now. I'm sorry. What's, what's Rob's position, new position? Sendak? Sendak. Yeah. What's his new position, new title? He, he's 
we'd have to make one up, I think, right now. Okay. Cross-state programs. Um, okay. He, uh, it, it, we didn't create an additional position. We're just carving out part of his time as the um, voting program manager to supervise the winter rec manager. Okay. So that we don't have two, two different programs reporting up into the rest of operations eventually. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, we haven't. I don't think we've made sort it official. Sort of taking part of Pam's job. Um, not really, because the, the, the job that Pam had would still remain. I think it's taking part of uh, either the operations person, so okay. it could be the yeah. director of operations, or if this reports to me, it would be taking some of that load uh, off. I think getting the winter rec program a lot more attention, which is good. So we do have a permanent recruitment out um, now. We're hoping to bring somebody on um, by September, and happy to have Corey on with us for the summer. That's what I have. Anything else? Thank you. Director Herzog. So I have a, a shorter version and a longer version. <laughs> uh, I think um, uh, one one thing that we've been doing a lot of is hiring. Um, and so I, I thought I'd give at least some stats. I'm not going to go through the individual positions, but uh, um, we in the recent hires category that that includes like yesterday stretching back maybe a, a month at the most we've ha hired 10 new positions uh, and we have 13 recruitments out so that's 23 positions that are either brand spanking new or uh, in the recruitment process for a total program of 70 people so this is a for us right now this is about as topsy-turvy and from a staffing standpoint as as i can ever remember it's been so um, one of the things that I, uh, I'm reminded is that bringing on new staff does not immediately help. Uh, in fact, it makes things worse because uh, from a workload for stand standpoint, because um, folks coming through the door that need to be onboarded um, and trained up, um, put a, a pretty significant load on our existing staff, uh, the colleagues that they have in their various programs uh, to get them up to speed. And then after a certain amount of time, then you start achieving some of the benefits of, of uh, additional capacity. But, the, but that's, a, that's a relatively slow process, and particularly in our agency where, where we're kind of process light uh, and don't have a lot of um, entrenched process in place where we could just plug people in and, and they can start operating quickly. Um, this is a we, we operate quite a bit on personality and uh, institutional knowledge. And so this is a particularly challenging thing for us to, to bring on this many staff and have this much uh, uh, turnover. The other thing is that um, we have a lot of really good people. And so um, when uh, when we hire a position now, a lot of the like the management positions that we're filling, we're filling internally, which creates a cascading effect. Um, when it, where now an internal hire now creates a vacancy behind them, and then that just sort of extends the clock, so that so that we're really not making that much progress um, on overall numbers and getting back up to speed um, uh, until we get all the way through all the internal internal hiring that needs to happen, uh, uh, all for the best of reasons. So it, uh, I'm just seeing that it's taking a lot of time to to uh, to get up to speed now, and i'd say probably half of the positions that i'm talking about are um, existing vacancies sort of current level vacancies and then about half of those are new staff positions that we've put in place um, to meet some of the expanded uh, demand that we're seeing for our, our programs uh, and that spans stewardship capital uh, trails uh, the, the entire gamut of uh, of uh, positions that we have in parks development so uh, it's it's great to have new staff positions and and to be uh, doing all this recruitment but boy it's a lot of effort for the particularly for the managers uh, and all of the the people that have been volunteering on uh, interview boards uh, interview panels I mean um, uh, and getting the getting making sure that we're making really good choices I'm very pleased with the choices that we are making we're getting some real quality people. Um, one of them I'll, I'll announce sort of now, not by name, but we just hired a replacement for Ryan Carlson's position in the interpretive program. So we're really pleased to have a, a really excellent new uh, uh, staff member joining us here, just agreed today uh, to, uh, to our terms. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is also kind of challenging in these days too, because it starts with want to telecommute full time from some distant state uh, and then Kind of having that conversation and, and working into something that works for everybody uh, is a bit of a challenge and we don't have a, a solid um, telework uh, uh, policy in place just yet. And so it, uh, uh, we're appreciating the staff that are joining us with some ambiguity in the in the in that kind of a structure. 
The other thing I'll mention too, um, just on July 6th, uh, we had a, a Parks Development All Staff meeting that Director Dupuy and Deputy Director Sternbach joined us in uh, on Peru. Um, and uh, um, I was really, uh, it was a really great uh, time to, to get together with folks. It was a virtual meeting, but but we had 60 people of our 70 in attendance, so very well attended. Uh, our main topic has been uh, for the previous version of this that we had back in March has been employee burnout. Uh, and there's nu numerous sort of categories of what causes uh, burnout. Um, uh, but the principal, one of the principal ones is workload. And so this this past meeting, we delved into workload issues and uh, and we were able to um, use our breakout rooms uh, in teams to actually have some two way dialogue with staff about um, the challenges they're facing in terms of workload and and uh, um, and some suggestions that they had in, in what we ought to do about that. It's been just really a, a nice opportunity now, I think, to to sort of own it uh, as a management team in parks development too. So the you know we've been trying to do with more with less for a long time, um, and and through the pandemic and all the other things externalities, it's it's taken its toll on our staff clearly, and they let us know. <laughs> so. Uh, um, which is good and bad. One of the things that that I'll just leave you with was one of the uh, sentiments that I appreciated the most is that is how much staff appreciated that we were taking this seriously and actually uh, delving in and having the conversation with them to and being serious about uh, about workload issues and and how we move forward and how to manage burnout uh, in a way that's that's positive. So feeling really positive about it. The proof is going to be in the pudding. I think everyone sort of said, yep, thanks for noticing. We're with you. We appreciate it. But now what you do with this information and how we respond now uh, over the next weeks and months is going to be really important. So um, I'm committed to my staff. Uh, management staff is committed to really doing a, uh, a super effort of trying to learn about burnout uh, and understand the, the dynamics there uh, and really understand uh, uh, stepping up about workload and, and work planning and so forth and, and uh, getting that that house in, in order because uh, we want the staff that we're recruiting now to stay for a while. So so that's my report. I think I'll end there. Thank you, Director Herzog. Uh, next, I'd like to call on our interim uh, operations director, John Cribbins. Um, well, as Peter said, he's doing hiring. We're also doing hiring um, on the ops side. Um, we had the challenge of filling four vacant Region manager positions, no thanks to Diana and I. Uh, um, and so um, I just want to give you an update on that. We have we have hired four, four folks, um, really great uh, candidates. We went through a, a pretty intense interview, um, three interviews, you know, for, for some of the external candidates, which um, I think really resulted in, in getting some really quality people. Um, for the Eastern North position, which was Ryan Layton's um, old position, um, we hired Josh Bell, who is an internal candidate. Um, Josh is a, uh, started as a, a park aide in 2004 um, and then later became a uh, senior park aide in 2008 and permanent as a ranger from there on out. Um, outside of parks, um, Josh has served 17 years as an officer in the U.S. Army and 14 years as a member of the Washington Army National Guard. So Josh brings a, a whole lot of leadership um, to that area and we're excited to have him. Um, in Eastern Spokane, which is a, it always, the name changes a little bit, but we'll <laughs> call it Eastern Spokane today. Emphasis um, on the Spokane for Commissioner yeah, Miller. It's for your old area. Um, Laura, well, you all know, you know, who was hired because Mike stepped on my, my <laughs> report, but that's, that's okay. Um, so Laura Grikar, right? Grikar, did I say it right? Laura, Laura. Grikar. There we go. <laughs> Diana will always say it for us. Um, so, so Lara's just fantastic, and I, I mean, we are very, very fortunate to have Lara there. Um, she's uh, she has some history of uh, managing stakeholder stakeholder relationships and community outreach on the Alaska Way Viaduct product project in Seattle. Um, she also has served for the last many years um, at uh, the Northwest or the Inland Northwest area along with Diana, uh, just doing much of the same thing with community outreach, stakeholder relationships and grant development. Um, and currently, just like predecessor, is filling two roles, um, both the, the area manager role and the region manager role while we recruit for another area manager uh, for that 
uh, that area. Um, in the northwest south, um, the Sean Tobin's old area, um, we hired Stephanie Simic. Um, Stephanie comes from um, a long, she has a long history of natural resource work. Um, she's from uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Most recently, she's um, been the head of the carnivore section. And previously, she had the best job title I've ever heard, which was um, the wildlife conflict section uh, uh, manager, which I think will, you know, it's great for area managers, which you can handle wildlife conflicts. So I think she can handle area managers. Um, and then my old area, uh, Northwest North, uh, we hired Sierra Strickland, who is also from uh, Fish and Wildlife. Sierra served as a statewide lands access program manager for six years and as a statewide ADA road access entry program manager more recently for the last two. Um, we're excited for all four of them to get going. Um, we, our internal candidates have started and our two external candidates will be starting next week. Um, moving on, I wanna talk about 4th of July weekend. Uh, believe it or not, um, people like to camp in Washington <laughs> more more every year. In 2021, um, our statistics say that 86% of our campsites were filled uh, by visitors. Um, in 2022, 93% um, of our campsites were filled with visitors. So that was a major impact to our parks, our park staff. Jason Armstrong's here, so I'll say thank you to Jason Armstrong <laughs> <laughs> for the hard work and dedication. Um, out there in the field. That equates to 15,395 campsites, if you're keeping the score at home. Um, there were uh, 18 campgrounds where all of the utility sites were filled for the weekend, four campgrounds that every single site was filled for the weekend, and the rest, like I said, were in the 90%. So it was it's a pretty intense weekend. Out on the beach, the ocean beaches with our fireworks, um, it was a quieter year than usual. Uh, there's, there's been, uh, we had rangers from all over the state come over to assist with that. Um, there's continued concern from the local community about fireworks on the beach. Um, several ordinance banning fireworks will begin next year. And so it, it gives us a whole lot to think about, about, you know, how we will handle that, you know, moving forward. Um, and then I think I have a visual for this one. Is that right? Becky. Do I, have, do I have a visual for this one? Do I have a, a picture? <laughs> it's going to be cooler if it, you know. If <laughs> so all sorts of stuff happened on, on the 4th of July weekend. Um, one of the most um, impressive things, I guess, or, or just crazy things, is we had a flash flood at Conconelli State Park, and we have got some interesting pictures of that. Um, it, park staff acted quickly, a uh, pretty uh, scary thing, you know, to have a, mm. a campground fill with water just, just almost instantaneously. So the, the park staff worked um, diligently to get everyone evacuated from the, from the campground and to safety. Um, and the park then closed for um, quite some time just to get it cleaned up and get the mud out and the debris out. Um, but everyone got out safely. I'm not sure if it's wise to end with a flash flood on a report, but that's where I'm at. <laughs> uh, it kind of looks like a boat on the right there. It does, doesn't it? Are there other pictures, Mahar? But I like that. Can that go on the new batch, the flood? <laughs> It's interesting. I was standing there two days before this happened. I was up at Conconelli um, on Saturday of 4th of July weekend, and it was packed and wonderful. And the little town was packed. And to see these pictures after in 48 hours, it, it's just incredible to me. I don't know the details. Do you know the details, John? Oh yeah, yeah. There's some pretty amazing pictures of downtown. Well, they aimed it to this. I think they're still cleaning up. Yes. Yeah. Town. There were a, a house had collapsed that was being built. It was not quite finished yet, and um, we have a staff member that who lives up there whose shop was flooded. Uh, 
um, up a couple of feet and stuff. So it was a pretty significant event. Anything else? That, that's it. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call on our newly minted admin administrative services director, Laura Holmes. Thank you. Yes, I have been doing this for about a week now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. how do you like it so far? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Got a lot for you today. Um, no, I uh, have spent the last week uh, really reading a lot of materials. I have been with state parks for about 14 years, but I have a lot still to learn and especially moving into the administrative services division. So I begin um, getting integrated with that. I have met with the managers in administrative services as well. I've been a part of budget meetings and have met with OFM. So uh, we've got a few things um, working. Of course, we have the 2023-25 uh, budget coming up, uh, budget request, which has been a major part of uh, the work that I've been doing with our team. So uh, basically, I'm really I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to working with the administrative services team uh, with the commission and, of course, serving on the ELT. So um, that's about what I have for you today. <laughs> we'll see if you have pink set. Thank you. All right, I'd like to turn to our uh, human resources director, Becky Daniels, please. While waiting over there, going for snacks. <laughs> all right, I think um, I'd like to start out with some numbers because everybody's talking about all the hiring that's going on, which of course my team gets to, to focus on. I, I recall back at the planning meeting last December, and talking about what we'd be really spending our time on in, in 2022. I think I had like five different boxes that said hiring, 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 and that's it's definitely bearing out. Um, we in mid June had a, a union management communication committee meeting um, with the union, the first one we had for a while. And uh, Steve Ledua of my team put together some stats and these numbers are from that meeting. So this is from mid June. They, um, we've hired a bunch more people since then, as Peter just mentioned. Uh, 431 appointments made this year, this calendar year since January. That includes permanents and non-permanents. Um, 134 of those were permanent. Um, at that time, we um, it's, it's there's a ton of work <laughs> going on. At that time, there were 60 around 60 more um, park aides kind of in the wings uh, whose appointments hadn't begun yet. So really. Uh, at really, the effective number was over around 500 at that time. Um, park aides in general, that's one that you may have heard me and other people talking about our concerns about our ability to fill those seats, um, just given what's going on in the world and, you know, fast food restaurants um, bumping up lot, all kinds of employers bumping up their, their starting wages. And uh, so we've had huge effort around that this year. Uh, we're hearing mixed bags about how how it's going, some areas are just having a great year in terms of hiring others in some places that we've historically had difficulty, not as good. And so we're still working through some, uh, we'll, we'll, we can keep working on some strategies for those areas, including housing, non-permanent kind of housing for non-permanent employees. And that may be the only way we'll be able to address that long-term. Um, also, of course, we're continuing to monitor and evaluate uh, what we might be changing for next year. One of the strategies I'm really interested in seeing how it, how it played out for us is a real push around um, tapping into the retired folks, um, you know, market, because if we don't have housing, we really need to look for people in the community and, you know, retired, and so we pushed retired folks plus part-time employment. So not focusing on just filling positions full time, but let's just hire as many part time people as we need to get the work done. And anecdotally, I know we that's worked out in some places, but I don't have the numbers yet. But we'll be reporting those later. Um, ranger hiring. Um, I just want to you know most of you know I think there's a, been a historical kind of gap there. It's such a those are difficult jobs to to fill the full law enforcement positions to take a lot of time and energy and um, the standards are very, very high, of course. Um, in 2021, we actually hired 30, well, park ranger ones, which we've been hiring, creating more and more mm -hmm. of those positions because they definitely um, provide a uniform presence in places where we need it and they aren't fully law enforcement, but they do provide a lot of service to our, our agency. 2021, we hired 37 park ranger ones, which then that was all kinds, uh, permanent, uh, non-permanent and career seasonal positions. 
and 18 park ranger twos. Those are the hardest ones to fill. 16 of those 18 in 2021 were um, through a program that it's our in training program where we we hired them before they've gone through a law enforcement academy <clears throat> and we put them through the academy. We pay for that. And that has, I think, helping us have pretty significant impact on the diversity of our park rangers. You saw how those numbers have been getting slowly getting better because um, if we're hiring only people who have already been through a law enforcement academy, the likelihood that we're going to find more women and more people of color is probably it's quite a bit lower. So we're continuing. We're just really pushing hard on that whole approach. So 16 of 18 last year. This year to date, we've hired 30 park ranger ones and 15 park ranger twos. So 15 are ready this year in comparison to 18 last year. Um, and I believe, I don't have the number, but I think 13 of the 15 are folks that we're sending through the academy. So lots of activity in that area. Um, two other things I want to talk about, or a couple other things I want to talk about. First one, another big body of work that's been going on, um, Peter mentioned remote work, telework. Um, we have been as a team working through that. Um, Melinda um, Posner, Amanda McCartney, and Diana and I are kind of a little core group working through it. We're looking, uh, uh, we did some surveying back in the spring of our employees and supervisors. We've been talking to a lot of other agencies who are a little further along. And we're, we're getting to the point where we're sort of finalizing some policy decisions. So we're getting ready to work the final steps of that and then engage with the union um, to move that forward. It's such touch converse, tough conversations. And you all touched upon it earlier, I think Ken did, um, Commissioner Bounds did about, you know, does it does it work to have people be fully remote and not in the same um, proximity with each other? Um, what does that do to a workplace? What does that do to the individual? And so we're mm -hmm. having a lot of these conversations because it is a grand experiment that we're you know all in the middle of um, when we're trying. But at the same time, if we don't offer you know some degree of remote work, are we going to be able to hire and retain employees who really are feeling like they want that? In April, when we surveyed our employees, we um, that were doing, you know, there were office workers. About a third of them said that they would like to be full time telework, um, and and then more numbers said, you know, they would like to work mostly remotely, but would like some office time. Um, what we discovered though is that, you know, obviously with with the pandemic, everybody went home, and then we brought people back to varying degrees depending on their jobs is that what people wanted is what they kind of already had. So we, we do have a lot of folks who are, are working almost completely from home and that we have varying degrees depending on positions. Um, so we have that in that, that difficult decision about what will work for us. We also have, and this is something other many, most other agencies don't, at least not in the same way. We have a workforce that's predominantly in the field that are in places where are in jobs where you can't remote work. And so, and we, we've had lots of great conversations about that divide and what it looks like. Um, you know, we, we know that our, our field staff, most of them get that, you know, because of the nature of their jobs, they can't, they can't remote work. Um, they have to be on site. Um, but we also need to make sure that what we ever do for our office workers, you know, we are continuing to provide the, the best service we can to our internal customers in the, in the field. So lots and lots of ask pieces of that we're working through. Um, then I wanted to, uh, where this will likely come up some more is another thing that is going on right now, which is the bargaining with the unions for the master contracts, uh, governor's office, uh, office of financial management leads that effort with, I don't know how many master contracts they have anymore, quite a few, but we are part of the Washington Federation of state employees, general government contract. It covers, it's the largest contract by far. It covers thousands and thousands of employees, including about 90% of our staff. Um, so I'm sitting at the table this year uh, with a group of other um, managers, both HR folks and program managers from other agencies, along with the governor's office, OFM, across from the Federation. Bargaining mm -hmm. started um, a couple months ago. It, it's it's virtual, which is um, really not fun. I'll, I'll just say that, that this particular piece of work is really hard to do virtually um, because we're trying to monitor changes to agree our changes to proposals, but um, we're getting through it and they're just getting into some of the deeper things. Of course, I can't talk about that, but there is one piece that um, I wanted to mention that you 
may have seen in the news, and that is about the governor's intention to require continued vaccination and boosters for all state employees. Um, so what's going on with that right now is he has signaled that this will be part of bargaining for all the um, bargaining unit employees and bargaining that contract takes effect July 1, 2023. So None of for existing employees, um, bargaining employees, nothing will change if things change until July 1, 2023. Um, he is holding off on any rule changes for current employees to kind of be in alignment with that. So all of the, most of us in this room are uh, WMS, Washington Management Service or, or exempt positions. And but he's not he's not going to make a rule change. We wouldn't be impacted by the collective bargaining agreement, but he won't make a rule change and for current employees until something is determined for bargaining employees and would do that all in one fell swoop. What he has done though in the meantime is um, directed his staff to develop rules and they are with the code revisor right now for pre-employment. So the idea would be that they believe in the round fall, we will start to, we are of course requiring vac vaccinations for our incoming employees. They all have to be vaccinated. And um, we're going through that process, but starting in the fall, the intention is that they will have to be up to date based on what the CDC recommends for boosters. So we'll have, um, it appears relatively soon, we'll have a requirement of some additional confirmation that people are not only vaccinated, but they are current with their boosters for incoming employees. With And then with the vision perhaps that in July of next year, we'll be seeing that for existing employees as well. So that's a pretty big, deal and who knows what's going to how that's all going to play out but um two more quick things um just an update on the volunteer program uh we have that uh, valerie roberts is here today because she's going to be uh, tomorrow we have some uh, awards for some volunteers you want to be here for that um I, you saw valerie at the um, iwako meeting and it, uh, she's one of our newer employees who's such been such a great add to our team the um we've had some kind of you know, a little bit of, of interest in or scare about what might happen with our host program because of rising gas prices this year. And, uh, you know, I, so far we're not, you know, seeing a, a, what I've heard from Valerie is, well, we definitely have some gaps in some parks where we, we have so many new applicants. They've done a great job recruiting and screening and getting people on the on the ground that we're, we're doing okay. It's a pretty vital part of keeping our system going to have those hosts out there. So uh, Valerie and, and Cindy in that program are doing a great job. One other thing, just because it got mentioned earlier that I wanted to say that we're working on is the um, some training, the government to government training, the tribal relations training. You know, Lynn, Belinda mentioned that we trained about 115 employees um, in including, I think, most of you in April, May and June. And um, we are, in, are intending we are working now on getting more training on the ground in the fall to train about another 100 employees. It's a pretty I, it's a I love this effort. I think it's a really um, foundational effort for DEI training as well as just tribal relations. And then the um, implicit bias training, which is a virtual training that is going to be cast out for all employees to, to complete over the course of the next several months because we are in the middle of season. That's all I have. Hey, thank you very much. Next, I'd like to call on our um, communications director, Amanda McCarthy. All right, you've already seen me a few times today, so we are going to clip through a few updates. Uh, one, I am very excited to share. We hired a new communications manager. So for the past several months, I've been double filling um, this role and that role. Um, so I'm pleased to announce that we have hired and are onboarding Sarah Detmer as our communications manager. She'll help with media relations, social media, um, blog posts, and kind of overseeing the team that does does that really great work. Um, she previously worked at DNR as a comms manager and worked very closely with uh, Commissioner Franz. And then she was with the Department of Enterprise Services. So she has really excellent state knowledge and natural resources knowledge. And she's actually getting her master's degree in um, conservation. So she is a great addition to the parks team. And in the coming weeks and months, I'm sure you'll get a, a virtual introduction to her. You heard about brand refresh this morning. Uh, and the other large project we are working on is the website redesign. I've dangled a few carrots about that out um, over the past few months. We are in the research phase. Um, we've done some 
Usability testing asked folks to sort contents in a way that organically makes sense to them. And our website vendor is synth synthesizing that information to give us a plan on how we need to make changes to how we lay out our content and the flow of things. Um, and I will have a more robust update for that soon. Uh, something cool that has been happening is the boating program has had a partnership with the Seattle Mariners um, for marketing and outreach purposes. And my team helped get that started and their communications consultant has been running with that. So it is a season long partnership. We have graphics in the park um, to help promote safe boating and life jack usage. Uh, Director Dupuy threw out a first pitch if you missed it. Um, and one of our favorite graphics is on the pitcher's mound is a, a graphic that says wear your life jacket with the Washington State Parks logo. So we get a lot of really good primetime coverage with that. The moose came and handed out life jackets at an event, uh, the Mariners moose, in case there's any questions, not a real one. <laughs> um, and um, the, the boating team brings a kayak and people sign the kayak as a safe boating pledge. Um, and so it's been a really fun activation and it's been a good way to engage with uh, boat owners and youth and promote boating safety. Um, in June, we were excited. The Central Reservations team joined the communications division. So um, those are the folks that oversee our, our awesome reservation system and give us the great stats on visitation and all of that good stuff. And they are reporting directly to Carrie Murphy, who presented this morning. Um, and she is overseeing what we're calling our, our visitor services program now. So she still has the great folks in the information center as well as the reservations team. With that transition, as well as the hiring of Sarah and um, a little bit of reorganization that we've done, we have doubled the number of managers uh, within my division. So for the last year, we've been operating on three, including myself, and we are up to six now. So <laughs> it is very exciting. And in the coming uh, months and um, certainly into the fall and early winter, we are just getting those folks settled in and we're going to be doing a lot of vision casting for where we're going to take it to the next level um, and then probably have Mike Stern back join the team too because I know he's been itching to do that so <laughs> <laughs> news to him <laughs> so that is a nutshell of what's happening in the comms division and if you have any questions uh happy to chat further and rumor has it Commissioner Milner has been drawing a logo maybe I don't know so he might have <laughs> we might have even more surprises later thank you thank you all right, next I'd like to call on our Policy and Governmental Affairs Director, Owen Rowe. Thank you, Director. Always a challenge to go after Amanda. <laughs> uh, but she is the Communications Director, right? So uh, good afternoon. Um, a lot of work on developing uh, our new position description for our Tribal Affairs Director. As you know, we secured funding for a dedicated Tribal Affairs uh, Director in, in the 2022 Supplemental. I uh, had a number of conversations with some of my colleagues, uh, the tribal liaisons around the state, some other of my tribal contacts. Um, I've got a pretty good draft put together and we're just finishing up our internal review and some of the best uh, feedback I got was that you absolutely have to write this position description in consultation with tribal governments and tribal leaders. So Director Dupuy and I will be working on a cover letter and we'll be getting that uh, position description out to as many tribes uh, for feedback as we can as we move forward with that important hire for the agency. So really looking forward to that. Um, some other uh, conversations I've had about, you know, really want to set this position up for success at state parks. Um, you know, what types of work might this, um, you know, the new tribal director uh, undertake in the first six months, first year? That's some questions that I've had for some of my colleagues. And there's no end of work, uh, to be honest with you. We, we, you know, we've got to work on our tribal consultation policy. Uh, we don't have one right now. And any, and, and, and we've got some tribal policy. I don't think we've, we've worked uh, with tribal governments on that. So there's a real opportunity uh, to kind of create some new relationships and to kind of develop some um some conversations and some and some relationships with tribal governments there uh lisa lance and i attended the dnr tribal summit uh the puyallup uh, tribe hosted that at their casino just uh, in tacoma uh they were also unveiling their uh tribal policy under un, um consultation uh got a lot of good feedback from tribal members there uh, which i've incorporated into the pd and so uh that was that was a, a good opportunity as well we've got some legislative tours coming up uh, 
Uh, Capital staff reached out to me in the last couple of weeks. Uh, they've got some interest in touring uh, Nisqually State Park, which is the newest state park under the under development with the Nisqually Indian tribe, as well as Westport Light. So uh, it's all come together rather rapidly. And I just found out this week that uh, Representative Theringer and Representative Steele, uh, as well as Representative Hackney and Representative McIntyre, are planning on uh, touring Nis Nisqually on July 28th. Uh, so we'll have a, an overview of some of the incredible planning efforts uh, for the development of that new park in almost two, uh, two decades, our first new full service park in almost two decades. Um, and so we'll have staff out there to, to greet them and hopefully go on a walk down to the river and to kind of get an idea of what this new park is going to, going to offer folks. So I have some uh, representatives from the Nisqually Indian tribe out there as well. Then on August 2nd, uh, touring the coast, uh, primarily out at Westport Light, we've got a lot of capital projects coming up there. Um, we've had some issues with the administrative building, which has been flooding periodically, uh, needs to be moved, moved to a different area. And also the campground, as you're probably well aware, uh, needs to be moved. We've, we've, that's one of the first parks where we've really seen some effect uh, from climate change. Uh, and so we've got some rather large uh, capital projects out on the coast and also an opportunity to talk about the seashore conservation area and some of the issues that we we manage out there. Uh, we had a great meeting uh, consultation, I should say, with the Suquamish tribe uh, at their tribal headquarters uh, on the Blake Island uh, Marina pre-design. So that, you know, that work is well underway. Uh, Chairman Forsman was there. Uh, several other tribal leaders from the council were there. Director Dupuy was there. I believe it was her first tribal consultation as director. She'll probably mention that a little bit tomorrow during her uh, director remarks. Um, really good uh, conversation, uh, very engaging. Um, you know, the, uh, we, uh, Todd Tatum presented and Lisa Lance presented uh, several options that we're, we're looking at. Uh, the tribe, this is obvious, Blake Island is a very important place to the Suquamish tribe. It's the birthplace of Chief Seattle. Um, you know, and they, there's uh, some very um, developed eelgrass beds out there that they are interested in protecting. There likely will be some dredging as, as part of this new marina project, uh, but uh, some good conversation. And they also wanted us to kind of keep keep in touch with uh, any development of any new concession out there. As you know, that Tillicum Village just recently closed after many decades of, uh, of service. And so they may be interested in uh, partnering with us on some sort of uh, concession out there. Uh, at the end of May, we had our first outdoor recreation caucus meeting uh, in over two years since the beginning of the pandemic at the Millers of Anya Environmental Learning Center. Uh, Director Dupuy was there. Uh, we had uh, Commissioner Williams join us remotely. It was a hybrid uh, remote uh, in-person meeting, and I got to tip my hat to uh, both Mahar and Becky. That is very challenging to put on. Uh, overall, it went off without a hitch. Uh, we did have some technical diff difficulties toward the end, uh, but we had a great presentation on some of the work we're doing with Earth, Earth Economics, not just us, but Fish and Wildlife and DNR on mining cell phone data to figure out where people are traveling to and from, how people are using our public lands, where they're coming from, uh, and, and, and making some uh, great uh, connections to economic data uh, as well. And so that was, um, that was a great meeting. We also had a nice walk in the park and with Sam Watipka, who uh, showed us some of the um, the new uh, depression era interpretation uh, at the entrance of Millers of Annie. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend that you check it out. This is a new effort for us to make um, our interpretation around the park system more modern and more relevant. Uh, the story there is about um, the work of the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, some of the really positive work there around the park, but also some of the less positive stories around segregation of uh, people, you know, black people and people of color as part of the CCC during that era. Uh, so that was, I highly recommend that to you. And uh, John Snyder was very, uh, from the governor's office, was very happy to see that uh, in place. Um, can work with the Emerging Leaders Program, uh, our partnership with the WTA and some of the funding that we secured in this last legislative session to support a, a trail a crew of young people uh, from uh, marginalized communities, black, indige indigenous, people of color, LG LGBTQ plus um, we're working on setting up a trail crew. They're going to begin in January uh, working at state parks and other public lands, uh, doing some job shadowing with state parks and other natural resource agencies. And so we're really uh, excited about getting that uh, up and going. Uh, so John Crimmins and I will be working on uh, on that in the coming weeks and, and setting up some projects. But I had a good conversation with WTA staff today, and I think we're well we're well on our way there. Uh, Commissioner Connolly and I attended the foundation board meeting in mid-May. Uh, things seem to be going well with the foundation. They've uh, welcomed some um, new member, uh, new board members, uh, which we met. 
uh, they're really kind of getting up to speed and uh, bringing a, a whole new level of energy there. Uh, so that was uh, that was a good meeting. Uh, lots of conversations with uh, Jim Van Globen cells and the Mount Spokane Ski and Snowboard uh, concession over at Mount Spokane. Uh, definitely, uh, you're going to hear quite a bit from him tomorrow, but uh, I had quite a few conversations with him, and we've also engaged OFM on some options to help um, uh, improve some of the aging infrastructure uh, on the hill in partnership with with uh, the, our nonprofit partner there. Um, uh, Director um, Dupuy and Assistant Director Herzog and I met with uh, uh, Laura Blackburn, Director Blackburn from the Puget Sound Partnership uh, last week, and it was a great meeting. We had some conversations about the Clean Best Lake program uh, where we uh, provide, you know, pump out services for recreational boaters, opportunities potentially for um, uh, enlarging our supply of buoys, uh, maybe some help on the regulatory side there, so that was really good as well. Uh, the Mountains to Sound Greenway uh, is uh, working on their federal heritage designation plan. This is really exciting. This is the second federal her heritage designation plan right after the Marine Heritage Designation Plan here in Washington State. Uh, we uh, sent out a letter in support of the development of the plan, and uh, Director Dupuy and I will be touring uh, Lake Sammamish uh, State Park with uh, Greenway staff and potentially some uh, legislators next Thursday, the 21st. Um, uh, having conversations with uh, one of the uh, or, uh, with Doug Levy and the Northwest uh, Marine Trade Association. Doug's a, a lobbyist that we work quite closely with. He's been uh, quite active in the outdoor recreation world. Uh, the Northwest Marine Trade Association is interested in partnering with us on additional funding for the Clean Vessel Act program so we can continue to keep our waterways as clean as possible. Uh, likely uh, some looking for some additional funding to support uh, a 25% state match for the for the federal grants for these facilities and infrastructure. Uh, they, we also had some conversations about uh, uh, increasing the number of buoys as well as the ability to reserve buoys uh, online. We recently have uh, put some more uh, buoys on or more more of our marine parks. <clears throat> excuse me, for online payment, uh, and also had some conversations about the use of stern ties. Uh, to help increase uh, some of the uh, recreational boating usage at some of our marine parks. Uh, continue to attend Malden, Malden and Pine, Center, uh, Pine City recovery meetings. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And Lisa Anderson and Randy Klein have been involved with those as well. Uh, the community is very excited about the development of the Malden Trailhead, and we're going to be getting started with the uh, construction there very soon uh, on a trailhead at Malden, as well as a surfacing project between Malden and Rosalia. And then finally, uh, we had a big tent board retreat a couple of weeks ago, and this is a, an organization of state agencies, industry, and user groups that have been advocating for outdoor recreation uh, in the legislature. It was uh, kind of created on the heels of the Great Recession and all of, and the fear of, and uh, try to amend some of the cuts that we were all facing. Uh, honestly, we had a conversation about whether or not we were going to continue with the organization. I think we've all worked so hard. Uh, and it's been a it's been a good uh, it's been a good um, you know kind of a clearinghouse for for information and to bring people together. So we're going to continue that efforts. And Rico Bembry uh, is going to be the new president. As you remember, he presented in El Waco. He was uh, one of the contractor that was in charge of having the conversation with the black community about how to improve uh, outdoor recreation. And the vice president is going to be Christine Mahler from the WWRC. So I look forward to working with both of them. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, Mike Sternback and I toured uh, Millersylvania State Park with our new OFM budget analyst, uh, Matt Hunter, who I've worked with at uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Matt's replacing Leslie Connolly, who's been a great analyst for us over the years, but I think Matt is just going to be great. Uh, Mike suggested going to Millersylvania State Park because it basically has just a little bit of everything that we manage in the park system. We've got day use, we've got camping, we've got cabins, overnight accommodations, and ELC, you name it. So we had a really productive conversation with Matt, kind of orienting, orienting him to the world that uh, we live in. And uh, also, uh, sadly, uh, we're going to be saying goodbye to Daryl Jennings, who's going to be moving over to the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. He was our uh, capital budget analyst for OFM, but uh, we're working closely with uh, with the with um, the director there, um, and uh, look forward to welcoming a new analyst there. So that's my update. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Finally, I'd like to call on our interim DEI director, Melinda Posner. Provided most of the updates, I believe, this morning. If there's any <laughs> questions or comments, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Melinda. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.
Okay. So, anything else for the good of the order here? Just uh, one item, Mr. Chair. I think two meetings ago, if there are any significant amendments to any of the action items, lengthy amendments, uh, Becky would appreciate it if we could have those by what time? Or if, if, if you're moving item A to item B or something simple, straightforward, but if it's complicated and something we're going to need to look at, it would be helpful if you could work on that overnight and get it to Becky in the morning. Okay. So that's all. Any other comments or for the good of the order before we go into executive session? Yeah. So, uh, well, I want to thank all of you and staff for getting us a little bit ahead of time here. Good work, team. Uh, so we're going to go into executive session. We will now enter into an executive session pursuant to RCW 42.30.100 subset IF uh, for the purpose of discussing possible litigation with the agency's assigned legal counsel. The executive session is expected to end at Five, we'll say five o'clock.